my check, planning and land development. There's
souvenir The October 20th, 2022 hearing for the Planning and Land Development Regulation Commission is now called to order. If I could get you to please silence any audible devices you may have this morning I've, so we don't disrupt the, uh, the procedures. And if I could get you to please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, everyone. I would like to uh, thank everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, those of you who are in the chambers and those of you listening on the PLDRC webinar. Uh, Ms. Ray, could I please have the roll call? Member Feller? Here. Member Young? Present. Member Shelley? Here. Member Bender? Here. Member Costa? Here. Member Sixma? Here. Chair Mills? Here. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Ray. Uh, we do have some minutes to discuss, or do you want to take them individually, or would you like to categorize them all? Nobody has problems with them. I think we do them all three at once. Okay. Okay. I'll make a motion that uh, minutes be approved for July, August, and September. I'll second that. Okay. I've got a motion to approve July 21st, 2022, August 18th, 2022, and September 15th, 22 minutes. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, if anyone would like to speak for or against the cases being heard today, if you could please fill out a form that's at the back of the uh, dais here and hand it to Ms. Ray to my immediate left here. And at that time, uh, we will be hearing your comments. We will be limiting it to you to a three minute time limit this morning. We got a pretty long agenda. And so I would hope that we could keep it at that. Uh, after the comments have been heard, I will give the applicant an opportunity to address any concerns the speakers have and answer any questions the commissioners may have. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Soria for legal comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just a reminder for um, anyone present that decisions by this body on special exception cases and cases which rezone real property from one classification to another pursuant to the ordinance are recommendations only to the county council and do not constitute a final hearing. New evidence may be introduced at the county council public hearing. Decisions on variances made by this body constitute final action subject to an appeal to county council. And what this means is that no new evidence may be presented at the time of the county council public hearing on the appeal. An aggrieved party that appeals such a decision is confined to the record made before this body. Hearings by this body on rezonings, special exceptions, and variances are quasi-judicial in nature, meaning this, this body is more, acting more like a court and must, make in a, must take into account all oral, written, or demonstrative evidence presented. Their decisions on these cases must be based on competent substantial evidence in the record, and competent substantial evidence has been defined as that evidence a reasonable mind would accept to support a conclusion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Soria. And while we're on legal comments, I'd like to ask the commission to disclose for the record any ex parte communications that have occurred before or during a public hearing at which a vote is to be taken on any quasi-judicial matter. And I'll start to my immediate right with Mr. Feller. I have none. I have none. Um, I have two to report. I had a conversation with uh, Mr. Rob Merrill regarding uh, CPA-22-011 and PUD-22-147, and also received a phone call from Kim Conway on item number V-23-009. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. Uh, Mr. Costa? Uh, yeah, I had a call from a representative for uh, uh, the Vanacore company on case CPA 22-011. And Mr. Sixman. Yeah, I had conversation with uh, Rob Merrill on CPA 22011 uh, and, also, well, and also the PUD 22147. 
And also, I met with uh, Mr. James Letary on case V23013. Okay, thank Sir, you, Mr. Could I get clarification? Mr. Feller? Do I, is ex parte communication um, relevant for CPA 22011 and PUD? Uh, the PUD, yes, the but PUD? not for the CPA. No. I'm sorry, then I do have ex parte communication on the PUD. Um, I spoke with the head of the uh, Lake Winnemusset Civic Association. I'm sorry, I don't remember his name. Okay, thank you, Mr. Feller. And other than the emails that are already in the record, I did receive four other emails on case PUD 22147 from Mr. Gonzalez, Ms. Lavernia, Mr. Savoya, and Mr. Engel. And I think that takes care of that. <clears throat> Those, I didn't okay. think we had to mention that. Any other disclosures? All right. Ms. Smith, we do have an item to be withdrawn this morning. Yes, sir. V22004, uh, they missed due public notice. So they will be heard next month at the next meeting. Okay. So we're just doing a continuance on this? To next, yes, sir. To the next meeting. Okay. Would someone like to make a motion to continue this case? Oh, we, okay. I'll make a motion to continue V23-004. And to next month's meeting. To next month's meeting. I'll yes. second it. Okay, I've got a motion for Mr. Young to continue V23-004 and a second for Mr. Sixma to the meeting of next month. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. <clears throat> We do have some old business, and Ms. Shelley, if you could read that with, into the record, please. Yes, sir. Um, case number V-22-162, a variance to the maximum fence requirements on urban single-family residential R4 zoned property. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. And who, let me see who this is. Mr. Hanson, this is your case. Good morning, Michael Hansen, Planning Development Services. Uh, this particular variance application is split between two variance requests as it pertains to a fence that was put up in phases. So variance request one deals with the existing fence that is unpermitted, while variance request two deals with the proposed fence that has not been constructed on the property. The uh, existing fence was constructed in April 2007. It's 118 linear feet. As you can see on the overhead variant site plan, it connects the north and south sides of the front of the house to the property lines and then extends along the south property line to the east corner of the east property line. The staff recommendation for variance request one was a denial, noting that it failed three of the five criteria for granting said variance. Variance request two is for that proposed fence that connects the southeast corner of the property with the northeast corner of the property to finish the fence. The, there is a fence on the north property line that was permitted, so that's not pertaining to this variance. The recommendation for variance request two was the denial, noting that it failed three of the five criteria for granting said variance. I'm available for any questions the board may have. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Any questions for staff? Yeah, one quick question. Mr. Feller? Did you say that the north side is already existing? Yes, sir. The north side is existing. It was permitted as a second phase of the fence application. The applicant tried to put the fence together in phases through a contractor, so the north side was permitted. And is it six feet as well? Yes, sir. All uh, the existing fence for that's unpermitted and permitted six feet and the proposed fence is six feet. So the variance does, does not need is not needed for the north side or it is needed? It is not needed for the north side. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for staff? Is the applicant present? Would you like to come forward, sir? Okay, all right. We'll move on then. Uh, do we have anyone that would like to speak to this case? Hearing none, we're gonna close the floor for public participation and open up for commission discussion or a motion. 
I don't see a line of sight issue, so if there's no discussion, I'm prepared to make a motion. Go ahead. Uh, I make a motion in case V22-162, variance to the maximum height fence. We approve variances one and two with uh, the, um, let's see, how many staff? Two? Yeah, with the two staff recommended uh, criteria. I'll second that. Okay, I've got a motion from Mr. Feller to approve variances one and two for case V22162 for variances one and two with the two staff recommended conditions and a second from Mr. Young. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Ms. Shelley, could I get the next case, please? Yes, sir. Case number S-23-001, amendment to the approved special exception for recreational area on Osteen Cluster Residential OCR zoned property. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. Ms. Smith, this one is yours. Trish Smith, Planning and Development Services. This is a special exception that was previously heard by the PLDRC in 2020, and it was approved by the County Council in the same year. The property owner has a collection of World War II tanks and military vehicles on a 117-acre site in Osteen. Veterans and volunteers travel the country throughout the year to showcase the collection and to perform World War II reenactments. The site itself is used to store and maintain the vehicles throughout the week and to practice reenactments one weekend each month. The general public is not allowed on the property. Heavy artillery fire is limited to one time each month over a two-day period between the hours of 8 a.m. and 3 p.m. The applicant notifies surrounding property owners prior to all firing events. The applicant is back before the PLDRC today to request three revisions to the special exception. Uh, first, he's requesting to add three additional carports to house the military vehicles to protect them from the elements. And Ben, if you can just go back to that prior screen, please. If you look in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see um, the yellow highlights, which indicate where he is looking to put uh, three additional carports. And they are located, if you look on the larger picture, um, where the other buildings are already located centrally towards the north side of that photo. Um, second, the special exception currently limits artillery fire to one weekend each month when the volunteers are on site. As a safety precaution, he's requesting permission for one additional day to test the equipment prior to the arrival of the volunteers, and that's because this is very old equipment, and they just want to ensure the safety of everybody. The amendment would also allow the property owner to have one open house once a year at his discretion to share the collection with the community. They have looked to um, show their vehicles at other places around the county, but there aren't very many places that can handle those large vehicles. And they have a large site that could potentially work. Uh, uh, finally, a full list of the amended condition is, is provided on page nine of 23 of your staff report. Due public notice resulted in one phone call in support of the project. And we also received an email of support from a resident in Acorn Lake, Lake subdivision immediately adjacent to the facility. Uh, there is a letter of support from Sheriff Chitwood that was provided in 2020. You have that in your packet. We reached out to him yesterday and he confirmed his continued support of this project. We have one email of opposition that came from a resident in DeBerry and an individual in the subdivision across State Road 15 in Deltona also expressed opposition. And I do believe he notified all of you as well. Uh, we're here to answer any questions. The code compliance team is also in chambers to answer any questions regarding any calls they have may have received. And we are asking the PLDRC to forward the item to the county council with a recommendation of approval. The applicant's present and I believe there is public participation. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Any questions for staff? Yeah, I have a, a question. Um, I just, just a point of clarification. You mentioned, um, I believe I heard you say, an open house at the uh, discretion of the owners or of the this organization. Um, just for clarification, is that discretion either Memorial Day or Veterans Day? Yes, ma'am, those are two of the days that they did discuss. They were interested in doing a parade um, off-site at one point, but again, it is difficult to find a place to drive tanks through the sure. area. I just want was clarifying the discretion, thinking those were the two days they were looking at. Okay, thank you. 
Mr. Young? I have one, another question on the same scenario, and that is about having an open house. Is, has anything been looked at for traffic control or parking or what have you? Because I don't see any comments that really. It, if they choose to have an open house and if they exceed 500 people, they are required to get, get it permitted through the county. They, in any case, are required to coordinate with the sheriff's office, the health department, make sure all of the, the any porto potties would be in place. They'll be required to do that before they can. Okay, those that. requirements. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Uh, my question is for code enforcement. Has there been any viol code violations on this since we last approved it? Good morning, sir. Good morning, Chris Hutchison, Volusia County Code Compliance Manager. Uh, we have no activity. We've gotten complaints, but we found through our investigation that the they were acting within the bounds of their special exception. Okay. And approximately how many complaints did you have? And was it from different individuals? It's usually the same individual we get the complaint from. I couldn't tell you how many. It's okay. a handful. But um, like I say, we found that they were abiding by their special exception. So. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, is the applicant present? Good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning? I'm wonderful. For the record, Jessica Gowa Cobb Cole Law Firm, 149 South Richard Avenue, Daytona Beach, Florida. Um, I thought that this came before us maybe six months ago, but it has been two years, um, so time <laughs> flies. We were here in July of 2020. Um, just a little refresh, Trish did a great job. Um, this is 117 acres. Um, the actual buildings on the site take up about 15% of that overall site. And so we have a lot of wetland systems. If you'll recall when we went through originally, there was an existing trail system that just lended itself really well to tank movements and maneuvering. Um, so this is a very, very unique site. I think you remember when we went through, we said, you know, we're confused, county staff is confused on how we treat this. And so we thought that it was best for everyone to have parameters set up for the safety and operation. Um, what I will say is that since then, we've been going through the site plan approval process with the county. Uh, these clients are fantastic to work with. I think you guys have seen through the conditions and their operations that safety is their number one goal. And so there are three items kind of before you today. The first is that within that 15% of you know, building area on the site, when we went through the site plan, we showed a garage overhang and staff said, you can't have that. It's limited to the existing footprint. Lawyers will tell you all day that there are different ways to interpret things. So we interpreted footprint as that area um, and staff interpreted footprint as the existing building. And so we are just asking to clarify that we can put in garages to store the vehicles under, keep them out of the elements. Because as you may hear, our clients say there are two states of a tank, breaking and broken. And so these are old vehicles. They want to make sure that they're maintained so that they can continue to educate individuals worldwide about the history and what these tanks did in, during that history. Um, the second request is to allow one additional day of firing when volunteers are not on site. Um, you may recall this site and the owner is a weapons manufacturer licensed nationally. And so they're fixing the tanks and the weapons on site. Um, but under the current conditions, they cannot fire those weapons until they have volunteers practicing. Um, we would like to be able to test them before the volunteers are on site just to limit any potential issues that could occur. We don't want the first time these weapons are tested after being fixed to be when we have volunteers and veterans on site. And the third one was actually a recommendation by staff. Um, we, I just want to say, have no plans for an annual event, but we don't see why it could not be a good idea in the future. Um, that one, we are really willing to listen to whatever input the board has and the council has. If you want to say it can only occur, you know, within two days of Memorial Day or Veterans Day, it's fine with us. Um, whatever conditions you see there, if you think it's not appropriate, again, also fine with us. Um, we think that it could be a good benefit in the future. The original special exception allowed us to bring veteran groups out there, Boy Scout troops out there for education. Um, so this would just be a larger scale kind of highlighting the kind of special use that we have here on the site. 
I did want to touch, I think we do have people here to speak in support. Um, this item was unanimously approved by council and we had 72 pages of support letters um, at council. And so I think this is a unique site. Um, it's something that is definitely special to the historians in our area. You should see the library they have of handbooks on weapons and vehicles from World War II that veterans come and review throughout the week there. It is amazing. It's a very secure, safe facility. I think you heard that from staff and code enforcement. And so we're asking for you to approve this request to give us a little more comfort here. And if you have any questions, happy to answer them. Sure. Any questions for the Mr. Feller? Quick question. I wasn't here in 2020, so I don't know how this was heard. Is this operational right now? The site is up and yes. functioning. Mm -hmm. So this is just the amendments that we're looking at are just these few changes that they want Correct. and then correcting the building issue that you're looking right. and all that. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. You have no problems with staff recommendations at all? Nope. I say okay. we're in full support. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Does anyone else have any questions? We do have some public participation forms, and I'll give you an, uh, an opportunity for rebuttal once they've spoken. Okay. Our first public participation we have is Mr. Goodman. actually letting me come up and talk. All right, uh, if I could get your name and address for the record, sir. Yeah, Joshua Goodman, uh, 565 Normac Avenue, Deltona, Florida, 12738. Uh, all right, sir. So uh, I have no objections to the, to the tanks and things like that, but I don't think that everyone realizes exactly what artillery fire um, sounds like at my house. Um, two years before they applied for the exemption, This is what I was being subjected to on a monthly basis inside my living room. Um, you can hear the gunfire. You can feel the explosions. Uh, let's see here. This is from September 2020. It, it, it's constant over the course of four hours, on and off. Literally, it sounds like a war in my backyard. The, to add an additional day to this is going to affect me mentally. It affects our neighbors. We were given less than a seven day notice on this right here. Every time I've called and talked to code compliance, uh, they've told me either A, that they can break the noise, and this is significantly above what the noise levels allow for a property like that. The county noise ordinance states that you cannot, uh, and you have to apply for a special exemption, you cannot break the uh, noise um, ordinance more than, uh, or get an exception to break the noise ordinance more than four times per year. This is 12 times per year, three times per month that they're requesting for now. Uh, it, I, I love the idea of being able to come and look at the, the machines and the history and saving our history and things like that. There should be a compromise that could be made where the other side of 415 actually gets notified for, if they apply for those four, um, four, you know, four, four, four days of exception. Item nine of their current special exemption states that they need to adhere to uh, the county noise ordinance at all times. Uh, I've got um, from, which I've sent in as well, from uh, at 222 Saturday, November 7th, 2020, from my yard where it's 85 to 90 decibels in my yard over a quarter mile away before they acquired additional property, which required them to then notify one of my neighbors who told me. Um, had we not had a hurricane, there would be signs up. You probably would have got more um, objections to this from the neighborhood. One of my neighbors says that he just pulls out his uh, hearing aids. Bothers his wife, but it doesn't bother him. So again, we have, I have no issues. I don't think anybody else has any issues with anything but the sounds of war that we're being subjected to. All right, sir. Any questions for speaker 
Okay. Thank you. All right. The next one up is, um, is it Rip or Rupp? Rupp. All right. Mr. Rupp. I could get your name and address for the record, sir. Uh, it's Jonathan Rupp, and I live at 436 Black Lake Road in Osteen, in the same neighborhood as uh, World War II Armory. Okay. So. You would like to speak? Yeah, like I said, I go by JJ. I'm a local real estate agent. I'm in the community. I live in the neighborhood with you know, the World War II Armory, so I just wanted to share some of my experiences of the operations and you know, what I see on a day-to-day -day basis and driving by their facility you know, several times a day. Uh, I got a couple notes here just to kind of go over to keep me on track. Um, so I just kind of read them, read them to you. Um, first off, they've been a huge asset in coordinating our private road maintenance over the years and have no problem pitching in to buy materials or sending people out on equipment to help alongside us neighbors working on the road or even fueling up our machines as needed. The access to the neighborhood and quality of the roads have never been better in my opinion. Uh, the World War II Armory appears to take extreme pride in the upkeep of their facility as well. I drive by it several times a day um, going to my home. There is never anything out of place or any eyesores to complain about. The staff is always friendly and acknowledges us as we drive by. Um, there's also 24-7 security on the property, uh, and I know they never skip a beat. Um, I feel this is a huge asset, asset to the community as well. I also have direct personal experience with the staff, uh, whether it's keeping a watchful eye on equipment that we leave at the end of the road, um, reviewing security footage when there's been trash dumped in the neighborhood, uh, actually tracking down the people and getting license plates number to, to people entering our neighborhood, um, and that's down to uh, driving my mother-in-law home when she broke down in front of their gates. Uh, so they're always there for the community and always willing to help. Um, Lastly, I want to speak about the, the events the facility holds. Um, they're really, you know, a few times a year, maybe once a month or so, they always provide advance notice. You know, a week to several weeks in advance, we know that they're having an event and they're always contained on their property. There's never parking issues. There's never any issues of us getting into our neighborhood. Um, I also notice a higher level of security on those days, medical personnel and just staff just watching and making sure everything is going well. Um, I believe the, the community events yearly would be a great thing because I know me and a lot of the neighbors would, would like to attend one because we see them and it is an interesting thing and a very well organized event that I can tell from driving by. Um, overall, it's been positive. The noise, you do hear the noise, but like I said, it is very well you know, known that they are going to be having an event and it's just for maybe a couple little short bursts here and there throughout the day. It's not an ongoing thing that I've noticed. Um, so overall, we've been been happy being their neighbor and continue their, our support with them. Okay, any questions for the speaker? One quick question. So you are on the east side of 415 and with this property? Correct. I am, I'm the uh, pretty much a direct neighbor to them. The direct neighbor? Yes, okay. within the neighborhood uh, that they are in. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. JJ, real, real quick, how much does the noise bother you guys? It doesn't bother us much. Um, when you're inside the house, you know, you can't hear it out there, but um, to me and my kids, you know, it's kind of a little bit of a learning experience. You know, daddy, what is that noise? Um, but again, it's not for four hours straight, con nonstop. It is, you know, it kind of goes in bursts. And it's um, not like it goes on every single day. So. No, it's, you know, I know, I think I heard that they're approved to do it monthly. Um, I don't even think they even do it monthly from what, what I've heard is maybe you know, every couple of months or so from yeah. what, I, what I've seen. Okay. Um, right. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you, guys. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, Mr. Edwards. Good morning, sir. If I could get your name and address for the record. Good morning. My name's John Edwards. I live at 836 Kill Hall Road, Osteen, Florida, also on the same side of 415. Okay. You had to make a comment this morning? Yeah, I'm not as organized as Mr. Rupp. Uh, That's fine. I just wanted to say kind of the same thing. I work nights, sleep during the day. I work every other weekend. Um, and I live probably 500 feet from where they're shooting. Um, 
probably would say I'm probably one of the most affected by it and it still doesn't bother me. Like he said, it's a couple hours here and there. Um, it's not four to five hours of straight shooting. I do hear the noise, but they've always done a very good job of notifying me well in advance if I need to find somewhere else to sleep, something like that. And to be honest, I, I they've done so much for the neighborhood. They do so much for the history, the like the military history. Um, I almost see it as like living next to a train track or living next to an airport where the noise is almost worth it for the, the greater good of what they're providing. Um, yeah, uh, I can't talk for three minutes. That's about all I got. Okay. You don't need to. Okay. Any questions for the speaker? All right. I certainly thank you for coming forward and right. sharing your experience. Thank you, guys. Okay. Mr. Munster. Munster. Morning. Good morning, sir. I get your name and address for the record. My name is Gerhard Munster. I live at 324 Black Lake Road in Osteen. Okay, you'd like to comment on this case? I agree with um, what both the previous um, uh, neighbors um, have, uh, have stated. Uh, <clears throat> um, I think they are an excellent neighbor to have. I try and emulate them uh, with, my, with the looks of my property, but I can't because they, have the, they, 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 they do it. A terrific job. They have, they have their fences are lit up uh, at night. Uh, you know, everything is nice and neat, and uh, uh, th there isn't the grass out of place. Uh, it's, it's a great neighbor to have. Um, being a veteran myself, um, I appreciate what they do. Um, uh, I have had several vehicles, uh, 1944 Jeeps with the military insignia. It's, it's a wonderful memory to appreciate what was done from this country in overseas. And uh, so I think it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a great place, you know, to have this in, in, our, in our area. When it comes to the noise, I have to be honest, when hunting season comes up, I hear more gunfire behind me. We have shooting ranges left, right, and center on the other side. I hear more gunfire from those shooting ranges than I hear from this place. So I have no objection with this at all. Okay. Thank you, sir, and I appreciate your service. Thank you. And also, uh, do we have any questions for the speaker? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Mr. Jackson. Good morning. morning, sir. Could I get your name and address for the record, sir? My name is James Jackson. I live at 276 Black Lake Road in Osteen. Okay. You'd like to comment on this case? Yeah. I've, I've moved into the neighborhood eight years ago. And in that eight years, I got to know uh, World War II Armor. And I can say that they are the truly the most professional, most courteous group of people I've ever met. I've actually seen people pull into uh, Acorn Lake Road because a car broke down or something happened. And I've seen their mechanics come out and get the person on the way to their job or where they had to go without being asked. I've seen them uh, with the roads, help out with the roads uh, constantly. Uh, I have health issues. I've had them call and check up on me to see how I'm doing or if I needed anything. Uh, they always give me heads up like two, three days before they, uh, have any shooting and like uh gerhardt said there's a range behind my house like in front of it and the, the police shoot there and they have other things that go on i hear more gunshots from there every day than ever hear from these people and like uh the previous one said there's they're spot on so i have no complaints about them they're very helpful all right sir so any questions for the speaker all right. Thank you, sir. Okay, Mr. Kaltenbach. Can 
Can I get your name and address for the record, sir? My name is uh, Tim Kaltenbach. I live at 260 Owens Harbor Road. Um, actually, I live right next door to Gearhart. Um, I think it's no secret at this point that everybody can attest to the character of these people. Um, the noise seems to be the biggest objection. Uh, to make it clear, I'm all in favor of it. Um, while I don't shoot any guns at my house and I don't care about guns or tanks or anything like that, um, that noise doesn't bother me whatsoever. Um, they let everybody know, and like they said, that there's a lot more shooting that goes on in that neighborhood than it does at the, the armory there. Um, you know, they've been an excellent neighbor as far as being resourceful with the road. I mean, we can't depend on the county. You know, we were landlocked after Ian. You know, these guys were trying to do everything they can to help us out, to get us out of there. Um, they bring in, they, they spend their own money to maintain our road. So uh, they're, they're more than a team player. Um, I, I don't know really what else I could say about the noise, but it's, it's really nowhere near as bad as, as, as it was made out to in the original comment. I wouldn't even say it's as bad as 4th of July. Um, and it, it goes on for a little bit and then it stops and then it's over. I, I would definitely not have one single problem with them having extra days to do it. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is they've, they've basically opened up their property for the Volusia County Sheriff's Office. This is just an observation that I've seen. Um, so they're, they're definitely a team player in the community. As far as the extra buildings, I don't know why anybody would dictate what you could do on your property, especially with storing your toys or your cars or anything like that. So I don't see why that would ever be a problem. Um, I don't know what would be stopping them from also, you know, fencing off 20 of their acres and getting an ag exemption and not even have to worry about the buildings at this point. But that, that would be more of a question for the state than anything. But anyway, I think you guys get where I'm going with this. I'm definitely in favor of it. I hope you guys approve their stuff and get them on, get them going to where they need to be. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the speaker? All right, thank you. Okay, that uh, pretty much wraps it up for the public participation on this case. Was there anyone else that would like to speak to this case? Okay, we're gonna ask the applicant to come back again and for her rebuttal. Good morning again. For the record, Jessica Gowick called Cole Law Firm, 149 South Richard Avenue, Daytona Beach, Florida. I'll try to say it faster each time. <laughs> uh, just a few quick notes on the no noise ordinance. Um, the resident is absolutely right. We have to comply with that, and to this day we have. Um, we did sound testing prior to the original special exception. If you'll recall, um, we had to redo the testing quite a few times because the trucks driving on the state road drowned out all of the noise. And so it threw off all of the background readings because they were so much higher. And so, you know, the sound is intermittent. It is gunfire. There's no covering that. That's what the use is. They are firing tanks. We did take into account the residents. Um, if you may recall, we talked about the pounds of black powder that you used for the tanks at the original. Um, it's one pound and we, we lessen that to half a pound. So it's about half the noise of what was in place prior to the special exception being approved. And we heard these concerns and we adjusted. I did just want to say for the notice, there were signs put up. Um, we had the property owners do that because they have ATVs and I have a Ford Escape, so I did not do it. Uh, the schedule for the entire year is on the World War II Armor website, and so they have their practice events labeled all year long right now. So they do the notice provisions, but they also, you know, put them out way in advance. And one of the residents was right. I think we have canceled two of them because there wasn't an event upcoming. So they're not doing this just to do it. They're just doing it to prep when they're going off site for larger demonstrations. Again, this is a, a very unique use. I think that you'll see that all of the volunteers on this site um, are veterans. So they're people who have been in the arena of war and they are changing it into something positive for an education and remembrance. And so we're just asking for your approval here to continue the operations with a few little tweaks. And if you have any follow-up questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Mr. Feller. In the uh, brevity trying to get through. Um, the two days that they currently have, do they, you know they utilize them back to back? If we had, if the third day is added, are they trying to do it all together? Or is it supposed to be spread out? I mean, how do you know how that's planning? Just yeah. So for clarity, the third day that they are asking for is not a third day of demonstration. Um, the third day they are asking for is just a day where they can test the weapons. Um, so it is not a full demonstration. It is not all of the volunteers are on site. It is just the day to day operators of the site will test the weapons for safety. And so if you have restrictions you'd like on time, if you only want it to be from 12 to five, 
something like that, we're happy to pull those in. They just want to make sure those weapons are safe before the volunteers are on site. But in the current, it would just be the same eight to three that the other days right. are, is right now, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't have any problem if it was limited back or? No. Just, no. Not that it needs to, I'm just asking. Yeah. Uh, that's my only question, thank you so much. Can you, uh, can you clarify when you say test, they're live firing though? So they fire blanks. Um, and powder rounds, and so but it is live fire. It yes. is a live fire test. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not just a matter of mechanically testing the equipment, they're actually firing the equipment. Right. If I may, Mr. Speaker. Go ahead, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple, couple questions for you. You made a comment that they have had a few practices canceled. Yes. So they didn't even utilize those. Right. <clears throat> How many, roughly, would you say, in the I span of a year? I believe we've canceled two. Two total? Two for Chris. Two, yes. Yep. I say we've canceled two of the ones this year already. I'm just looking at this, skinning this cat differently. Rather than giving you two days for the year, we give you a total of, I mean, two days for, per month, we give you a total for the year, and that way you can accumulate them. If you don't use them this month, you can roll them over into the next month, but not to exceed, you know, 24 in a 12-month period. That, yeah, that if that's something that would be amicable, as opposed to giving you an additional day per month, which is another 12 days. Right. Well, and uh, we're happy to follow the board. Um, we have had. It's just a comment. It's something for us to discuss up yeah. here as well. I just wanted to know if that was something that could be, that would, you know, work within your confines. We'll follow your lead, but I do want to say we don't want another day of demonstration. We think that what we have is plenty. We just want an additional day of testing the weapons. So the, the rapid fire, everyone's dressed up. They're out there on the tanks. They're moving around. Mm -hmm. That we still, you know, two days. Well, we're not ready. differentiating between the test day and the demonstration day, are we? I don't believe so with the current drop, but you could if you needed to. Yeah. Because either way, they're still firing. Right. So whether it's a demonstration or a test, it's a still a fire session. Right. And it could be two or three shots, or it could be the duration of whatever your demonstration goes, whether it's the 30 minute demonstration or a 10 minute, you know, however the situation goes. Okay. I would say in the, so the, really the regulation only applies to heavy artillery. Okay. So if you remember the first time around, they said we can't really regulate handgun firing. Sure. And so those can be tested in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? I, I, Jay, you got something to say? Well, I, <clears throat> I was just thinking about his comment about ganging them. If we had them, if the way they're doing them now, they're only doing one, <clears throat> one basically one a month. If you grouped them and said that they could have 12, theoretically they could do 12 in a two month period. Uh, if they have no objection to the one a month, I, I think that's the, that would at least give you a better schedule. I, I'm, in, I'm in favor of the, leaving it the way it is. Okay, we'll just take that up in our discussions. Okay, any questions? Yeah, one other have? question. On the, on the map, mm -hmm. the 117 acres, where is most of the fire take place? Yeah, so they're, they tee up kind of at that front right along the state road, um, and then the tanks maneuver through the dash lines, and they go to what I call the valley or the bowl. Um, in the back, those cleared areas kind of way along the Acorn bottom. Lake in the back, that's where the actual you know, firing takes place. Right. So it's not actually on 415? No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. We're going to close the floor for public participation. Chair, does that, does that include code board? I have a quick question, if we can. Go ahead. Code board. Um, you said that they, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Hutchins, I said get you up here. Um, you, you've not found the uh, applicant to be in violation of any noise ordinances or anything like that. Um, I know uh, they said that testing was done earlier. There's no violations on noise ordinance for this property, just complaints, but no violations, correct? Chris Hutchison, Volusia County Code Compliance, that is correct. And I, I assume that there's a way to, I mean, is there any, and this is probably not for Code Board, thank you so much. Is there any way that we've tested that in the future? Okay, we're gonna I, that, have to. Yeah, I don't know about that, but there's, but there's no, you've not found them to be in violation of the code, of the noise ordinance. That is correct. All right. Okay, we're going to close the floor for public participation and open up for commission discussion. I might add that this is a prime example of bringing in development to your rural areas very adjacent to it, and you move in, and in the rural areas you do have a lot of gunfire, let's face it. 
whether it be hunting, uh, target practicing, or whatever. Uh, so that's the way I'm looking at this. Unfortunately, the property owner that bought his house needs to know he's moving into close to a rural area and, and to expect this kind of, but uh, anyway, I, I want to hold the comments, please, sir. We're just, uh, and uh, any other comments, Mr. Bender? Well, let me get this out of the way before anybody start throwing rocks at me. <laughs> I served in, in the United States Army. I am 100% disabled, service connected. However, in saying that, I did not support uh, the placement of this activity next to the residences when it went before us before. And I think I was probably the only one in opposition. Sound like on this board and nobody on the county council. I still cannot support it, even though everything that I've heard about these guys is admirable. It sounds like a neighbor I wouldn't mind having, minus the noise and, and the tanks and things like that, the gunfire. Because where I sleep, I don't necessarily care to have that kind of activity. I think it's a wonderful thing, and I just don't think next to residences is where something like that should be. So for that reason, I can't support it. But it sounds like a, a, a fine operation, whatever they're doing. Any other comments? I would I'd like to make one. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, go I'd ahead, I'd just Shelley. like to make one comment. Ms. Um, Shelley? I appreciate all of the public input we had today, and I also uh, think um, our first speaker had, had many valid points to make, and we are doing our best to consider those points as we move forward with this project. Thank you for speaking. Mr. Feller? Uh, the only thing I'd like to say is this seems like it's limited to the hours of eight and three during the daytime. I know that messes with somebody's sleep schedule if they work nights, but um, I feel like it's, for something like this, it's, it has tried to be put parameters on that work within. Um, I live in this rural area too. I'm not too far away from here. And I, I would agree with you, gunfire in a rural area is uh, something that, you know, even if you're buying a house before they get started, I mean, you're buying up against agriculture on rural land. Um, so that's, uh, I f feel like this has really been put together in a way that limits it. Um, I don't know that the extra day, I kind of side with Mr. Young here on that extra day. I don't know that I would pull them all up, but if, uh, if they're looking for an extra day, if, uh, if the council wanted to look at minimizing that in any way, that's fine. I, I, it sounds like they'd be up for it, but it seems like another day of eight to three just for testing. Uh, doesn't seem like it's affecting the most immediate neighbors and that they're not against it. So that would be my comments. Mr. Young. Yeah, my comment, uh, again, I, I think that leaving it the way it is, is, is at least then we have a schedule in there. It's one time. And again, I agree with you him test firing is only going to be one or two sh shots for each device so i don't see any problem with it so i'm in favor of it i did originally and i am now thank you anyone else going back to the uh combining them that would be multiple days uh, i could understand that scenario of what you're trying to say but i just putting multiple days right after another. What, what is it now, two days a month? Right. And you want to add a third day, is that correct? So we originally approved it for two days a month, mm -hmm. and they're asking for one more day for test firing. Mm -hmm. My question, and it's from eight to three. Um, I just trying to, I don't understand why they can't do their test firing on one of the days before the thing. Uh, we're already giving them two days a month to do this heavy artillery firing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I understand the adjacent property owners having an issue with that. A lot of what I've heard, some of the, what I heard from the individual's audio there was small gunfire. Well, we're not regulating that anyway. This is just the heavy artillery that we're regulating. Uh, so I don't know if the additional day you know, is really what they need for the, that they couldn't do that prior to their event or whatever. 
on the two days. Yeah, they um, couldn't do it the day of the event. Yeah, and instead yeah, of adding an additional, yeah. now we're giving them three days a month, a year rather, or a, per month. Me, I'm hearing one fire mm -hmm. per yep. unit. I, I just. Mr. Chair, could we bring her forward and ask her that question? If you'd like. And yeah, I, I, I would like to ask that question then. I mean, when the what when you do your perf your performance or whatever you I mean what you call it, <laughs> uh, huh? Your practice. practice, okay. You start it. You how long is the whole show? Sure, I would say, and I'm going to answer to the best of my ability. And Chris will shake his head no if I'm wrong, or he will come up and answer because he is the day to day manager of the site. So we have the two day allowance for the demonstrations. Typically what they have seen is that those demonstrations aren't actually starting until about noon in terms of firing. Um, so eight o'clock, you know, the volunteers are on site, medical staff is on site, you're getting everything ready, you're starting the trucks and running them to make sure that they don't break. Um, the request for additional firing is that before all of those people are on site, just operating and testing the heavy artillery while you don't have so many civilians and volunteers there. So that is the purpose of the request. If you say that's inappropriate, we will figure it out. We continue to. Um, it is just a safety concern. Um, I think that they could do it in a three hour time period. If you said one additional day from two to five, we would make that work. Um, that is the reason for the request. And so it will be up to you. Then I understand you that <clears throat> even though we allow you from eight, uh, from eight to four, what is it, eight to three, yeah, that your performance or your whatever your firing is normally only from like three hours of that time yeah yes yep. that's my understanding i'm getting the nod so i got okay. that right yeah <laughs> so okay that, that's what i was trying to clarify so so the reason for not testing prior to the noon time is what we have volunteers on site so the the same concern of it's a fa safety, safety issue right so so you'd like to test fire the day prior of, prior to? The day or? prior, three, whenever the repair happens. These vehicles are repaired. We would like to test after the repair to make sure that they fire correctly before we have volunteers on site and something could go awry. We have medical staff on site. We don't want to use them. So, so you'd have to do all the repair test firing on that particular day or right. one day. Right. That mm -hmm. if we were, or, or one time slot that we would, if we granted it to a time slot right. in a month. Okay. Right. Would the applicant be okay with that? With one yeah. thing, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, that's, that sounds good. Thank you. Okay, well, getting back to my point about combining the, the, the dates, I think what bothers the neighbors is that the continuous day after day after day. And so, it, to me, that would get, seem like it would be more annoying that's the that's the point I'm trying to get at. Now we're giving them two days a month. Right now, currently, what they were approved for was two days a month. We're looking at the third day to be added, in order to do a test firing on repairs. Um, and they're open from eight to three. And like she stated, the event doesn't start till twelve. I just, to me, I just can't understand why that test firing can't be done prior to the event. Well, that was the question I just asked. And I think she said it was from a safety issue because they had the volunteers on site. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I would be supportive of not a full day of test firing, but I would give them a window and I wouldn't go to five o'clock. I would stay within that eight to three. So I would say from noon to three, you can do a test firing once a month or a whatever day, day before. Yeah. As long as it, again, it needs to be announced like everything else. Um, but before us also are, is another request for, for two specific days for demonstrations, one being Veterans and one being Memorial Day. Right. So now we've got, in addition to the two days a month that we're giving them, they're asking for two more days. And so my one of the things about combining and not to exceed, say, 24 demonstration days in a year is if they don't use the demonstration day in January, they can actually take that and bank it and use it on Memorial Day. Uh, I, I got the question I have is, the, are they asking for a day of, of performing or opening to the public and not shooting? That's the question that I would have is those two additional days, are you wanting to shoot the guns too or are you just opening it for the public to see the equipment? I wouldn't think you'd want to shoot when the people are there. 
Sure. May, um, I, may I make a point yeah. before, because it might tie into, um, I'm hearing conversations saying two additional days, but according to the application, it's, it's one, one day, day, either Memorial Day or right. Veterans Day. So it would, it would only be one extra day. So, But anyway. you're just opening for the public. You're not shooting guns in those days. So I will say that this is really up to you all. A s county staff recommended it could be an educational asset. The property owner has no intention of opening this to the public. But we are at a zoning level, and so if five years from now that changes, do they want the opportunity? If they can't go out to the fairgrounds to have a celebration, do you guys want them to have the opportunity? If you say no, we are completely fine because we have no plans. Um, it is just for future flexibility and whatever you envision that flexibility to be, we would work with. And so it is truly in your discretion. I would support that you open it to the public, but not no gun shooting during that time. That's my opinion. That's like going to an air show without having airplanes flying. <laughs> I was say, well, I yeah, I, but yeah. it's also a safety issue on my part. Opening to the public with big gun firing would be. But, but they've not, got volunteers out there already, places. though, and they got they've got medics too, right? We do, and I will say that they are practicing for demonstrations, you know, nationwide that have visitors, yes. and so they are prepared for those things, but. Whatever you guys think is best on that one. We're not. All right. Yeah. I do have one more question, Chair, if I can. Is the need for the practice day to also repair? Oh, I think he's in, he may not be listening. But um, do, is there a repair window that needs to happen? If they practice and it doesn't work, do they need a certain amount of time? Or if it just doesn't work, they'll scrap it till the next time type of a thing? Yeah, I say I don't think they need a backup. The repairs are happening outside of that window. It would just okay. be to test the to firing. Test. If for some reason the test what didn't work, then that would just be shelved, I think, for that practice. So if we and were putting a test day with a time frame of, say, three hours the day before their scheduled day, mm -hmm. does that mess them up? Does it say, oh, well, that doesn't work for us. We need the test day to be a week before so we can test it. Does that make a sense or no? The only thing I would say is that they don't, they haven't typically operated on weekdays for the heavy artillery. So you're saying the day before, which would be a Friday. And so mm -hmm. that's up to you guys. We just said a day in case it's the weekend prior for three hours. Um, so it's on a Saturday, so people aren't working, you know, typically. So that's so to my cohorts. I would I would be less likely to uh, if we were to add a day to add it the day before a scheduled event. It would just be some day that they could test, you know, not necessarily the three hours before the day they're doing it. Right. So that would just that's be it's for discussion. It's written to be the day before. No, it's just written yeah. no, as any day. No, it was brought it was brought up as maybe putting it limiting it to it the day before. I'm just yeah. saying that I would not be supportive of limiting it to the day before. Thank you. Yeah. But you're okay with the 12 to 3? I would absolutely be okay with the, the, the shortened window of time. Good. Mr. Costa, would you like to comment? <laughs> he's thinking heavy. Uh, uh, I think, know yeah. his mind's running over there. <laughs> I'm trying to come up with a, I'm trying to come up with something that works not only for, um, the operation, but also for the neighbors. I mean, I, I, I understand, I can, I understand his concern. Um, we've, we've, you know, we've made this a, a, a valid point and I, I think what I'm, what I'm trying to limit is not opening this up to more live fire days, but limiting it. And if they, I understand the testing portion from a standpoint, especially from safety. Um, and I think that a, a, a two to three hour window is more than sufficient. The question about limiting it to the day before, if they're only live firing on weekends, you don't want to do this on a Friday, on a weekday, which is now impacts the neighbors even more. I would say it has to be on one of those weekend days and can only happen within this certain day. And you only get one a month, period. That's it. You get one shot a month. Whether you use it or you don't use it, you're done. You get three hours of testing time anytime during a 12 month, you know, a 30 day period and, and limit it that way. That way it doesn't give them a full seven hours of, you know, we're testing, it didn't fire, let's fix it again, go back out and try to fire. It did, just got to stay in this inside of a window, you know, give these folks some kind of a break. So that's, I think I would support that. Something with the, and I'm not sure of the language because I'm talking in circles at the moment. So I'll let one of you guys come up with it. <laughs> I, I don't know the language either, but I, I am supportive of the open house as well too, but that would now be one additional day per year. So we're talking about one additional full day per year plus 
three hours times 12, um, you know, I, I get it. It doesn't, to me, it doesn't sound like it's a, it's a strong ask uh, outside of that. Um, I mean, I could be supportive of, you know, of doing something to that, like you said, one or the other on a Memorial Day or a Veterans Day. I could be supportive of an open house and a limited window for testing for safety once a month. Well, if I can get her to come back and clarify, I, now that I'm reading that line, please. So I'm looking through 19, honor, celebrate, serve, facility open to the public, uh, one year, on-site parade, battle reenactment. Battle reenactment, does that include firing? Or so is that- this language came from county staff. Um, we are happy to revise it. Um, we worked with them to review it. And I think the intent, the big picture would be a reenactment. I think that was the, the suggestion that came up. If you just want it to be educational display, it's perfectly fine as well. Um, again, if you want to strike it, that's fine. Um, so that was county. I understand again, it was county staff. But when you guys read this, how did you interpret it? I think we read it as a demonstration, like we would do at you know full reenactment. So with fires, okay, okay. All right, that's what I need to know. Thank you. Goes we're only talking our, one day. A yeah, year. back to our conversation. So now we're adding an additional day. Yeah, so just we're one time a day per year. So that's for that uh, special yeah. event mm -hmm. for the public. And it would be either or memorial or veterans, not both. Okay. Correct. Which I think would be a huge asset uh, to the general public, especially. Okay. And you and you would be a, a, a the limited time for for testing you you'd support you'd support you brought it up i would support i would support the testing in a shorter window okay. in a 3 hour window okay That's as long as it stays within the confines they have now which is what uh, 8 to 3 3 so yeah. figure so like out from, you know, like 11 to 2 or something 11 to like 2 that. or noon to 3 however you want to do it i would say a 3 hour right. window and okay we don't have to make a determination of Veterans Day or Memorial Day. Just give them the one day, and they can pick whatever they want. Correct? Is that? I mean, I'd be. I'm. I'm open to that. Yeah. Okay. If it pleases the board, we can revise Condition Eight to say one additional day each month of equipment testing shall be allowed, and we can add the words between the hours of 12 and 3 to ensure the safety of volunteers who participate. If that if that meets the lawyers, that's fine. That just puts the. I don't think there was a discussion on on which day we'll leave that up to the applicant to determine which which day is best for that repair but you're limiting it to the time period so it's not the full seven hours of potential repair test repair test and that okay which condition was that eight eight, eight. okay so if one were to make a motion on this would they include the the change that you just mentioned yes eight? just say revised condition number eight um, condition between eight. the hours of 12 and 3. And then the additional day that's talked about on 19 on page seven, that's, that does not have to have any clarification, correct? No. It would just be up to there. They would get one day. One day. And then they could use it however they want. Yes. So with that. Sir, we're going to, the floor has been closed to public participation. I wish I could. We could, we, we've got to get to the end of this. And we can't continue. Yeah. So with that, I'm going to attempt to put a motion together here in case uh, S23-001 um, that we, this is a forward, correct? This will be forwarding. Yep. We're forwarding this to the County Council with a recommendation of approval with the condition eight or yeah, condition eight revised as mentioned here. As mentioned. I'll second that. With all the staff recommendations. With the staff, all the, yeah. with all the, with that, yeah. All the recommendations with the revision of eight, yeah. And how I'll many second. conditions are that? Uh, is that 19? <clears throat> 19? Eight, 19. Conditions with the revision of eight. Okay. okay. I'm gonna have to try to repeat this. <laughs> <laughs> I took a stab at it. <laughs> okay. You did good. I believe, and you correct me if I'm wrong, we got a motion on the floor for Mr. Feller to forward the S23001 to County Council with a recommendation of approval with the change in condition eight 
and also stating that the additional test firing would be done between the hours of 12 and 3. That's correct. Yeah. Yes, that would, would that change? And also, the additional day that would be requested would be their choice, whether it be Memorial or Veterans. Is that correct? Yeah. I'll okay. second that then. And well, let me finish. Oh, I thought you were finished. <laughs> he seconds what you That's just it. said. Though. <laughs> and and so we're. That that was the additional day, and otherwise, other way it stays the same with the two days per month. Yeah, nothing changes. Then. Okay, nothing, nothing changes. else changes. Nothing okay, else changes. and Jay seconds that. And Jay seconds that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, nothing else changes. That's okay. All right. Any discussion on the motion? On hearing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries six to one with Mr. Bender. And uh, what do you want to call it? <laughs> Objection. There we go. All right, let's move on to the next case, Ms. Shelley. Yes, sir. Case number CPA 22 011, small scale comprehensive plan amendment from the urban low intensity ULI future land use designation to the commercial CCM designation. Okay, thank you, Ms. Shelley. And let me see who this is. This is um, Ms. Smith. Yes, sir, Trish Smith, Planning and Development Services. Um, this is a comprehensive plan amendment. It's a request for a small scale comp plan amendment from urban low intensity future land use designation to a commercial designation. The applicant wants to build a self storage facility or a mini warehouse, which requires a commercial land use. There is a companion rezoning, which will be heard following this item, and that is contingent upon approval of the land use change. This is a vacant parcel located on the south side of State Road 44, just east, east of Kepler Road. State Road 44 is an FDOT maintained state highway and part of the county's thoroughfare road network. The surrounding properties do have a future land use of ULI, ULI allows for residential and some commercial uses. There is a recently constructed animal emergency hospital immediately west of the property and a gas station at the intersection that both fit in with, within the ULI guidelines. Um, there are residential properties to the north, to the east, and to the south. To be consistent with the surrounding uses, the applicant agreed to a comprehensive plan future land use map notation so that will go into the comprehensive plan, limiting the commercial use to an 89,900 square foot mini warehouse. That is on page 13 of 28 of the staff report. The mini warehouse is defined in the zoning ordinance as an enclosed storage area containing individually rented or owned compartments or stalls for storage only. Any other type of commercial use would require a comprehensive plan amendment with two public hearings. The comp plan note will help to control the amount of traffic generated by the proposed use. The applicant did hold a public meet, uh, I'm sorry, a neighborhood meeting earlier this week. And then based on that neighborhood meeting, we're recommending one change to the comp plan note on page 13 to delete the words and self storage space and add the word use after mini warehouse. This will eliminate the potential for outside storage as requested by the residents. Uh, due public notice resulted in one phone call of opposition. We ask that you forward the item to the County Council with a recommendation of approval and the applicant is present to share the results of the neighborhood meeting and I believe they do have a presentation and we do have public input. Uh, do we have any questions for staff? If not, would the applicant please come forward. Good morning. For the record, I'm Rob Merrill, also with Cobb Cole, 149 South Ridgewood in Daytona, and we have an office right down the street on Woodland Boulevard as well. Um, I have a couple of, uh, just a, a housekeeping item. I've got a couple of things I want to make sure can be put up on the overhead. Do we have the, um, I gave you all an architectural rendering, that, and then there's this, um, it was on page eight, I think, of the staff report. Is there a way you can 
project that as well? Not at the moment, but ultimately? Good, thank you. So first of all, thanks guys. I know you all are volunteers. Um, this is probably, I, I've been in front of this board for over 35 years. I don't think I've seen an agenda this long ever. Um, and you're only through one item, so God bless you. Thank you for being here. I know you're not getting paid. Um, I'll start by introducing a few folks that are here with me. We've got a team of people. Um, Scott Vanacore is the owner of the property that we're talking about today. Parker Minchenberg, uh, our civil engineer, is, is right behind me. Uh, Jessica Gao, who you just heard from, is uh, working with us on this project. And Crystal Mercedes uh, is our traffic consultant with Laster Transportation Group. You know, your staff uh, is some of the best in the business, so you've got a recommendation and a pretty thorough report that hopefully you guys had a chance to read through. Um, it does things like look at your land development code criteria, uh, look at your comprehensive plan, talk about consistency. You know, those are the benchmarks that you look at when you're, when you're looking at a decision like this. And when I'm speaking, I should probably back up and tell you, I'm talking in both the context of today's um, or, or this immediate agenda item and the next one. I don't think we need to go through this twice, hopefully. You guys can, can talk about this in both of those contexts. And Paolo, I guess I'll lean on you to make sure that's okay. I'm just trying to, in this, for the sake of time, I'll talk about both of the, the zoning item and the comp plan item because they're, they're really uh, together. We'll accept that. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah so, you'll yeah. just have to vote on them separately. I'm sure you guys are trying to get to lunch at some point. Um, so. You know, the staff has given you both of those analysis, both the comprehensive plan aspect and, and the zoning aspect. And when, we, when I get towards the end of my presentation, there's some procedural aspects to this that I want to talk about that I think are kind of different that I want to make sure everybody's got a good handle on. But I want to start by, by saying a little more about Scott Van. Of course, Scott and I have been friends since grade school. Um, Scott started off swinging a hammer and, as, as a carpenter and and built an incredible um, business here in, in Volusia County and in, in Flagler County, uh, home building primarily for, for I think 35 or plus years. And in the past 15 years or so, he's uh, started to develop self storage facilities. You know, the word mini warehouse came out a few times, Trish. I, you know, that's, that's a word that's starting to become antiquated in part because the, the nature of that, of that uh, uh, business has changed. So we call it self storage. In this case, I think Scott calls it uh, you know, luxury, uh, air-conditioned, self-storage. So it, it's changed a lot, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But Scott's also done office development. He's done commercial retail development. He's done a lot of stuff. So this piece of property, as, as Trish mentioned, you know, this is an urban, urban low intensity, so it's got a lot of different things you could do there. You know, offices, um, retail, like the, like the retail commercial on the corner, um, you know, uh, higher density residential. In this case, I think we calculated 18 or 20 townhomes that could be built there. But when Scott looked at this property uh, and purchased it, by the way, in this past year, it was with the vision of doing self-storage. Um, and I'll talk about some reasons about that. But when you're thinking about the idea of the self-storage, I want you to think about it in comparatively against the things that are allowed there now, both in the comp plan context and in the zoning context. So the self-storage industry has changed. You know, we, we now see nice architecture, more modern architecture. Uh, in this case, um, it was mentioned that we've had conversations with the neighborhood. We had a meeting this week with the neighbors, and about nine or ten months ago, we had an informal meeting. This is not a, uh, you know, a, a required uh, neighborhood meeting, which some jurisdictions do, and I think is a good idea. So we did it voluntarily uh, starting with nine or ten months ago. I think it was December of, of, of this past year. And we, we met with the folks out at Lake Winnemus said, I've, I've got some friends that live on the lake. They, you know, we talked about this project and they invited us to come talk to everybody, which we did. When we did that, a lot of things came from that in terms of input from the neighbors, which I think is very productive. I, I do that even before it was required. Um, it keeps your job a little easier. I don't know how easy it's going to be today, but normally it makes it easier at least. So as part of that conversation with them, we talked about, you know, the architecture of the project. So if you wouldn't mind popping up the, uh, the first rendering that we talked about. So um, I guess to scale it might be better, but you guys are looking at it in your screen so you can see it pretty well. So the architecture that we chose here is similar to one that we are just starting construction at Port Orange. And it's in a pretty similar situation in that it has a lot of different uses around the post offices across the street. There's some other 
retail uses around, and then right behind it is a, is a nice residential neighborhood. So when we did this, we, we tried to draw from some of the architecture in the area, which we did here. Um, interestingly and sort of ironically, in fact, that the folks that we met with at their home on the lake kind of looks like this, uh, this architecture. So it's kind of the Florida vernacular style architecture. And it doesn't look like what people normally think of as a self-storage facility when they used to call them mini warehouses. So it's not a square box with orange doors, you know, that you know, looks like something that you don't need a sign because you know what it is. In this case, it looks like a nice office building or a nice, you know, uh, multifamily structure. So architecture was important to us and it was important to the neighbors when we first met with them. So this is what, this is what came out of that conversation. You know, by its nature, self-storage is a utility, if you will, for the neighborhood. It's a convenience. It's a place where people can put their stuff when the garage is overflowing or the, the side yard has a canoe or too many paddle boards or something that are becoming unsightly for the neighborhood or the code enforcement uh, officer that comes by and says, you're not supposed to leave that stuff outside. So ultimately what happens here is people put them inside and usually they stay there for quite some time. They don't come back and forth and, and get their canoe. Uh, normally speaking. So that's part of the reason why we knew we needed to meet with the residences. This is going to be in a neighborhood. By nature, it is in a neighborhood. So we talked about a lot of different things. Security, you know, the idea that it's a safe place. So when you talk about things that are, you know, foreign to people, they wonder whether it's going to be safe to them, whether it's going to be something that the police have to come and, and visit. And, you know, this is absolutely not that. And you can statistically look and see that Self-storage facilities do not generate police and fire protection. Very little whatsoever. In this case, I'm sorry to switch you back and forth again, but if you can do the plan for me one more time. If you look at the plan, and it's in your packet if you guys want to look at it closely on page 8, I think, you'll see that essentially the, the, the lines that you see that are just around the outside of the tree line, those are building lines. So the entire thing is a building wall that has one entrance in the upper right-hand side of the screen. So it's gated, you need a car to get in or out, and otherwise you cannot get in or out of this building. Other than if you look at the bottom right hand side, that is not a driveway. The white, uh, what looks like a driveway that goes out to State Road 44 is an emergency access point that will be grassed, sodded, uh, and it'll have a crash gate for a fire truck or an ambulance if there's ever something that blocks the entrance. That's the only reason why that's there. So. Again, in part in response to some feedback we got from the neighbors, if anybody's out in this neighborhood, you know that State Road 44 in this vicinity is full of cars. Um, you know, my neighbors that I go visit out there, sometimes it's hard to get out of the driveway because the, the, the traffic is so, is so frequent and so uh, constant. So we're, we're aware of that. So what we did was we decided to share the driveway that you see in the very upper right-hand side. It's hard to see, I'm sorry. But there is a driveway that goes into the animal hospital that's existing there now. We're essentially going to use their driveway, come across uh, to, towards ours, and enter our, our site from their driveway. So no additional driveways on the road on State Road 44. So in terms of transportation impacts, because that's a big thing in this conversation. It's a big thing in every conversation, you know, in Volusia County and in Florida right now. Because... We have a thousand more people coming a day, right? So they're going to bring cars and they're going to drive more on the roads. This is already a congested area and we get that. So when we looked at this, when my client looked at it, the first thing he said was, if we're going to build something here, this is by far the least intensive use that we could put there from a traffic impact standpoint. Now, I've got Crystal Mercedes who's going to come up and say a few things about that. That's her world and she's got her, her own way of explaining that to you. But I can tell you, if you've ever been to one of these places, you're not seeing a bunch of cars lined up to go in. You're not seeing cars coming in and out probably at all unless you sit there for a couple hours. People just don't come in and out of these facilities on a very frequent basis. So from a trip generation standpoint, and Scott has actually, he keeps track of it on his facility. So we have actual data that we can share with you. But at the end of the day, I think you guys know this is something that there's not a lot of traffic that's generated, which is a huge thing and a huge factor for you guys to think about when you're comparing to what could be there. So when Trish talked about the ULI, it's kind of a, what they call a transitional future land use. So the reason why you can do convenience commercial, like the convenience store at the corner or offices or you know, multifamily there is because 
it's kind of a transition between the houses next to it and the commercial that's literally a, a stone's throw from this piece of property. To me, this is absolutely the perfect transition because it's quiet, you're not going to see it, hear it, and you're not going to see cars going in and out of it. So water and sewer demands are another sort of, people talk about infrastructure. You know, you hear your, you know, your leadership in Volusia County talking about all these people are coming to us, but we want to make sure we have the infrastructure in place. Well, the infrastructure is in place here, but you think about the impact that's required for the infrastructure to be in place. I think we're going to have two toilets and two sinks on this piece of property. So the entire project has two toilets and two sinks. If we built 20 townhomes there, there's going to be 20 times as many of those. So from a water and sewer standpoint, very little impact. And I think Parker Minchberg can, can weigh in further on that. Stormwater and drainage and flooding. You know, this, this storm has made flooding a topic on every case that I deal with since it happened and since the previous storms have happened. So I think Parker, I'm going to ask Parker to say a few things about flooding, um, but our residents that live on the lake out there are particularly concerned with the lake being clean and not being affected by anything, this project or any other project. So Parker can also talk about the fact that we've gone above and beyond in terms of the code requirements with stormwater protection and uh, nutrient loading was a question that was asked. That's not my expertise, uh, but I think it's important. I think that you know I've spent a lot of time, my body has been in that lake many, many, many times. I know it's a clean, beautiful lake. We don't want to affect the lake, and I think Parker's going to be able to explain to you that we will not. So when you look at the uh, right-hand side of the, uh, of the screen up there, you see basically a bunch of trees on the right-hand side. Then you see what's a, it's a dry stormwater area, the place that's got the the rectangle wrapped around it. So originally we had that stormwater pond on the left-hand side of the screen on the back of the property. When we met with the neighbors, they said, you know, we really would like your building to be less intrusive. Bring it further back off of the road so it's not right in front of us when we drive by every day. So when you see the, the pond that's been switched from the back of the property to the front, it created a great deal more space between the building, which is, and I wish I had some colors that I could show you guys, but if you look at the, the area, the, the line that's just to the left of the big rectangle, that's the building face. So the building's actually 125 feet back from the road. The area that you see on the right-hand side that's cross-hatched is the area that's gonna remain in tree conservation. So. By, the, by the, the county code, we're required to have a certain amount of tree conservation and landscape plantings, which we're going to be doing both of. If you look at the property and you wrap all the way around the area that's in white, there are existing trees there. So I think somebody said this was originally an orange grove that was planted. But if you, if you go to the site, you'll see there are lines, literally, of trees throughout the property. So this is very heavily treed. I wish I had a, a picture from State Road 44. But if you've driven by it, I think you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's got a tree line there that's beautiful. And then when you look at the second one again, I'm sorry to switch back and forth. The architectural rendering shows you trees, and those aren't the real trees. But they're intended to show what the trees will look like actually with less vegetation than what's really there that we're going to preserve so that the architect's work can kind of be shown and you guys can get a flavor for it. But at the end of the day, this is mostly going to be trees with a little bit of building behind it ultimately. And again, that was one of the things the neighbor said. We want it to look nice both architecturally and we don't want to see a whole lot of it. So that's how that turned out that way. One of the things that the neighbors also talked about was normally these self-storage facilities, even the newer ones that have nice architecture and buffering and, and modern stormwater controls and such, they normally have boat and RV storage. It's a big thing. People want to have a place to put their boats and RVs. And so in this case, we had originally planned, when you look at the plan and the building runs around the entire perimeter, there's an open area in the middle that you can put boats and RVs. Sometimes they put, you know, open covered areas and sometimes they're just, they're just open. In this case, we decided to eliminate them completely. Um, and I felt like the neighbors had a pretty good reason for that. They said, you know, you're saying that the people barely come and go when they're putting stuff inside the air conditioned facility, but what about the people with boats? And we thought about that, and maybe there's some fishermen that go every weekend. And so if they leave their boat there and come every weekend, that's a lot more trips than we had anticipated. 
So in this case, we decided to completely eliminate the, uh, the boat and RV storage. So again, something the neighbor said, we responded. They talked about lighting. So we fully uh, analyzed and planned for low level lighting, all down lighting, none of which will go beyond the property boundaries. And we can, we can show that by photometric uh, design if you, if you chose. Uh, but at the end of the day, lighting will not be a problem because we're going to make sure that lighting does not get to the neighbors. Hours of operation. So um, I think some of these facilities are 24-7. In this case, we decided we're going to limit it to 6 in the morning to 10 at night. Now, again, it's so controlled with a gated, a locked gate, and we actually have folks on, on premises as well some of that time. Uh, I don't think there's any remote chance that it's going to bother anybody at any time during the day. So one of the big and probably most challenging things for you guys, and I think some of the, some of the folks are gonna come up, um, certainly my friend Astrid DePerry, who's a neighbor here as an attorney, and I think she knows uh, the, the lay of the land well in terms of land use and, and zoning. And we've heard from some of the other neighbors on this point as well. You know, the, the commercial or industrial, as some people have said, you know, tag that this type of project has is troublesome to some people. Uh, the thought is that it, it creates an intrusion because of its nature by name. And I'm gonna say it's only by name. And in the struggle that I'm having that we had with staff and that we've come to terms with, and is the reason why you have a recommendation of approval on both of these, is because we significantly limited both the future land use and the zoning in the first case by putting a textual policy in the comprehensive plan Yes, it's called commercial because there's nothing else that we can call it. It's not residential. It's not industrial. Um, you know, so it's got to be called something. My original thought was let's just change the urban low intensity to say self-storage is allowed with these parameters. But staff didn't want to open that door or try that route. So I said, how about this? We'll do commercial, but it will be only this very specific type of commercial. No residential, no retail, no offices, no anything else. So when you look at the PD agreement and you look at the comprehensive plan policy that is embedded into the, the land use change that we're talking about, it says exactly that. And I'll say that again because it's important. Your staff will confirm for you that without question, we can do nothing other than self-storage on this piece of property. Nothing else. And when you look at all of the, the, the parameters that are in the PD agreement, you guys have done a lot of these, so you understand. I don't have to tell you, but I'm gonna say it because everybody's listening. We have a plan and we have a written agreement. Those things become our custom zoning map and zoning book. We can't do anything other than what it says. So if you see something in the written agreement that you have a problem with, tell me, because we'll change it. And if you see something in there that you would question whether we would really do it or not, both on the plan or in the agreement, I'll answer, we have absolutely no choice. And these folks will make sure of that. So it's, it's, a, it's an ironclad zoning provision that we have to live with. So what you see is what you get, is essentially what happens with the PD. Another thing I'll say, I guess, is, you know, the words domino effect or catalytic effect uh, have been talked about. So does this mean that somebody else is going to come in and put a shopping center next to me or something that they don't want? That's commercial. The answer to that is this is exactly what we're doing. No more, no less. If you can accept this and understand that it is the absolutely least intensive thing that could ever be done here other than probably a, a graveyard, and that may be more intensive than this, then think about whether that sets a precedent. To me, it sets a precedent to do less, to be less intrusive, to have less intensity. So you'll hear that. You'll hear people say, well, we're just, the biggest thing we're worried about is it's gonna have a domino effect into our neighborhood. I think you guys are understanding because I've said it three or four times already now, this is all we're doing. And if it's a catalyst for something else like this, good. Come up with another plan that's less intense than this. And that should be acceptable to the neighbors, in my opinion. So with that, sorry it takes so long. I know you guys have a long agenda, but Parker, if you wouldn't mind, I'm gonna ask you to say a few things. He's behind. Yeah. 
And I'm going to stay with you just in case. All right. <laughs> uh, good morning still. For the record, Parker Minchinburg, 1729 Ridgewood Avenue. It's always fun following Rob. Um, <clears throat> Rob wanted me to talk a little about the drainage design. Um, on the uh, rendering, the property, unlike a lot of sites that I design, it has about five foot of fall from the left side to the front. So the rear of the property is um, around elevation 72, mean sea level, and New York Avenue is about elevation 67. So you can see around the perimeter, there's a 35 foot building setback of which 30 feet of it, we're gonna keep it existing grade, keep the existing trees. So the drainage flow patterns around the perimeter will be unchanged. Um, Rob kind of alluded to nutrient loading. This is on the St. John's map. Uh, we have to treat for nutrient loading. When you don't have nutrient loading, it's a lot more efficient to dig a wet detention pond and do your treatment in a wet pond. A wet pond does not remove the nutrients like a dry retention pond. So the stormwater design for this, um, once we're through the zoning process, we're gonna have that uh, fairly large dry retention area in the front. And when you do a, a civil plan, you don't put the stormwater treatment on the high, high part of the lot. So um, initially there was another engineer involved and I've been brought in now to kind of uh, make this presentation and finalize the engineering. But the retention pond physically needs to be next to New York because that part of the project is four to five feet lower than the back. With the nutrient loading, we're gonna have a combination of the dry retention, plus we're gonna have conveyance piping, perforated pipe with um, rock trench to help exfiltrate and draw down the dry retention pond. And we're going to exceed the requirements. Let me kind of talk about the requirements. Oftentimes you'll have um, the county and St. John's and their engineers involved in the review. Um, so we will be getting a uh, county uh, stormwater permit. We'll be getting a St. John's permit. And additionally, we'll be studying the 10 storms that the DOT requires because we also have to have a DOT drainage connection permit. Um, this is kind of what I do for a living for 40 years. Um, We'll make sure that we meet everybody's criteria and exceed it. The other thing um, Rob didn't mention that I think is worth mentioning, we have a, a perimeter building that has false windows and then um, I'm also the landscape architect on the project. So we're gonna uh, keep the existing trees where you see cross hatched. In addition to that, uh, at the neighborhood meeting, well, what else besides that? Well, we're gonna have uh, false windows around the whole thing and then there'll be foundation planting at the base of the wall, so you're not just looking at a stucco wall. And I think um, Rob had mentioned the shared access, which um, always good to minimize driveways to the road. And I guess with that, I'll answer any questions. Any questions for the applicant? You have one quick Mr. question Fowler? since you mentioned it. So I know the shared access driveway. Um, being familiar with storage units myself, big trucks. A lot of times they rent a U-Haul. It's not just coming over in the pickup truck always. They rent a U-Haul, come in and out. Um, how is this set for that? I mean, obviously you said it's gated access. Is the parking area or can you drive to each one of these buildings? Is I'm looking at the site plan that's up on your, yeah, up there yeah, right now. Yeah, what you have is you um, have? we do a, a software called Auto Turn to ensure that the trucks can maneuver. We have 35 foot drive lanes in between those rectangles that you see are the buildings. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like uh, a screened interior courtyard and it has sufficient radius to bring your U-Hauls in and out. Any other questions for the applicant? Ms. Can, Kelly? I, can I just make one comment? I'm gonna defer the commentary from Crystal Mercedes who I was gonna ask to talk. If you guys have specific questions about the details of the transportation impact, She's here to answer your questions instead of another presentation for the sake of time. Okay. I do have a question on, on that subject. When you guys did the transportation uh, study, I, it, it, may mean, it may not even require her response. My question is, did you also look at this from the standpoint as if this property were to be developed with homes as opposed to, do, is there a comparison between so, the two? 
Precisely, and that's Perfect. that's what we looked at. So, so what's required of us is to look at what the existing entitlements are versus what we're asking for, and we've limited ourselves so much with the all of the bulletproof pieces that I talked about earlier that it's a dramatic uh, reduction. So, yes, we, Crystal, if you want to talk about, I, that I think that would be important to bring the light. Yeah. Could I ask a question? Sure. But this has nothing to do with transportation. It has to do with a couple of comments that Mr. Merrill made earlier. Okay. So I just want to, can I run those by you now, Rob? Yeah. Do, is, is that all? Do you okay. want to finish, Frank? Or do you want to? You can go ahead and answer the questions. And we'll sure. Go okay. ahead. It's just a couple of things that you mentioned, and I just wanted to clarify them. Took a couple of notes. Um, in the PL. DRC uh, agreement or in the, in the agreement that was, I noticed on page 15 and, and we talked about it, Trish mentioned it earlier about eliminating boats and RV, but in the draft it still lists them as permitted okay. uses. Uh, we can address that at the next item. I think that's one of the things that oh, we're oh, I thought he was going covering to them both together. Uh, yes, yes sorry, but you're going to have I, to. Okay. I, I probably misstep by saying we're doing them both together entirely because I think Paolo was going to mention that that was a typo that meant to have been taken out when we okay. heard from the neighbors. I want to say for the record, even as we sit here on the comp plan item that you guys will vote on before the other item, that we have stipulated that those will be removed. So sorry for the Okay, that's typo. okay. Okay, so you want me to wait with my question? I mean, I understand that we're that we're talking about the comp plan yes, now. Yes, if you just look at the comp plan item. I mentioned to the others as well, so yes. we kind of combined them in the presentation. So, okay, so I'll ask my second question in the next presentation. Right. Okay. Okay. Fundamentally, you can ask the question is, is what are they proposing to do? And the only thing is 89,000 square feet of what we're calling mini warehouse, because that's the, uh, that's our definition in it. So the boat and RV storage is not proposed. It's not in your comp plan um, limitation of what they can only do on the property. Yes, sir. And then my second question then, since Ralph said, I just, you did mention, and it, again, it's just a point of clarification, there would be no retail. And Correct. just wanted to clarify, just, I, you know, I know you mean no retail, but some of these places, and I don't believe I've seen that at, at Mr. Van, of course, but, um, they offer where you can buy boxes or things specific to storage. Is that good, included good, in your Good retail? question. Um, you know, and I meant to say that I got in a hurry because you guys are short on time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we actually, when I referred to the project in Fort Orange as getting ready to be constructed, um, the, the architectural rendering that you saw is very similar, but we had uh, retail along the bottom floor. Port Orange actually had asked for that, um, and, and we felt like it was activating the street front, and it was an important thing. In this case, I think this neighborhood doesn't want anything more activated. Uh, they want quiet. So we eliminated that component. It was part of our original proposal. Okay. So on the checklist of things that we said, okay, we'll change, that was one of them. Thank you. Yep. Just wanted to clarify both those statements. Yep. Thank you. And Frank, did you want to go deeper into the into the actual numbers on that, or I think you got the punch I, I think that at some, some point it's going to come to light. So if you want to wait till it's brought up, we can address it then. Sure, absolutely. My question is for legal on this. Um, is there any way to tie the PUD to the uh, comprehensive plan amendment? They are, they're automatically tied. So if you um, recommend <laughs> if you recommend denial of the comprehensive plan amendment, um, you should recommend denial of the PUD because well, the PUD. Well, I understand that, but right. what I'm saying is if we approve the comprehensive plan amendment, mm -hmm. and even if we approve the PUD and the PUD doesn't go through, well, is uh, the comprehensive plan amendment still in effect? That's yes. my question. Yes, the comprehensive plan amendment is a, a legislative limitation on what can be done in the future for this property. So, so if this PUD fails, they can come in with another rezoning or another PUD, but it's subject to the limitations of the conference of plan of 89,000 square feet of mini warehouse, and that's it. Right. So, so what I think what my point is, is if we do the CPA, because it is, there's no way to tie that to the PUD. In other words, if the PUD didn't go forward, we can't go back and say, okay, there's no, no amendment to the comprehensive plan. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, usually the, you wait for the PUD comes last because the PUD is the implementation of the comprehensive plan. I get so that. fundamentally what you're deciding on the comprehensive plan is the policy and growth of this particular property in the future. And my question is, can we tie that to the PUD? No. I, I have an idea. May I? Sure. Because you have a good point. I hadn't thought of it. Um, so I think where he's going is... Um, the land use comes in, you have an entitlement based on that. 
But the entitlement, like I said, is limited just like the PD is in terms of what you can do there and how much of it. Right. But I've done this before. I've said in the textual provision, Paolo, by PUD. In other words, it's required. If you're going to do that, you have to come through with a PD. Unless you have some objection, I've done that in other jurisdictions several times. I'm happy to do that and stipulate to it right here. So that's where I'm at with so this. That's exactly where is I'm that at. the question is whether you're you, to require a PUD? Because I'm not sure this would be. I mean, you can do that. That's, I, I'm going to volunteer it. Right. So what you're saying is then that if the CPA was passed, mm -hmm. it would only be passed with the acceptance of the PUD. Otherwise, everything goes away. Well, this PUD or any PUD. So no, it has to go through a PD process and be approved by you guys. I mean, clearly, I think that's the given, isn't it? Yeah. Right. That's the yeah. point I'm getting. I, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I like the idea, and I'm happy to say it on the record and add it to the language of the of the uh, complaint. Okay, that's where I'm going. And that's fine. What what it does is it removes the avenue of any other mechanism to approve the um, this project. So it can't be by a special exception. It can't be by a straight zoning. If one exists for this, it has to be by a PUD. Which means that even if this PUD fails at the county level, if you pass it. It'll have to go through as another PUD, and you have you get to take a look at all of it and all the details that goes into it. My point, because the re, you know, and let's say even in the future this were to burn down, and they say, okay, we've got a, a comprehensive plan change here now to a commercial designation. We don't have to go back with the PUD. That's my point. Uh, it's a good idea, and we'll do it. And if you need a job as a land use lawyer, Pardon you me? may call. No, you have to say that was a great, great legal suggestion. Thank you. Okay. So if it pleases the chair, uh, if you want to read the next item in, you could wait to vote on this one and come back and address it after you hear the PUD, if that's your well, pleasure. Well, I don't think that's needed. I mean, uh, unless the other members want to do that. Yeah. We probably have people that want to speak to both cases at this point, so I don't know. Yeah, do you want to go ahead and just wait and then get to hear everything before we decide on any of it? I kind of think we should. I think there's a lot of public participation, okay. so I think we should probably. Are you good with that? Sure. You sure. guys okay. done with me? Any more questions? Okay. I'll sit down. Because I think it definitely is tied in that this is where we're going with this. Um, if it's. How are we going to do that on public participation? Because some of these specifically say the uh, CPA. Because you um, none of them are the PUDs. Because you are uh, you're making a fundamental change to the land use. I would recommend that you you open it up for the Compass of Plan Amendment. Um, as a reminder, uh, public participation. Yes, exactly. this is you're making a legislative decision, so the comp right. substantial evidence standard. Um, doesn't apply. You are looking at whether or not the evidence presented is kind of fairly debatable, which is a lower standard. Um, and you can take into account non-expert testimony, basically, and opinions and preferences of um, the public uh, when they are expressing their desire for this type of policy change. Okay. All right. So we we, we are going to hear the public participation form part of it. Excuse me. What are we going to hear from transportation? She had, that she is, had been called up. You that is in the, to, that's in the PUD. Okay. That's Great. the PUD. Okay. Great. Okay. okay. Just All trying right. to clarify. There we go. I saw her sitting there and didn't want let's you get, to think we were ignoring you. Let's get folks out of the way here, and then we'll proceed forward with their, their comments. Okay. Um, Mr. Cameron. Good morning, sir. If I could get your name and address for the record. Sure. Uh, good morning. I'm Jim Cameron, and that's Jim Cameron Consulting, Daytona Beach. And just, you're hearing more and more and more these days about talk about weak economy and uh, possible reception. But I'm, with this, I'm glad to see a company that's willing to invest. We're talking, I think, like $20 million in, uh, in Volusia. And with this being a self-contained storage facility, I think what you saw on these pictures here, I mean, is uh, one of the highlights is state-of-the-art architecture that should hopefully blend in 
with the surrounding community. And, and I understand that Vanacore and others have, uh, Rob, and they've worked with others in the, in the neighborhood uh, in the vicinity to address things like traffic impact. And so I, I think with this type of facility, you, you're not gonna have as much coming and going there though. But more so, it is going to increase Volusia's tax base. We're glad to see that. So hopefully that'll help down uh, as far as tax rates. But last but not least, I'm excited about the jobs because again, with rising interest rates and uh, a slowdown in housing, construction, things like that, jobs are not gonna be as forthcoming. And it was just announced that Florida's new minimum wage has just increased to $11 an hour this month. But these type jobs we're talking about is uh, in the neighborhood of like $25 an hour, significantly more than what you have uh, elsewhere in Volusia County. So again, I just wanted to iterate though, quality architecture and again, minimal traffic impact, adding to Volusia's tax base, but then $25 an hour type jobs. I like the project. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions for the speaker? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mitchenberg, you put a public request. Did you want to speak again in a presentation? Okay. Mr. Engel. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Like My name is name and address for the record. John Engel, uh, 2215 East New York parking lot. <laughs> um, I did send a communication to many of you. I, I brought copies of the exact same text in case anybody didn't get a chance to read it or would like a copy. I have, have them here, uh, which fairly thoroughly explains why this, you know, is, is not a good idea. The item we're on now is a comprehensive plan, future land use change amendment. We're not talking about the PUD for this item. This is an attempted amendment to go intensive commercial. You know, if we look at the, the current future land use map of this area, it's all urban low intensity. In fact, all four corners, uh, the entire neighborhood to the east towards I-4 uh, until we get to uh, the interchange lands is all low intensity. The nearest commercial future land use zone is over a half a mile to the west, just past where Voorhees Avenue intersects State Road 44 uh, in that uh, westbound stretch of road, which is a particularly unattractive portion of 44 before you get into the land proper. The problem with this amendment is it creates a dangerous precedent for our neighborhood. Who's to say that if this amendment gets approved, the next developer comes in the lot next door to the north, south, east, west, and says, hey, you guys approved this full commercial. We want that too, for whatever our intensive commercial use is, regardless of what their PUD is for their storage facility. On those merits, we're talking about an industrial, an intensive commercial, literally defined by the county's own regulations. This is an industrial land use. We're talking about a 60% impervious surface uh, over three acres of paving on this five acre site. The surrounding land uses are all single family homes on acre, half acre sites. You know, it's a, Lake Winnemesset's one of the most desirable neighborhoods in the county. And, you know, the Lake Winnemesset Civic Association has spent 65 years uh, preserving and, and improving our neighborhood. You know, we're local experts on the area. Um, this, this is in direct contradiction to the character of our neighborhood. Um, it offers no benefit to our neighborhood. You know, this, this is looking to serve all the, the incoming high, high density residential uh, growth going on to the south. Um, and you should not recommend it. Uh, I encourage you to, you know, read the low intensity regulations. Um, you know, it allows some commercial that, you know, by nature uh, does allow, you know, 
something that can uh, more closely sit next to a, a single family residence and, and a, a two story high industrial warehouse is not that. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, Ms. Astrid Depar. She in? Yeah, there she is. S. Depar. I don't recognize her. Good morning, ma'am. Would you like to state your name and address for the record? Yes, sir. My name is Astrid DePerry. I live at 113 Lake Wyndham and Scent Drive in Deland, Florida. Mm -hmm. And I thank you this morning for your time and attention. You've got a long day ahead of you, and I really thank you for your time. Um, I have been a long-term resident of the Lake Wyndham and Scent area. And I, for the record, I oppose the change, uh, the proposed comprehensive plan amendment change to commercial land use. And I oppose uh, the mini warehouse PUD, especially the boat, RV, et cetera, parking. Um, I'm a little confused about that because it, it seems to be a moving target. It's changing as we go along. Um, I heard Mr. Merrill say that, that boats and RVs were not going to be allowed. I, I have a lot more questions about this now than I did before this meeting, so I'll try and get to some of my questions. Staff has suggested that this is fairly debatable, meaning that reasonable people can reasonably disagree, and I think that uh, part of it is that the opinions of the residents do count, that, that we have some opinions that are worthy of note here. Um, he, they have also suggested that you may deny this if you find that it is inconsistent with the character of the neighborhood. Um, they have also suggested that you could specifically deny this, calling it spot planning. <laughs> and I think this is kind of the definition of spot planning. Before this uh, particular event, I had never seen this before where it would be specifically limited by a note on the comprehensive plan, but that is apparently what is suggested. Um, I have a bunch of questions about this project. I'm not at all cons um, understanding the difference between mini warehouse and self-storage facilities. The comprehensive plan amendment talks about a self-storage facility. The PUD talks about mini warehouse. I'm not completely clear on what the difference is. I'm not completely clear where boat, RV, trailer, motorcycle, and light truck storage fits in. I, I don't understand that. The typical mini warehouse does not allow light trucks or, or boats or ivories or such like. I also have some questions about uh, the staff report. The, the maximum permitted residential density. In the land use amendment, it says that the maximum residential density would be 16 single family dwelling units. In the PUD, it says it would be, um, I think it says 21. So th there's a difference here. And I think uh, Mr. Mira commended staff on their incredibly good <laughs> review of this matter. I think this is kind of an important point. What is the maximum residential density? The, um, it also goes on to say uh, that, excuse me, I calculated for what it's worth, I calculated at 4.69 acres that that would be 18.76 dwelling units per acre. Um, one of the recommendations, if you look at the staff report, it seems to suggest that this would benefit our neighborhood because of restrictive homeowners covenants. We don't have restrictive homeowners covenants in the Lake Winnemesset area. This is not a neighborhood convenience for us. This is going to be something to serve development that is not in our neighborhood. It is going to bring people from south of our neighborhood in onto um, State Road 44 for the sole purpose of going to this particular facility. This is not a neighborhood convenience. Um, there is much discussion about. Okay, ma'am. I know. I've allowed I you understand. to go over a minute, so I'm going to have. We're going to have to. I'd ask you to wrap it up if you would, please. Okay. Um, I would ask, uh, what what is the consideration for the property rights of the adjacent property owners? 
there was, uh, it said that they considered the property rights of the, uh, the applicant. I would ask this, this, this board to consider the property rights of the adjacent property owners as well. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Engel? Hmm? Okay. Well, he's got a couple here. Two or three. <laughs> yeah, three of them. Okay. Uh, Miss Lee? Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Name My name is Joan Lee. I live at 424 Lake Winnemucet Drive, uh, where I've resided for over 30 years. I'm also a member of the, I've been a board member for Lake Winnemucet Civic Association for over 25 years. Uh, first, I'd like to comment on uh, something said by Mr. Merrill in regards to the neighborhood meeting. We did not have a neighborhood meeting. Last year, Mr. Merrill met, was invited, well, he met with his friends who he uh, noted live, live on the lake and a few other members of, the, of our neighborhood who were, who were personally invited to that meeting. It was not a neighborhood meeting and was not representative of the uh, majority of the views of the people who live within our community. So I, I just wanted to note that. Um, uh, we've had, um, after 1,800 new homes currently uh, being built within a half, one and a half miles of our neighborhood, uh, extreme gridlock uh, traffic on New York Avenue, Highway 44, uh, Lake Winnemucet Drive increasingly being used as an alternate route to 44 for both tra uh, traffic, uh, through traffic and heavy equipment vehicles, concerns for health and preservation of our lake and no adequate infrastructure to support these already existing problems we are now being faced with the devastating prospect of properties immediately adjoining our residential neighborhood being rezoned for commercial and industrial use. No matter how beautiful you make it, no matter how many details are put into the planning, this facility is not appropriate for our neighborhood. Uh, it presents direct negative impacts to families living along 44 Lake Winnemucet Drive and the neighboring streets south of 44, which back up to this proposed storage facility. Our biggest concern, and again, no matter how nice it is, and certainly a lot of planning has gone into this, is that uh, putting this facility here will most certainly open the door for other properties along 44 to be rezoned and used for commercial purposes as well, which will result in increased traffic, runoff to the lake, possible flooding due to removal of trees, and overall change to the landscape of our existing community, which for these reasons will certainly, uh, will as well, lead to significantly decrease the property value of homes on 44 and adjoining neighborhoods. We would be accepting of property, this property being used for professional and medical offices, but commercial and industrial use should only be allowed west of Kepler, not in our immediate neighborhood. I ask you to consider the um, impact of this facility and vote no for your approval. And I want to say uh, real quickly also that there, for the last month there's been a sign up on this property indicating a future site of storage units for this last month. And I can't help but wonder about what discussion, discussion this applicant may have had prior to this hearing that made him assume that this was a done deal and gave him the confidence to post this sign indicating future site of storage facility prior to approval of this com by this commission. Coincidentally, the sign was taken down yesterday. Thank you for your time. I, I do hope that you'll vote no for this rezoning. Okay, do you hope, ma'am, could you have a question? No, I did want to ask you that because I saw the sign as well, too, but when I came in this morning, the sign wasn't there. You, it was taken down yesterday? Yeah, it was taken down yesterday. Okay, just I'm, as a resident, I wanted to ask. Last month. I, was, I saw it, and then I saw it okay. gone this morning. Ma'am, I have a question of you also. You've got, under the current land use, you could put four houses per acre, which is approximately, probably a little over 16 homes in that, on that property. Is the storage facility a bigger impact than those 16 or so homes, if that were to go? 
All I can say right now, as a representative of our board, we, we were discussing this proposal of this storage facility. Right. And we are opposed to this storage facility being, uh, for this property being rezoned to accommodate the storage facility on that property. If such case were to come up regarding homes, we would need to uh, review, further review that as our uh, a neighborhood and a board. I don't wanna speak for our neighborhood on that uh, behalf because we have not discussed that. We were discussing this actual proposal. Because that was my whole point of even <clears throat> making this small scale comprehensive plan amendment was to tie it to having the PUD tied to it. Well, and I will tell you my personal- I, That was mine. In response to your question, my personal view on it, because I, I mean, I can speak to most uh, to most of the representatives okay. uh, uh, neighbors well, regarding asking. this unit uh, this particular proposal mm -hmm. but regarding uh proposal for homes homes in my opinion would certainly fit more in the neighborhood my bi our biggest concern is that changing the rezoning to commercial and industrial is going to open the door for more commercial and industrial on that road and we do not want that okay okay that was my point okay Okay, um, Ms. Jean Savoy. Good morning, ma'am. If I can get your name and address for the record. I'm Jean Savoy. I live at 332 Lake Winnemesset Drive, and I've lived there for 24 years. Today, the Vanacore Corporation has requested both a land use and a zoning change of your board. I'm here to object to that. While the developer has certainly provided you with numerous arguments for the positive impact of the self-storage facility, there are many that <clears throat> this project would be detrimental to the existing residential community. There are single family homes on three sides of the property in question, and every homeowner will be negatively impacted by the influence of commercial designation. The property values of the homes on 44, Lake Winnemesset Drive, and surrounding streets will immediately be impacted in a negative manner. I've spoken with one realtor who's indicated that a drop of 15% of our home values was certainly possible. If Vanacore is permitted to change the land use and zoning to commercial, what would prevent others from coming in and putting in multi-level office buildings, an auto parts store, or perhaps another Aspen Dental? Why are the needs of this developer being prioritized over the rights of the 80 plus families that live in this community? A large storage facility was recently completed on, on 92 with more than 70,000 square feet of storage space, coupled with three self-storage units on 15A and one other on South Woodland Boulevard. How many storage facilities does DeLand need? Will storage facilities become the new mattress stores or perhaps the new Dollar General. There are a number of residential options that would certainly be more desirable. Two immediately come to mind. How about affordable garden homes for first time buyers or multi-generational families? We have an affordable housing crisis. We do not have a storage unit crisis. Or perhaps Volusia County could get its first tiny home community nestled among the trees that are already on that property. This would be cutting edge and an innovative way to improve Volusia County. If neither of these options are viable, as a retired psychotherapist, I can attest to the fact that the community would benefit from a comprehensive psychological service center with social workers, psychologists, and a psychiatrist to help the existing residents deal with the anxiety and depression of runaway growth. <laughs> Commercial property does not belong on this particular site. 
and I urge you to vote no on both the land use and the PUD. Thank you for your time. We thank you for yours. Any thank questions you. for the speaker? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Miss Nancy Rivera. Rivera. Good morning. Good morning. Could I get your name and address for the record? Please? Nancy La Riviere. I live at 2215 East New York, um, the land. I object to the land use change. I object to another commercial facility to the east of Kepler Road um, years ago when we have been objecting to various developments around Lake Guinnemesset, uh, our civic association has always said that we were very concerned and objected to any commercial development east of Kepler Road. Do whatever you want to the west of Kepler Road. Um, something like this would change the nature of our neighborhood. Of our neighborhood. Um, so months ago, Mr. Vanacourt and his team made an elegant pitch to a few neighbors but all except for one neighbor who was a close friend of Mr. Vanacourt came away objecting to this, um, this commercial endeavor. Um, I said at the time, and I think it now, famous last words are, this will not result in a domino effect of, of more development to the east of, the, uh, uh, of Kepler and to the animal hospital. So staff did not like proposing to allow self-storage in, in the ULI. It sets a precedent. Those were the words from Rob Merrill. Uh, and I also want to mention that, that there has been sort of a veiled threat made to my son, John Engel, from this group. Um, Mr. Vanacourt called him at his workplace yesterday to see if he could do something to change his mind. Um, and the, I don't know if it was Mr. Merrill that called the a bank that would bankroll this project called my son's boss at Cooksey Associates and, and made a veiled threat that they would take their business away if Johnny participated in the objection to this project. And I really object to that kind of behavior. That's underhanded and it's unfair. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? Okay, that pretty wraps it up for any public participation. Do we have anyone else that would like to speak to this case? All right. Just, could I get you to come back forward and address the issues that come forward? The famous last words of a lawyer, I'll be brief. And I, I really will. I, I'm going to have to start with the last comment because I, my name was mentioned in what sounded like was a derogatory way. I didn't call anybody about anything yesterday. Uh, we did actually have, um, when we talked about the neighborhood meetings, we did have a, um, a neighborhood meeting that was organized by friends of mine on the lake, like I mentioned, and I asked them to invite anybody they thought might be uh, interested, including, I think, some members of the, uh, of the association. I guess there's a, I don't even know the nature of the association, because apparently there isn't a, a, a formal one, um, but John uh, Engel, who was the first speaker, I think, actually was at the meeting. I think we had a pretty good conversation. And I think a handful of the things that he mentioned are the things that, that, um, that we changed, that I explained to you guys. I don't know anything about a banker or somebody threatening anybody. No idea. Um, so putting that aside, because that was kind of strange, um, I, I appreciate everything other than that last comment that everybody said. I mean, I, 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 I take notes and try to understand and appreciate everything that they say. And those are all things I think that have been said. So I'll, I'll say a couple of things in response, but most of them were things that I've already said. So first of all, the boat and RV parking, I have to apologize in advance for the, for the confusion about it re being removed. It wasn't in the, P, in the comp plan piece, so the reason why staff didn't say anything about it was because it's on the next agenda item. We absolutely unequivocally are not going to have outdoor boat and RV parking in this particular PD. It's being removed if it hasn't already been, whether it was inadvertently left in the original request, um, that's because we decided not to do it because the neighbors don't like it. If you guys think it's a good idea and the neighbors can come to terms with it, it's still good for us. I mean, that's, that's the no, normal way that we do self-storage, um, but we, we have absolutely agreed to remove it. 
Um, one of the one of the speakers, I think it was um, Ms. Lee, suggested that we do office development. Now, in my experience with transitional areas between residential and, and heavier commercial, that's a good transition. It truly is. And and Scott has done office development, a bunch of it. And the problem that we had, and the reason why it's not his vision is because offices are about the worst thing in terms of traffic impact. People come and go at peak times. They come to work and then they leave work at the exact same times that State Road 44 is gridlocked. So in all fairness, I think it may be to her seemed like an, a better idea, but I think it's a bad idea. And I think that we, we think it would make this place worse. The, um, the, the future storage sign, uh, we've got a, I mean, on Scott's behalf, a mea culpa on that one. Um, he put the sign up. We heard earlier this week from one of the neighbors um, that that was you know, distasteful or, or offensive, took it down. So that's why it came down. The reason why it came down was because they asked us to take it down. I think Scott was testing the market. I think, um, and I, I'm speaking for you, Scott, but I, I think that there was some I guess idea from somewhere that somebody else might be trying to do self storage in this neighborhood. And so he was trying to kind of competitively get out ahead of that. So again, apologized, uh, mea culpa. And that's the answer to the sign question. That's really all I had that was, that was new to the conversation. So I'll stop right there. And if you guys have any additional questions for us, we've got our whole team here to, to answer. Mr. Do, Costa. do we have any more par participation or are we done with participation public wise other than these guys. Uh, the public participation is over. I was given a chance to rebuttal. That, that was it for me. That was it. All right. So questions. So let's go back to my original question. So impacts. Impacts on the neighborhood, impacts on the road. You said you did traffic studies. Can you share with those numbers? And I don't need a, I know Lassiter is really good at yeah. having detailed, detailed reports. I just need a brief on comparison between what's currently allowed, which is residential and or office versus what you're proposing. And, and Frank, I apologize. I got to pack back up for just one second. In, in, in sort of in, in line with what you're asking, um, Astrid had raised some questions about the residential density, and I was confused about it too. I actually had to have the brains in the operation over here explain it to me. The reason why there's a differentiation, I think, in the zoning report versus the comp plan is the, the comp plan was a straight unit per acre and we you know it's pretty easy it's math you know this is the number of acres this is the number of, and then the the zoning entitlements have to do with lot sizes so what we did was i think what staff did to come up with 20 or instead of 18 it was 20 or 21 was figure out how many of those lot sizes you could put on that piece of property so if you guys just want to call it 18 or 16 whatever you want it still is the basis on which she did her comparison so we went with the lowest number but at the end of the day it's still a bunch more than I think people would want there. So, Crystal Mercedes, please answer Frank's question. Crystal Mercedes, 1450 West Granada, LTD Traffic Engineering. And I'm sorry, what was your question specifically again? Just explain yeah. your, your analysis, the free post. Okay. So, what we did was look at what the, is allowed under existing conditions as compared to what is being proposed. And we base our calculations on a national document, the ITE, sorry, ITE Trip Generation Manual. And what we came up with is under the existing ULI designation, you could have about, hold on, I wrote it down, uh, 4,500 daily trips for, versus what's being proposed, that's about 132 daily trips. Can you repeat that number, the first one? 4,500 4, under ULI. Now, if we look at the zoning, the existing zoning allows single family dwelling units. We got 16 <clears throat> and that would generate about 180 daily trips as opposed to, again, 130 for this development. So in either case, this development represents a decrease in the potential maximum traffic. Can I, can I help with one second? Sure. So Frank, one reason why she had that high number at the yeah. land use piece <laughs> is you. because the, the ULI allows commercial. So you could put a convenience store there. And well, there is uh, one there that's in the ULI. And that's why, I was, that's why I'm asking the question. I mean, it's not, we're not just talking residential potentially there. It's, it's the combination of neighborhood convenience, office space, which, right. and knowing different areas Definitely, you're going to add additional traffic to that right. corridor. So the pre-posts that she looked at were pre-post land use, pre-post zoning, both of which are an increase. One of them was a crazy increase, mm -hmm. uh, but the second one is still a pretty significant increase from mm -hmm. one to the other. Is that 
That answers my question regarding traffic. I have another one for you, though, after yeah. that. So. Thanks, Crystal. So the issue was also brought up about the industrial component of this because there's a comp plan, and, that, and it's, I think it's a terminology that the county uses, and, and it's the umbrella that we're under, that um, storage facilities fall under industrial. You're not building boats on this site, are you? No. Are you grinding aluminum, welding, anything along that, that nature that's industrial per se? No, nothing. So, so the best way to answer that very accurately is if you look at the PD agreement, it shows what we can do and everything else that you just mentioned, we can't do. So zoning by its nature legally is inclusive. You either have it listed there or you can't do it. And we've agreed, correct me if I'm wrong, to tie these two together. So if the PUD fails, this goes away as well. Well, even beyond that, I think what Ronnie was saying is any PUD, anybody who does this land use amendment has to do a PUD. That's why we're here. But if the PUD fails, somebody's got to come in with another PUD. And here's the key. PUD is a negotiated zoning. So you guys get to see every piece of it and understand every component, including the answer to the questions that you just raised. Okay. That's all I got. Any other questions, Mr. Fellow? But for clarification, PUD is that way, but once this comprehensive plan amendment is, is done, this is a commercial piece of property. It would be, it would have a commercial designation with a limitation on 89,000 square feet. It, it, exactly. It, it, Mr. Fellow, I mean, the, the key is with a limitation that says self storage only, period. With this PUD? With the, no, negative. negative. With this land use. Yes. So it's confusing. And I'll, I'll say I'm super used to it because we do it in a lot of other jurisdictions. In other words, you do a comp plan amendment, and that's like the Bible. It can be read a lot of ways, you know, um, and it's usually very broad. So the land use usually has six or eight or ten zoning classifications and, and sets of uses that could be done within that very broad category. In a lot of cases recently in the county, um, they've started to adopt uh, a methodology that I've used in lots of jurisdictions, which is if somebody really doesn't want all that stuff, can they limit themselves? The answer is of course. And the way you do it is with a textual policy that applies to this piece of property. <clears throat> That's what's happening here. So in addition, because the chair had a great recommendation, which is not only are we saying that it's only this use, the only way you can do that use is if you process a PD. Right. And, and when you do that, you go through this. So, this this so, yeah. ordeal we're going right. through. For all intents and purposes, when we're done, <clears throat> m minusing out whether it's a CPA or a PUD, we're either approving a storage unit on this facility or not. Is that a correct? Correct. Yes, that is the only I use that, that is yeah. allowed on this property. That they can't do any other use. And only through Thank the PD you. process. Of course, of course. But yeah. But Which is general, important, I think. Uh, absolutely. Okay, any other questions? All right, sir. Thank you. We're going to close the floor for public participation and open up for, for commission discussion on the CPA 22011. Okay. Um, you have, go ahead. I can understand the neighborhood not wanting a commercial designation there, but what I'm looking at is the impact overall if we, under the ULI designation. And I guess um, my question would be legal or Trish is, if it remained under the ULI would, and it were to be developed, would they have to come in with a PUD or could they just apply for permitting? It's currently zoned residential, so they would have to rezone to something that would allow that neighborhood convenience uses or um, I think medical or office uses. Um, I don't know how the um, animal hospital came about. What's the zoning on that? Is that PUD? Yes. So yeah. So it'd be something similar under a PUD. Right. So then, if 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 the homes were to be developed in there, though, they would because it's little zone residential, they could go in and actually develop those sixteen homes that we're talking about. Yes. Yes. Okay. And the reason I'm I'm bringing that what I, the whole thing I'm bringing this around to is, I understand the congestion there. That's been a critical intersection for years and it's designated as a critical intersection. And I've seen the traffic backed up all the way around the lake. Uh, so regardless, so as far as the comprehensive plan amendment, what if there would be a differentiation between the impact of traffic 
compared to the, under the current use, under the current designation. And um, even if you were to take it, we got 180 for the homes compared to 130 for the um, storage facility. Now the, the second question I have is, is aesthetically, how does this fit in with the neighborhood? And um, you know, that's a question that I'm gonna let the board try to enlighten me on is what they think, how it would be. Um, I was on this panel when we approved the animal hospital mm -hmm. and I had the misfortune, personal misfortune of having to use the animal hospital to take my, my dog there on Friday. Um, I think it's a, the facility looks phenomenal. Uh, now you look across the opposite corner and you have an older, um, was that Circle K, I believe it is, that um, doesn't look so hot. And then you look at the, uh, I believe the, uh, north, the southwest corner, which is the 7-Eleven. And again, set further back, bigger buffer. Um, if you blink, you miss the 7-Eleven. You, you miss the entrance. So looking at the renderings that they put, I, I don't think that aesthetically you're going to notice it's even there. This is not your, your, your typical, and, I, and I've seen some of Scott's other buildings. They don't look anything like this. They're actually more traditional storage facades, you know, building, box, doors. This is more in line with that, honestly, if I, if I drove by it, I wouldn't know. I, I think it was an apartment complex or something, not a storage facility. So from a, how would it blend in with the neighborhood? I think it would blend in well. I, I think the, the, the question that comes up that we, and we have to keep in mind that we can only take these cases on a case by case basis, the so-called domino effect. We don't have that crystal ball. We don't know what's coming. Um, personally, if I were a, so inclined and, and this was going in, I would consider putting multifamily right next to it, knowing the opposition and, and because of the multifamily environment that's required. I think that, but this is a less community impact project than any kind of residential. That's my opinion. What I don't, and I'm assuming this is all sewer and city water. This is not on septics, correct? That's correct, city of Deland. So the, again, the impact there is, he said, what he said, two toilets, two sinks for the whole facility versus, mm -hmm. you know, three twos, you're looking at uh, multiple sinks, toilets, showers, and you know, so on. There's more draw on the, the uh, assets or the, re the resources, I say, of the community. Um, I, I think they're, put, they're putting together a good plan. I think they've done their homework. Um, I don't know that um, how they're, community meetings could have gone any better or if they would have helped or hurt the situation, but it sounds like they did make some changes based on the few meetings that they did have. Um, I think they're trying to be a good neighbor here and I, now it's, it's up to us on how we go, where we go from here. So. Mr. Feller. Um, since we could be here till six o'clock talking about this, I'm going to try and be brief. Um, I agree with, with everything my cohorts say up here about some of the things that we're talking about. Um, I think traffic is one piece of many pieces. It's one puzzle piece that we get focused on very much. And it sounds to me from some of the feedback that I heard from residents that they would be open to 18 houses because that's 18 families versus a storage facility or something to that effect. I don't wanna put words in their mouth, but I'm just, it seems like that, you know, as we're talking about this changing, I was also very clear when I had some discussions about this with residents that I am not against turning residential land into commercial. I live in a very rural area and it's nice to have some of these things close by. My question comes to a point that I think was made, which is this is not going to help this specific neighborhood. It's going to be for the Victoria Gardens and Victoria Trails that they're building in the Southwest Activity Center that is gonna flow into this because of the overdevelopment. They're building two small of houses and then they've got to store all this crap somewhere, pardon my French. And I, I'm not trying to be rude on them because I'm a real estate agent and I think that income producing properties are a huge thing. I'm a big, I'm, so I, I like it and I, I'm against, from my standpoint, it's going to be bringing a lot of people into a neighborhood, not supporting a neighborhood that's there. 
And when I think of turning this into commercial, I would think of turning it into commercial to support the neighborhood that's there. That's where I could be supportive of it. I can't really be supportive of this because I don't believe that it's gonna support that community. There's plenty of other areas, and I, I think, like you said, I mean, there's, there's business aspects to this, and I get it, and you wanna be the first in this area and close by and all of those things. But when it comes down to it, you have a very big residential community there that, um, and again, you know, speaking about just making commercial, um, that are not necessarily against commercial, they're against this type of, of a development. So as we look at this, I would be more inclined to look at this without it being tied to a storage unit because I think a medical facility or some other thing. Uh, the other thing I'm gonna say about this is somebody mentioned jobs, and I'm gonna definitely disrespectfully agree with this. I, I, I own a staging company and I've used storage units everywhere. The person at the desk is there and it's the same person five days a week and then there's nobody else. This does not create a swath of jobs like a small retail facility would. You know, my first job was at a Blockbuster video, you know, and back then they were really small and you, that's not what this is. So I, I will definitely respectfully disagree with that this is gonna be a job producer. It might be an income producer for the county and revenues, but, and then the final thing I'm gonna say, because I've probably got too many things here, is I drove through this area of DeLand a lot after the storm and I don't think we fully have a grasp on what development does with storm runoff and all of those things. And I know that we can speak about traffic results and, and, and somebody can say this, but the real world scenario is you couldn't drive down Taylor Road, you couldn't drive down Blue Lake, you couldn't drive down some of these roads. And when I think of five acres being completely or 70% paved or something like that, I wonder where it's gonna go. And I look at these other vacant residential parcels and I know that their time will come at some point. So I say this with, with all, I, I am very much for bringing commercial into a residential area. I think it needs it. I'd like 415 to take uh, some, re but I don't know that this is the one for me. Yeah. Any other comments? I would say this place would have the least amount of impact in anything I could think they go on there. I've got two storage facilities, probably less than half a mile from me. I hardly ever see anybody going in there whatsoever. Occasionally you have U-Haul trucks go in, but not very often. There's very little traffic whatsoever. If you put 16 homes in there, the impact of just that to even to our water system, I think, is something we need to, need to look at. And if they did have that a development there, they've got to have egress, you know, coming in and out and stuff. Um, who's to say the animal clinic will let them use that access like they do with this one? Therefore, you got people coming in and out in 44 on top of that. So I think this would be the least amount of impact to the area myself. In the spirit of discussion, because I want to keep going on, because I, I value every, your opinion as well too. In my looking at this, I'm sitting here saying, well, it may not be 18 how by the time you figure out your footprint and all of that stuff and where it can come and where it can go. I, I totally get that. What I worry about is that we're trying to solve a problem with a different problem. So we're trying to solve a traffic problem by adding a different problem. And that's just the way I, I foresee this. And you know, traffic is one big concern. I get that and ingress and egress and all of that stuff. But so is flooding and so is, you know, uh, impact to, to other things. I, I think that traffic is obviously important because we all deal with it driving in. Uh, I got here nice and early this morning because it was a very easy breezy drive all the way through. Um, but I do, I, I do look at this and I say it from the same exact standpoint that uh, I still feel like we're solving a traffic problem by adding a different problem. And that's just my take. Well, maybe traffic would be the best one for this, but isn't there a 44 extension still on the books to go through and bypass this whole area? Oh, I, I'm not sure about that. I know that the... I know it was, it was on the books to do an extension straight through to uh, Kepler Road. I know that they're currently the county is working with the state on a, um, I think, a roundabout on Kepler and 44, which should hopefully kind of alleviate that the uh, stoppage situation in there. Go ahead, Mr. Young. I've been quiet. I go, <laughs> but in this case, I got to start at and so um, I go by that about once 
twice a week to that location. But my problem with it right now is that I, I like to solve problems, but I also like to see it contribute. And I have to say that this project doesn't contribute to the neighborhood itself. I can see that this project is bringing in traffic. And uh, I know that we're talking about uh, traffic count. But again, we may not put 18 houses in that piece of property. And second thing is, is that it's bringing in outsiders because apparently these people don't need storage, the people living in there currently. So I'm kind of in the point that I have to agree that it's not helping the neighborhood. And that's, that's what's holding me back on the project is it, I'll change the zoning or whatever, or the comp plan if it can, Tributes to the neighborhood, and I don't. I haven't been proved. It hasn't proved to me this is contributing to that neighborhood. That's where I stand, unless somebody can change my mind. Something I want to add here: we're talking about the Lake Winnemucet neighborhood. Where does Lake Winnemucet neighborhood actually end? How far is we going to take it? How far are you going to take it out? This is not Lake Winnemucet. Well, it it is. I mean, it, it, well, it you, is. You could, you could say Sam Eleventh Lake one was that too. Then, can I? If you ended. Well, that. the the problem, the thing about the intersection there, the development on the intersection, because it was a main thoroughfare intersection, we turned down a racetrack right there. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, but a racetrack is a and lot then, of traffic. Yeah. Then we got support for the the the, the development of the Circle K. So. It was kind of like, okay, we helped you out here, and then we got stabbed the other way. But here, can I add to that really quickly? What did? How did that come about? That sort that I heard it was like a twenty-year, like you couldn't stop the Seven Eleven or something. Is that that Seven Eleven? You'd have to let staff actually. I really don't know what happened there. But yeah, I don't know. But the the point is, is and I understand. I'm on the fence. I'll be honest with you, because in one point, I want to support the neighborhood. And does it does this development actually for that neighborhood? And I don't know. Well, there's only one way to find out. There we go. The one thing I also would like to add, Chair, really quickly is um, the other day, and I promise I didn't do it on purpose, but I was coming to the land, and I did the Lake Winnemucet pass by so that I could avoid the traffic just to see. And I'm telling you what, it was miserable. I watched somebody almost run over a dog. I, I mean, it was it was crazy how much that did. And again, that's why I asked about the big trucks, because usually, I mean, I live right by a storage unit as well, too. And there's U-Hauls all on line out there to, to get in through the gate. So um, I think the community has a lot of should have a lot of input on this. Well, I'm going to cast my vote to support the community. Will you entertain a motion? Yes, sir. All right. I'd like to make a motion that we forward the application case number CPA-22-011 to the County Council with a recommendation of approval. Uh, Mr. Chair, there's some, uh, some amendments to the notation. Um, as, as discussed, if you so should, so it would be with a limitation that states that the development shall be limited to 89,000 square feet of mini warehouse um, approved by PUD, which was this discussion. And we're going to add that to the motion, please. Mm -hmm. Second. Okay, I've got a motion to forward the CPA 22-011 to County Council with a recommendation of approval with the designated limitations of the PUD of the storage unit. Uh, from Mr. Costa and a second from Mr. Sixma. Any discussion on the motion? Just the comp, Just the comp plan. plan. That's the change to a commercial designation. Mm -hmm. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. aye. No. Mr. Chair, I think you need to do a roll vote, yeah. a roll call. Member Feller? Uh, no. Member Young? No. Member Shelley? Yes. Member Bender? No. Member Costa? Yes. Member Sixma? Yes. Chair Mills? No. 
So the motion fails to yes. carry. So um, by the, four to three votes. Yes. So the chair has the option of asking for another motion with revised conditions, or if no motion um, to approve or to deny is taken, then it kind of fails for lack of a majority vote. Um, and then it will go to county count, county council with that technical denial if there's no further motions. Okay. When you say a technical denial, you don't have specific findings of fine, so it would just be a failure to obtain a majority vote. Mm -hmm. um, so I any, don't know what could change. It, I, to be honest with you, because well, then I would actually make a motion to. I mean, I, when you say that, it's going to go to county council anyways. Correct? Yes. So you can make a motion you can to make recommend a motion to send it to county council with a recommendation of denial. Yes. I'd like to make that motion. I'll second that. Okay, I've got a motion to recommendation of a denial for CPA 22011 from Mr. Feller and a second for Mr. Young uh, with a recommendation of denial. Any discussion on the motion? So now I have a discussion. Yes. So what you're saying is you don't want to approve any commercial here at all. By putting this in a denial, you're saying, I don't want to approve commercial here at all. So can they come back and say something different? I don't want to approve a mini storage unit here, and I was under the impression that we were either approving a mini storage or we were not approving a mini storage. Well, that's the discussion of whether or not you want to yep. change some of the, the no, change the notation, amend, or amend some of the conditions of the compensation. I'd be plan. happy to hear another plan if it came in front of the PLDRC at some point, but at this point, I am not, I am not putting any limitations of the 8,900 square feet or nothing. I'm just recommending this. For the only uh, issue is that you don't have, the analysis was done on the assumption that you have 89 of 89,000 square feet. So you don't have the full traffic impact of what an unrestrained commercial land use looks like. I guess what I'm saying is I'm looking at a case that's before me and they've thrown out numbers of traffic stats of 2,400 trips and then, but yet 16 houses only does 180 and a storage unit does 130. I mean, if we want to have more discussion, I'd be happy to have more discussion, but I was under the impression, I, again, like I said, I'm not against commercial land, residential being changed to commercial, I'm against this particular project. So that's why I'm sending it to County Council with a recommendation. I'm I'll, I'll, I'll verify my, by, say, by my second in saying that I'm not against commercial either. I think that any commercial in a residential area should support the residential area. That's where I stand. Let me ask you this, and what, I mean, this is the least impact of any commercial that you could put on there. If you put office or something like that, it's going to have a lot more trips and a lot more bathrooms and whatnot. So... What do you suppose they were putting there? I, I'm not looking at the impact, just just at, this, just at the impact. I'm looking at what it helps the community itself as well. I mean, uh, well, yes, impact has a bearing on my thought process, but I think that any commercial should support the community, well, that community. And that's where I'm having a problem with it, is this, it looks like this community, at least from everything I see, doesn't need the storage, the least the community that's existing now. What about that's all the I'm housing at. developments right beside it, basically, on Kepler? Mm -hmm. I think those are separate issues to me, Stoney. I'm sorry to say. But those they're, and, and actually, they're closer than most uh, of the I, other I, are. Again, I'm not, I'm not arguing the validity of that or not. I mean, I mean, we're going to have, she have talks about this area even more. I do not disagree with you on that. I, I disagree with this. And again, when I look at it, trips, whatever else, uh, is there, I mean, I'll ask it, is there anybody here that was speaking for it that was not part of the planning team or owning this land? I don't see a single hand go up. I don't see anybody out here supporting this from the community. And I think that our job here is to listen to both of those things and then bring it forward. And, and, and I say that because when it goes to county council, they'll have their own deal to deal with. But I don't, I'd like it to go to county council with either a recommendation of approval or denial from this group, not just a, we couldn't come up with it, so you come up with it politically. I, 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 I do think I, I come up, and if it fails, it fails, but I, I stand by my motion. So and let me get you right here. So we have other cases along the year that come up with major opposition because they're neighborhood and they're a good project, would you still vote against them? I'm just saying, have an open mind. Well, if there's a major opposition from the community, we're here to represent the community. 
I, I agree, and, yeah. and, I, and I would look at the project, and like I said, I, I feel like I am not against the commercial use here. That's, I think, the, the, what I'm saying. I'm against this particular use. I don't think that this is the one. That's my opinion, Stoney, and that's, mm. that's no, my group. So. You're, you're free to have that. Uh, yeah. If I throw my two cents in on that, if somebody come up with a project in a community that is commercial and it had a bigger impact, yeah, it had a pile of office or health space, but if it was in a small community like, like out at the villages, they have a lot of doctor's offices, they're high impact, but they're senior citizens and they needed it and they wanted it. This isn't wanted because it isn't, they don't feel it's needed. That's my concern is it needs to support the community itself. If, if you have businesses in there that these people all need, then I would support it even if it was a higher density of commercial. That's my heart feeling. I'm for the community. It's the supporting of the community itself. Okay, we're gonna. Yeah. Th that, yeah, that's called cool, vote. Never was wrong. Yeah. Okay. We've got a motion to deny CPA 22011 for the recommendation of a denial forwarded to the County Council from Mr. Feller and a second from Mr. Young. And we've had the discussion on it. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. No. Motion carries four to three. So does that mean the next item is now off the docket as well? Uh, uh, no, you still have to vote on that one. The PG. Um, it's just that your kind of vote is kind of constrained because you recommended denial of the comprehensive plan. Um, you must recommend denial for the PUD because it's inconsistent with what you did on the prior action. Now there's some things in the, in the PUD clarification that we want to make on the record. Um, if county council approves, there's a, a statement about RV boat storage that we would like removed from, mm -hmm. the, from the PUD. Um, and I think that's the only clarification. Uh, but we just need to make sure that we are affording the applicant and all the members proper due process to look at the details of the PUD and not just. So the county council will have the final say on this comp plan change. Yes, on the comp plan change and on the plan unit development. Yes, um, because even though we've changed the vote, we're still undecisive. All right, got it. But again, on the planned unit development, it's more than just no RV storage. It's no boat. It's no. There's a, a broader perspective. Okay. The only thing that is that is allowed is 89,000 square feet of mini warehouse, um, and there's some details in the PUD, such as the buffering. Um, access, how it kind of looks like. Those are, those are more of the details that you're going on the zoning level. Right, and same with no retail and things like that. That's still in the PUD. PUD. Yes, all of those okay. restrictions are in the PUD, but we just need to make sure that, you know, we have all of these statements and presentations in the record. If you'd allow Trish to make a presentation. Rob, I don't know if you have any additional information. Um, can Again, I Rob Merrill, Paul, if all I'm going to say is it sounded like you said at the beginning you have to do something here on this one. I, do, I think that the, the board still has the discretion to make the same recommendation that they want to on this one, regardless of what happened on the previous one. Um, so in other words, if you have a voting member who said yes or said no previously, they can still be consistent with their sentiments, I think, on this one, legally. I, I, I don't it's, think it's foreclosed as a result of what just happened a minute ago. In other words, the, the affirmative members that voted on the comp plan can still say, I feel the same way on the zoning. It can't be. Because it's not consistent then. Mm -hmm. It my, my, would be consistent with yeah, what, well, basically there, well, what he's saying is there that are some, it, yes, there are some things the council in. and the council sees it differently because, you know, I, I just want to make it clear. I'm very, I like to be consistent. I turned down the racetrack, not because I didn't want me personally want it there, or what I turned it down based upon was the community itself. So if the council feels that the community, the, 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 the need outweighs the community the desire, then they could go ahead and if they foresee to pass it, we still need to look at the PUD that would go along with it. You should look at the, at the details on the PUD and make a recommendation on those. I just don't want to have a situation where you have four, three on one, and then it's flipped on the other, um, especially if it's a denial of the comp plan and an approval of the PUD. Um, because fundament, your fundamental question is, should you change the land use with the limitation? Uh, but the, the PUD, you can you know, discuss it um, 
and ultimately we'll 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 figure it out when it gets to council. And again, this is a recommendation to council yes. by this board, yes. not the end of this right. not the end it's of this road. So this is a recommendation of this board. So, Mr. Chair, I've done hundreds of them, so I understand what he just said. Yes. Um, you guys had the discretion to do what you want with this vote. Right. I'm not going to say anything else because we talked about the PD. I think everybody did. Yeah. Part and parcel. If anybody else wants to come up and talk, I'd like to have the opportunity to respond, though. Sure. I don't have any public participation forms on the PUD. So, um, is there, what did we change on the PUD previously? Was the, no the storage. storage? No retail, no outside. No Got it. Outside storage. And that's it, that's noted in the PUD? The changes? Um, we'll need to read this item into the record and then we can talk about the PUD. Okay. Ms. Ms. Shelley, could I get the. Yes, sir. Case number PUD-22-147, rezoning from the urban single-family residential R3 zoning classification to the planned unit development zoning classification with a business subclassification B PUD. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. Ms. Smith? Okay. The applicant requests a rezoning from urban single-family residential to planned unit development with the business subclassification. The proposed plan includes four mini warehouse buildings, landscaping, parking, and stormwater retention. DOT is proposing future improvements to State Road 44, and the applicant is proposing as part of his project to set the project back at least 72 feet from the highway to accommodate those improvements. They're proposing to dedicate right-of-way ranging from 37 to 45 feet um, in, along the northern property line. There will be a permit or landscape buffer on the north side of at least 35 feet or more, depending on how much right of way the DOT needs. The city of Deland did comment on this project and they requested a 40 foot landscape buffer on the north side, uh, cause that is their emerging gateway standard. The applicant uh, did try to work with us and shift the improvements as far to the south as possible to accommodate that request. And they agreed that if any portion of the right-of-way dedication is not used, they'll provide the additional five feet of landscaping on the north side. So we'll have perimeter landscape buffers on the east, west, and south sides of the project as well. They'll be 10 feet adjacent to the commercial uses and 25 feet adjacent to the residential uses. The development agreement limits the commercial use to mini warehouse. Any other commercial uses would require a new comp plan amendment and a major amendment to the development agreement. Regarding aesthetics, they are subject to the county's non-residential design standards, as well as our thoroughfare road standards, and those include landscaping and parking and, and building design. Um, we agree with the applicant that a mini warehouse will be a decrease in trips, and Mr. Merrill was correct earlier. When we calculated the number, it was just a straight zoning number that we used. So just to clarify, the with the the land use, the current R3 zoning classification would generate approximately 180 trips per day or 18 peak hour trips. The proposed mini warehouse will generate 132 trips per day with 13 p.m. peak hour trips, so it is less. Without any land use restriction, commercial uses could generate up to 6,575 daily trips with 639 p.m. peak hour trips. It's our understanding that the applicant held a community meeting earlier this week, and based on that meeting, we are requesting to strike the second listed permitted use from the development agreement. The first sentence on page 14 of 41, we would like to delete automobile, boat, recreational vehicle, trailer, motorcycle, and light truck storage from the permitted uses. There will be no outside storage allowed. And that is covered under prohibited uses, anything that is not listed as a permitted use. So um, we ask the PL Dergacy to forward the application to County Council with a recommendation of approval. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Any questions for staff? Okay, the applicant has already stated this uh, presentation for the PUD. Would you like to add anything to it? Okay. Uh, and there isn't, we don't have any public participation forms on the PUD. So we'll move right into closing for public participation and open up for commission discussion or motion. And I will say that on the PUD, in the event the council feels that the commercial land use designation should be approved, then I am in support of the PUD. Uh, 
I don't have any more discussion, but I'm, since I made the motion, I'm prepared to make the second motion. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Feller. Make the motion that in case PUD 22-147, we forward the rezoning application to County Council with a recommendation of denial, subject uh, even with the inclusion of the, making sure that it's properly documented so that they can make a decision properly. I'll go ahead and second it again. Okay, I got a motion uh, to forward the PUD 22147 to the County Council with a recommendation of a denial from Mr. Feller. And then I also have a uh, second from Mr. Young. Any discussion on the motion? Nope. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any aye. Any opposed? No. no. I'm going to roll call that. Let's do a roll yeah, call. That's, I think the votes changed. Can you um, do a roll call? Member Feller? Aye. Member Young? Aye. Member Shelley? No. Member Bender? No. Member Costa? No. Member Sixma? No. Chair Mills? No. So can we make a different motion then? You can. All right. All right. Let me make a motion that um, we forward case number PUD-22-147 to the County Council with the recommendation of approval with the staff changes that have been made. Second. That was stated previously by staff? Yes. Okay. That was second? Second. Over here. I don't but before okay. we do a discussion on this really quickly. Yeah, we will do that. Yep. I've got a motion from uh, Mr. <coughs> Costa to forward the PUD 22-147 to the County Council with a recommendation of approval with the staff uh, amendments to the PUD that was previously stated and a second from Mr. Sixma. Um, any discussion on the motion? Yes, Mr. Feller. I, I, I would like a clarification. Sure. So, so my, yeah, my understanding me, of what the what if if this vote goes through, this is my understanding of what the will of this board is. You do, as a whole, the board is not recommending a change in the land use to commercial with the notation and limitation. However, if county council ultimately decides that that is appropriate, the board is recommending um, that the PUD be approved. Um, in terms of the the zoning characteristics and so that's kind of <laughs> what the action is like you don't you, you don't like as a whole the change in the land use but if the council does change it then the PUD that conforms with that land use is okay with the with the board so we're approving the put putting this project on if the council mm -hmm. yes essentially you're it's a recommendation of the PUD if the land use is, is approved by council. The only thing I'll say about that is I, <laughs> we're sending a message saying we don't want this, but if you decide to do it, then this is fine. And it's gonna go to a, a board that's here. I don't understand why we couldn't, you know, see what they vote on this. I, I just think it's, a, it's, it's kind of a tainted thing at that point. They're gonna see it and say, okay, well, they don't want it, but they appeased people and, and then they said, that's fine if you're gonna to decide to do it, do it. So um, I, I think that's a kind of a silly thing, but that's, I mean, well, we're each entitled to our right. Well, well there's, there's remember there's two different standards for your comprehensive plan, that's your widest discretion. Um, for your PUD, that is quasi-judicial, so it's whether or not it meets the criteria. Um, the one criteria it fails is it's not consistent with the comprehensive plan. So your recommendation of approval is you know, but for right. your comprehensive plan recommendation of denial, you would have approved the PUD. But, but again, if this were just a PUD in front of us and we had a number of members of the public saying, we don't want this development, well, even if it's allowed. Well, at, at that point, I would chime in and say, your job is not to hold a plebiscite, even regardless of the number of people who speak against something or even for something. Um, you are looking at the criteria of the comprehensive plan and whether or not it meets all those characteristics. It's not. But it is a quasi-judicial yes, hearing, right? Which means so that I can take competent substantial evidence yes, that but, may not be yes, their but, hearing. But, but the mere amount of people who speak for no, or against that thing is not competent no, no, substantial No, not necessarily. Evidence. But, I mean, 
in 35 or 40 minutes of information, I might be able to gather something that yes. I could use to make a competent, substantial decision. Correct? Yes. yes. Okay. So what you're saying is that if this meets all the criteria, and it's even though I don't feel it's good in the in that neighborhood. If it meets all the criteria, then technically I should vote for it. One of the criteria is compatibility, and that's that's the the you know. Okay, that's where I'm at. Okay, then I can vote against it if based on compatibility. Yes. So even on, even you. at the zoning level, even if this allowed personal property mini warehouse. I just want to clarify my stand because uh, thank you very much. I have no more discussion, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to take a roll call vote on this. Let's take a roll call vote, please. Member Feller. Uh, just to reinstate where this is to forward the County Council with approval. Recommendation of approval. Recommendation of approval. Mm -hmm. Then I say no. Member Young. No. Member Shelley. Yes. Member Bender. Yes. Member Costa. Yes. Member Sixma. Yes. Me Chair Mills. Yes. <clears throat> Thanks for your time. Sorry to take so much of it. Thank you. All right. It's okay. Let's, let's see how fast we start moving through this. <laughs> Ms. Shelley, let's, we got a whole stack of them here. Okay, we're on 143, correct? <laughs> yes, we are. Oh. Case number V-22-143, variances to the minimum yard requirements on mobile home park MH1 zoned property. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. And this Ms. Smith? No. Uh, Ms. No, Ms. sir, it's me. Uh, Michael Hansen, Planning Development Services, once again. Uh, this particular variance is in Section 3 of the Terramar Mobile Home Village Park. Uh, we've, over the last year, we've had a number of variances asking for the same kind of thing due to the setbacks. So the particular variance has two variance requests uh, for side yard setbacks, reducing it from 7.5 to five feet. Historically, the section three plat of Terramar was incorrectly recorded. It wasn't recorded correctly at the time. There was a court case that happened back in 1994 that established it in legitimize the, pl the platting of the property due to the nature of it. If the plat had been recorded correctly at the time that it had been written back in 1978, it is likely that this entire section of Terra Moore, Section 3, would have been zoned as MH5, which is the same zoning classification as Sections 1 and 2 of the Terra Moore Mobile Home property. The applicants in this particular variance case have a uh, a property that they're trying to site a 28 foot wide mobile home. And then as Terramar has instituted its own uh, requirements for a carport due to essentially what they call their perspective agreement, which is essentially a homeowners association agreement, the proposed carport is 12 feet. And thus the request for the variance on the both side yards to reduce it from 7.5 to five feet. Um, staff recommended approval in this case. I'm available for any questions the board may have. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Any questions for staff? Is the applicant present? Would you like to come forward? Okay. <laughs> After that, Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have some uh, comments on this. Uh, Mr. Snyder? Oh, that's you. And Nathan uh, Sobler, would you like to come forward? Okay. So you're uh, David Snyder, uh, 4357 Dolphin Way, Edgewater, Florida. Um, thank you for your time. Um, my concern is I don't know what I want to call it, bamboozled. Everybody that's moved into this park has been bamboozled one way or another. Um, I was under the impression that my lot was 65 by 100 when I bought it. So, and then, and then I had this home appraisal report before we moved in that said the lot was 60 by 114. 
So turns out that I found out one of the past year, the lot's 57 by 100, unless, but the lot's angled, so actually you've got 50 feet usable across. So when I had mine surveyed, I'm only two feet from, from the Hutchinsons. So I wouldn't have bought the lot if I had known that I only had two feet. So I'm just worried about the overhangs. Is it going to be a fire hazard? Uh, you know, because we're going to be on top of each other. And I'm, you know, I welcome them to the neighborhood, but I, you know, I just have concerns. I'd be too close. Well, how close is you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I got two how feet. How close my... is your unit to, to his property line? Yeah, I'm, I've only got two feet there. Okay. So, uh, okay. So I, I, I understand that I, it's, you know, I just. Okay. So the, it was seven and a half feet, and I, you know, I was I was fine with that. And, okay. But you know they, you know, like like you said, this is a third, you know, third one in a year on that street. So everybody's requesting one. So. Okay. But I just wanted to speak my piece, and I. Uh, I that's think, fine. I think yeah, and fine. and I appreciate you coming forward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any, okay. And is you, Mr. Snyder? Uh, my name is Nathan Sobler, 4345 okay. Dolphin Way, Edgewater. I can now say good afternoon, technically, <laughs> I guess. Um, but I understand that there have been other requests to go from seven and a half feet to five feet, and that they have been approved, and I understand the reasons they've been approved. Um, the reason I'm here is a slightly different. Uh, I am the other adjacent property, and... Um, the property that is having the home put on it now has, um, I don't know if you call them survey stakes, boundary markers, whatever. And my assumption is when they measure, if it's approved to five feet, they measure the five feet, they'll be measured back from those markers. We were away when we came back, we thought, hmm, those stakes look like they're a lot closer to the driveway than they were before we left. And recently, since then, we've been told by two different people that somebody was out there moving the stakes over somewhat. Now, we currently have uh, an, uh, have deal landscaping, uh, deal land, <laughs> deal surveying property land surveyors scheduled to come out and resurvey our lot just to make sure everything is as it should be. Unfortunately, with Ian. They're somewhat busy. It'll be three to five weeks probably before they can even come out to survey it. Um, what I'm wondering is, is there any allowance to have some sort of a delay until the surveying thing is straightened out? I don't know if the mistakes were moved closer to our property or if they were not moved. Well, that would be, that would be something on the legal side. But uh, as far as delaying the variances, He's got to be whatever the variances is. If it's uh, five feet off of his property line, it's got to be five feet off his property line. Okay. If he's moved the stakes and you can prove that he's moved the stakes and he puts it within two foot of the property line, then then there's an issue. There's a code enforcement issue there, okay. permitting issue. And that should be all checked out when uh, through the permitting process. You answered my question. I appreciate it. Under, in, under the inspection as well, too. It would be handled. The inspection, they'll they'll make sure that the placement of the home is within the. They'll uh, actually do the placement of the. Yeah, that's the, not a, that's not this board. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, that's All not right. this board though. We won't. They, they won't. The inspection won't. Move not the inspection, board. but the whenever they go to have their permits done and pulled to put stuff in, that's their job, right? We're just saying whether it's five foot or seven and a half foot. Mm -hmm. That's what we're saying. Yeah. We're talking property line. Right, exactly. We're not, so, we're not yeah. telling them where the property line is. So we don't have anything with stakes or anything like that. We're just, no, yeah, we're, exactly. we, we're just basing ours strictly All off the stuff. property line. What we they don't. do after, if he builds within one foot of the property line after that, that's somebody else's jurisdiction. Okay. Yeah. I think you've answered my question. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. That does it for the public comments on this case. Does anyone like to speak to this case? Hearing. Yes. Yeah, you're the you property. Gotta, you, you come up and rebuttal. State your name and address for the record. Ken Hutchison, 429 Winnegene, Umatilla, Florida. Okay. Uh, when I went there, the guy that sells me the mobile home, he told me, he goes, you might want to drive some stakes into the ground. So I took steel stakes that hold down tents this deep, 
and drove them in the ground. So if someone took the time to move them out, they, you know, I don't know what would happen. Plus they made me do a survey of where the house would sit yeah. and then a survey of the property. So I double did it two different times. Yeah, so to make sure it would fit in. just based on the property line, wherever it may be. We don't, right. we don't know where it's at, wherever right. it may be. And when I look at it, it's going to be tight. You know, five feet is five feet, but he's got five feet also. But the opposite guy, when I buy a home, I get it surveyed to make sure I'm right in my property. That guy bought a house without getting it surveyed, apparently, because it literally is going to be two and a half feet. My gutter will be two and a half feet from not his whole house, just like two foot of his garage area because my house does not go back far enough. If they were to show that sky picture, they would show my, my house isn't going to the depth of the property. It has so many feet off the road. And so my house isn't impeding on his carport or garage. It's up two foot of going into that little carport area because the angle of the home, it would be like that. And the back of my home's like two foot into his home, basically. Well, we're basing it on property lines. Yeah. So we're, we don't, we're, not, we're not telling you where the property line is. Yeah, and I'm not, I mean, I'm a little upset that their house sits next to mine, but what can I do about it? You know what I mean? Whole different issue. The yep. two foot that they didn't get a variance. They didn't oh. have one. Did they permit it after <laughs> they bought the home? Code enforcement just left, so no, no. <laughs> you know what I mean? Can so. I say, Chair, really quickly as well? May I? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. This is not the first. I mean, you, uh, like I think the neighbor yeah. said, this is the first. I mean, this whole development, we've heard this many, many times, and this is in light, and, and if this were change were to pass, it's in light with all the other Terramar sections and everything. Right. I, I know that the carport thing is an issue, but this is, um, this is about your five-foot property. Right. Yeah. Okay, okay, we're going to close this for public participation and open up for commission discussion or a motion. I'll make a motion <clears throat> that uh, case number V-22143, we approve variance number one and number two with the staff recommended conditions. Second. I got a motion from Mr. Frank Costa to approve <clears throat> variance V-22143, variances one and two with staff recommended conditions and a second from Ms. Shelley. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, folks, this is a little after 12. We're going to take a 30 minute break here. Uh, I think we need it after <laughs> what we went through earlier, but uh, to regroup here and get our minds right. But uh, We'll be we'll reconvene at uh, let's put it at twelve let's let's just say twelve forty. Okay. Gosh, <clears throat> they got lunch back there. Well, they, they do have yep. something. Yep. Just, I didn't eat this morning. I'm starving. Good to know.
No, twelve forty. Twelve forty. Oh. Okay, we're gonna get back to business here after that short adjournment. Okay. Uh, Miss Shelley, could I get the next case read into the record, please? Yes, sir. Case number V-22-148, variances to the minimum yard requirements, an access accessory dwelling unit regulations on an urban single-family residential R4 zoned property. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. Mr. Hanson, this one's yours. Yes, sir. Michael Hanson, Plan Development Services again. Uh, one quick correction on this particular staff report for where it says variance request two fells four out of the five. It's actually three out of the five as an oversight during the revision period. Otherwise, this particular variance application is for uh, two parts. One, with to take a detached garage that had been permitted for construction back in 2001 and converted into an accessory dwelling unit, which is variance request two. The applicant also wants an addition onto the front of that same uh, detached garage to encroach in the front yard an additional 4.5 feet into the front yard setback as required by the, the zoning classification. Staff made the recommendation based on the data for variance request one, the front yard encroachment as it felled three of the five criteria. Noting the addition is measures 15 feet in width by five feet in depth. The garage is sited currently right at the uh, setback. It's six inches prior to the setback. That's why the request for the, the 4.5 feet. The purpose of that addition with the overall plan for the garage is to create an expansion of unconditioned space for the property owner to have a, in, uh, a garage for the ADU. So the current dimensions of the ADU measure 1,097 square feet. Per the size limitation of the ADU compared to the actual principal structure on the property, they're limited to an ADU no greater than 864 square feet. So with the size of the garage currently, they're trying to use the additional space of the garage to leave that unconditioned, expand it into the front yard setback to create a parking space as a attached garage to the ADU. Uh, this secondary request for the variance application is in regards to the location of the proposed ADU. By code, an ADU is supposed to be located rearward or the rearmost point of the principal dwelling unit. The garage, although permitted in 2001, is, is not rearward of the rearmost point of the principal dwelling unit. The applicant's attempting to use it as an ADU, so that's why that variance is requested. That particular variance request fell three of the five criteria when evaluating it. A particular note that if the garage is developed as an ADU, it may have an aesthetic for the neighborhood that it could be essentially like a duplex or multifamily when viewed from the street. The property does have three driveways on the property currently. And that was part of the justification for the criteria is that it fell for variance two. That said, the applicant as far as the variance one with the proposed encroachment into the front yard setback theoretically could possibly redesign the ADU to not need to encroach into the front yard or put the addition onto an, another portion of the garage that does not encroach in the front yard. I'm available for any questions the board may have. Any questions for the staff? Any is the applicant present? Mm -hmm. 
Good morning, ma'am. Could I get your name and address for the record? Yes, good afternoon. My name is Marie Littlemark, 110 Thames Avenue, Daytona Beach. Okay, you've heard the Florida. staff report. Anything you'd like to add to that? Yes, I do have some, I have several items here for your consideration. Um, and wondering if you would prefer for me to present them individually in case you have questions or if you would prefer me to go through everything for questions at the end. What we'll do is if we have any questions while you're presenting them, we'll, we'll let you know and uh, okay. we'll, we'll get a, try to get an answer to it. Okay. All right. One of the things that um, in the staff report that was mentioned is um, an alternate placement for the ADU on the property in their report. Um, they suggest that there could be an ADU constructed in the rear yard behind the main residence as opposed to um, converting the garage. However, um, since our property does not have access to city sewer, the septic tanks and the drain field happen to be located in the rear yard. Should make it impossible to put out, put in ADU in that area without um, you know, compromising that system. Not, uh, not just the building itself, but you know, all the water lines that would have to be put in and all the um, sewer lines and everything to access the septic tank. I, I don't think that um, it would be, um, I don't think it would work. Um, um, the other side of the yard next to um, where the pool deck is and where the main house is, um, is at this point 34 feet from the nearest point of the structure to the um, side yard along the county lot that would be on the east. Um, it's the, 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 the narrowest point is 34 feet. Um, it's the setback is eight, so that leaves 26 feet. That part of the yard um, is currently um, has a swale in it for water control. Um, the open lot next to us is the water tower um, land. And from that water, the water tower sits way high on a hill. And then from there, the land grades down to our property line. So there's a lot of um, water that comes down that way. So the swale in our yard kind of protects our house. Um, and the structures on our property from um, um, to try and put an ADU in that location re would require copious amounts of fill um, because there is a swale area there that would have to be completely filled in to, to bring the structure up. Um, in that regards, I think that that's not a, would not be a prudent place to put an ADU. Um, also in their staff report, um, the staff suggested that an ADU could be designed not to necessitate the 4.5 encroachment into the front yard and that the 75 foot addition could be put on the rear of the garage building instead. Assuming that you have copies of the, all the documents I submitted to the county, if you look at the current interior layout, layout of the building, due to the placement of where the bathrooms, the plumbing, the water heater is, um, it would require and it adding a larger than 75 square foot addition onto the rear of the garage so that there would be access from one side to the other. Um, this would, it would make it very difficult to stay within the maximum allowed living space of 864 square feet or 50% of the main dwelling as is stipulated in the ordinance. We understand that a garage is not required for an ADU, but as Michael mentioned, it seems sensible to include one since the space is already there. It just needs an additional five feet on the front or 4.5 into the front yeah, lot area. Um, my next item, I've, I've read a lot of information on the Volusia County website about the importance of preserving open spaces, green areas, vegetation, and planting trees. Even if it would be possible to position an ADU in the rear yard somewhere, which is doubtful considering the structures and systems that are already there, um, from an environmental standpoint, I think it clearly would be far more beneficial 
to make use of a structure that is already in place on the property rather than further reducing the valuable open space, which is place for water to drain, um, you know, protect, protect, better protect the neighboring properties um, rather than covering that up um, with by placing um, on another building on the lot. And then my, the next thing that I did want to mention, when we were looking to purchase a property in Florida, one of our main criteria was that it have two dwelling units, a main house and a separate apartment for my daughter to live in. We came across the listing for 110 Thames, which was advertised as having both a residence and a garage apartment. When we looked at the property, I asked the listing agent if the garage apartment was permitted based on a conversation she had with the planning with she had with planning and development she confirmed that it was this ultimately sealed our decision to make an offer on the property um, i've presented or my daughter has presented to you um, an email from the listing agent stating what she was told by the county when she contacted them at the time that she listed the property also um, Thereafter, during the due diligence process before closing, my appraiser also contacted the county to confirm the existence of the garage apartment. There's another document in there from um, an email document with an attachment um, from um, the appraiser to my mortgage company stating that the garage apartment was indeed approved. And that was an email directly from one of the county planning people. Basically, we purchased this property in good faith. We, it was based on information that had been provided by the county. We had no reason to believe the information was not true and correct. Therefore, when we made the ultimate purchase, it was our understanding that we were purchasing a property with a valid permitted garage apartment. If we had any reason to suspect or doubt that the garage apartment was not a permitted dwelling, we would not have purchased that property because I specifically did not want to have to wind up in this position that I'm in now. I feel that this information is pertinent it, as it addresses the matter of undue hardship as well as special circumstances, not the result of the options, actions of the applicant. And I respectfully request that you take this into consideration when making your decision. The final paperwork um, that my daughter whoops, handed, to, handed all of you are some letters of support from my neighbors who don't, seem to, who don't have any problem with what I'm proposing. Okay. <clears throat> Anyone have any questions for the applicant? All right. Let's see. And we don't, I don't have any public participation forms, so we'll see if anyone else likes to speak. If they would, then I'll give you a chance for rebuttal, okay? I'm sorry, Thank Chair. You. I was reading this one. Okay. Is yeah. there currently a garage apartment in there? It, I see the pictures. It's a garage, but then I say it's a garage. It has a full bathroom. It it's already connected to the septic okay. system. It's already connected to the city water through um, through the main house. Um, it has a water heater. That's all permitted. Everything that's in there now is permitted. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, we don't have any public participation forms for this case. Is there anyone here who would like to speak to this case? Hearing none, we're going to close the floor for public participation. Open up for commission discussion or a motion. Uh, I'll make a motion, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Mr. <clears throat> case V-22-148, that we approve the two variances with the staff recommended conditions. Second. Okay, I got a motion from Mr. Frank Costa to approve variances one and two for case V22148 with the staff recommended conditions and a second for Ms. Shelley. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, Ms. Shelley, can I get the next case read into the court? Yes, sir. Case number. 
Case number V-22-149, variance to the minimum yard requirements on rural agricultural A2 zoned property. Thank you, Ms. Shelley, and this is uh, Mr. Hanson. Yes, sir, Michael Hanson, Plan Development Services, once again. Uh, a quick correction on this particular one is that there is a line in the background section that reads, the adjacent property to the south is developed with a non-conforming single family residence that's located approximately five feet from the common property line with the subject property line. That line was added through the revision process and error and is not meant to actually be in the staff report. So I apologize for that. We did receive uh, public participation uh, via uh, an email that was sent to our, our team. I believe there's someone in the audience to speak to it as well. Uh, the particular variance, however, based on the criteria, we made a recommendation of denial, noting that it failed to meet one of the five criteria. As you see on the variance site plan in front of you, the particular lot is a non-conforming A2 zone property that has an unopened right-of-way to the north, as platted as Kentucky Avenue, prompting a secondary front yard. The front yard requirement in an A2 zone property is 50 feet. Thus, the applicant is requesting a variance to reduce the 50-foot front yard setback on the north property line to 35 feet for the purposes of siting an 1,876 square foot home, which is 40 feet in width on the, on the property, as you can see on the, the site plan. Uh, uh, theoretically, the, the buildable footprint of the property would only leave a 25 foot wide space on, on the parcel. That's otherwise legally non-conforming and probably likely difficult to site a residence on, on there. And that's the justification of why the applicants seeking a variance so that they could fit their proposed house on the property. I'm available for any questions that you may have. Any questions for staff? Just a clarification. Um, your recommendation is it fails to meet one, and I believe there's two that are not met. Uh, number two and then number four, at least in my report, not met and not met. Just a clarification. Uh, yes, ma'am, I stand corrected. Thank you. Or not you, just the report. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, is the applicant present? Can I get you to come forward, sir? And can I get your name and address for the record? Yes, afternoon. Uh, Ted Estes with uh, Miranda Home. So thank you again uh, for allowing us to, to come here. Um, I appreciate Michael working on it as well and advising us communication. And obviously, you know, really we're not here just represented with Miranda Homes, but actually the future Volusia County tax resident that will be there um, to make sure they have, you know, uh, due justice, just to make sure they're being treated fair and equally. Um, as Michael said, the lot is non conforming per the A2 zoning. It does not meet the minimum of five eight acres and minimum of 150 foot in, uh, lot width. Um, the minimum setback for A2 zoning are front 50, side 25, and rear 50. Uh, we met those other other side setbacks, or other setbacks, that is. We are just asking for that little a bit of variance from the corner side setback of that road uh, that's not improved and if it'll ever be there. Who knows? So it's not impacting any residents, uh, that being. Um, the property of the south, uh, obviously, I guess you clarified that, so there must be a misprint, so we thought that was um, uh, an error as well. So of that's being said, obviously, the five-foot setback is uh, doesn't seem that to be an issue, but the lots are surrounding more fit the R4 zoning clear, uh, classification, not the A2 zoning. Um, I mean, obviously, like Michael said, to put any house on there. I mean, we're not, we're being modest as far as this plan and square footage, um, even more so than the neighbor or anything like that, um, that we're just trying to make it doable for some residents more than 25 foot, because they just don't have a house pad usually that size. Um, we don't. And, um, you know, we're just obviously trying to make sure that we're being modest, but, uh, you know, looking out for a future residence that's, you know, can fit on there, so. All right, thank you, sir. Yep. Uh, any questions for the applicant? 
All right, we don't have any public participation forms. Let me see if anyone would like to speak to this case. Is there anyone that would like to speak to this case? All right, sir. When you come forward after you're done, if you'll fill out one of these public participation forms and hand it to the lady. All right, my name's Tim Palmer, yes, 715 sir. Volco Road. Okay. And I was here only to make sure that a 25-foot setback was maintained on the south side of the property. And uh, I welcome them to the neighborhood. All right, sir. Thank you. Don't forget to fill out one of them forms. You get one of the forms in the back. And hand it to Miss Ray over here. She may have one right there at her desk. Okay, we're going to close the floor for public participation. Open for permission, discussion, any discussion or a motion. I'll make a motion, Chair. Uh, anybody, let's have Case it. number V-22-149 <clears throat> that we approve uh, the variance with staff recommended conditions. Second. Okay, I got a motion from Mr. Costa <clears throat> to approve variance 22-149 with the staff recommended conditions and a second from Ms. Shelley. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Ms. Shelley, could I get the next case, please? Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. Where's my shopping cart? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. 154. Oh, okay. That's what I was on. For some reason, I hadn't checked okay. it off. Thank you. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> Case number V-22-154, variance to separate non-conforming lots on prime agricultural A1 zoned property. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. Uh, and this is Mr. Mr. Shams. Hi, good afternoon. This is Steve Shams with Planning and Development Services. Um, the, the subject variance is to separate non-conforming lots on A1 zone property. The applicant wishes to construct a single family home. <clears throat> the lot itself is just short of 10 acres at 9.857. Um, the property is held in common ownership, but is vested. So um, this variance is very straightforward. It's just to separate um, non-conforming lots and staff recommends approval as the variance meets all criteria and I'm available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Shams. Any questions for staff? I do real quick. You've got, you've got a list at a zero, Samsula. Does it not have an address on Honeydew Lane? It does not have an address right now. But it does touch Honeydew, Honeydew Lane, correct? Yes, I believe the, the front of the property that's, I mean, that's, it's, oh, yeah. that's going to be its, it's, it's ingress and egress point, right? Yes. Honeydew? Yes, it doesn't have a um, uh, property number assigned to it, but it is on Honeydew Lane. Okay, because it caused a couple of calls to me. It's like, where is zero Samsula Drive? And it, it's not Samsula Drive. It's actually Honeydew Lane. So just for future. Sure. Thank you. And I'll be making a motion if, if you're good, unless you have participation. Well, we got to get to... <laughs> I know, we're, we're, we're way ahead now. <laughs> Is the applicant present? Let's just go to the last item on the agenda. Would you like to come forward? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. We don't have any public participation for this case. Anyone would like to speak to this case? Okay. Hearing none, we're closed for public participation. There you go. I'll it. make a motion. <laughs> case V-22-154 that, that we approve the variance. Um, and I don't believe... There are any conditions? No conditions. Second. Okay, I got a motion from Mr. Costa to approve variance V22154 and a second from Ms. Shelley. And there is no staff conditions. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any, any opposition? No. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Yes, sir. Ms. Shelley, 156. Case number V-22-156, variances to separate non-conforming lots and the minimum yard requirements on urban single-family residential R4 zoned property. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. And this is Mr. Hansen again. Yes, sir. Michael Hansen, Planning Development Services. Uh, this particular variance is split between two variance requests. Uh, one is for separation of non-conforming lots from the subject property uh, separating from the adjoining property there. 
the particular property was separated from the adjoining property in 2007 without going through the county subdivision process to separate the lots. And it was done so via quick claim, quick, quick claim deed. But both properties are independently developed with homes on them that were created back in 1961. As per our non-conforming ordinances, ordinance that we have in play, the combination of lots would be impractical because both houses are, or properties are developed with homes and they're independently owned. Uh, additionally, the area is part of, or the, the subject property is part of the Sable Palms Unrecorded Exempt Subdivision 1207. <clears throat> Staff made a recommendation for approval on both variance requests, one to separate the non-conforming lots, and for variance request two, which is a reduction of the north side yard from eight feet to 1.6 feet. The justification for the reduction of the setback is due to the placement of the existing home and the accessory structures, as you can see on the variant site plan. This helps to legitimize the existing home so that way it is within the actual border or within the setbacks of the property and, and, and boundaries of the property. I'm available for any questions the board may have. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Any questions for staff? Mr. Bender. I'm just looking at, so this is being done just to legitimize what's already there. Because when I look at lot, I mean, page three, uh, variance one, it's the last sentence that says the lot must be separated to acquire building permits for an accessory structure. The, <coughs> the variance request is, deals with the existing uh, structures. However, through conversation with the applicant, that looks like they're looking at the potential for being able to sell the property. So in order for the property to be able to get any kind of building permit uh, for say an accessory structure, they would have to have the lot separated. Okay, so in other words, for both, for both reasons. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions for staff? Is the applicant present? Can I get your name and address for the record, sir? Afternoon. I'm Nicholas Van Hook. I'm the attorney for Homebridge who owns the property. I am from uh, 225 East Robinson Street in Orlando. Okay. And I don't really have much of a statement. Um, I'm here for questions or concerns that you may have or if any citizens speak, if you need rebuttal. So I don't, there's nothing much I need to add on to what was said. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? All right, sir. And I don't believe I have any public participation forms on this case. Anyone would like to speak to this case? Hearing none, we're gonna close the floor for public participation. I'm gonna open it up for commission discussion or a motion. Uh, make a motion. Case number V-22-156 that we approve variance numbers one and two and with staff recommended conditions. Second. Okay, I've got a motion <clears throat> to approve variance 22-156 from Mr. Costa. Variance is one and two and a second from Ms. Shelley with the staff recommended conditions. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Ms. Shelley, can I get the next case, please? Yes, sir. Case number V-22-157, variance to reduce the minimum yard requirements on urban single family residential R4 zoned property. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. Mr. Shams. Uh, good afternoon. Steve Shams with Planning and Development Services. Uh, this variance is on an R4 zone corner lot. The applicant purchased the property in May 2022 to utilize as a rental. Uh, he sought to improve with renovations, but the previous owner had unpermitted additions on the north side and added a carport. Uh, the unpermitted improvements do not meet the setback requirements. Um, so there's, and the setback requirements are 25 feet in the front uh, and 20 feet total on the side with an eight foot minimum. 
So there's two variances in total. A variance one is to reduce the north front yard requirement from 25 feet to 10 feet for an existing home addition. And variance two is to reduce the east front yard requirement from 25 feet to 12 feet for the existing carport. Uh, the applicant will need after the fact permits if the variance is approved. Uh, staff recommends approval as they do meet all five criteria for the variance, but we also add conditions for approval. They must apply for the after the fact building permits and have the existing structures inspected prior to issuance of building permits for any new work. And number two, the variances are limited to the existing structures as identified on the variance site plan. Any additional encroachments will require a new variance. Thank you, Mr. Shams. Any questions for staff? Is the applicant present? You want to come forward, sir? I'm going to state your name and address for the record. Uh, good afternoon. It's uh, Linnell Martin, uh, 224 Sunset Point Drive in Ormond Beach. Okay, you've heard the staff report. Do anything? You'd like to add to that? Nothing to add, just here to uh, answer any questions or any uh, address any concerns that anyone have, have had. But um, just to point out um, my interactions with, with the surrounding neighbors, they've, uh, the, the previous owners, they've, they've been there for 20 plus years with that existing structure that you see there. No one's have had any issues whatsoever. The, the new owners are actually thrilled that someone's actually coming in and doing something about the property. The property was in uh, um, disarray. They didn't have a lot of resources or funding to you know, rehab it, and that's what I'm here to do. And, and hopefully the, the eventual goal is to rehab it and, and make it aesthetically um, pleasing for the neighborhood, so. All right, sir. Question. Mr. Costa? Can you tell me, I can't really tell from the pictures. Tell me about this carport. Is it brick and mortar? Is it wood frame? Is it aluminum? It's uh, aluminum uh, frame, sir. So it's an aluminum drop-in type of aluminum roof with aluminum pillars holding right. it up? Right, yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, any other questions for the applicant? Okay, we don't have any public participation forms for this case. Is there anyone like to speak to this case? All right, so you can have a seat. We're gonna have a close the floor for public commission, public participation and open up for commission discussion or a motion. I'll keep it rolling and make a motion. Case number V-22-157 that we approve, approve variance number one and variance number two with the uh, two staff recommend, recommended conditions. Second. I've got a motion for Mr. Costa to approve variances one and two for V22157 with the staff recommended conditions and a second from Ms. Shelley. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Ms. Shelley, could I get the next case please? Yes, sir. Case number V-22-158, variance to reduce minimum yard requirements on urban single family residential R2 zoned property. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. This is Mr. Shams also. All right, good afternoon again. Um, this property is zoned R3, uh, and it's also in the natural resource management area. The property itself is conforming to the zoning dimension, dimensional requirements. The applicants purchased the property in December 2021, uh, and they seek to construct a single family home on the property. The property itself uh, does have a significant amount of trees and they have uh, indicated they want to orient the home in a way to preserve as many trees on site and avoid removal. So there's two variances in total. The first variance is to reduce a south side yard requirement from eight feet to seven feet. And variance two is to reduce the rear yard requirement from 20 feet to two feet for the single family home. The minimum home size on the R3 is a thousand square feet and they're proposing a home of 1,141 square feet. Due to the size of the property and location of the trees, uh, the applicant would be encroaching into one of the yards if they were to preserve all the trees on the property. Uh, the property to the rear yard is owned by the state of Florida and is used in a canal system leading to Lake George. And I understand there's been a lot of attention to this property um, especially after Hurricane Ian in regards to flooding. Um, I believe in total the applicant has been contacted three times, uh, once as recent by myself yesterday to inquire if there is flooding on the property because that does sometimes occur later. 
he had instructed to me that the property does not have any flooding issues because there was a concern of um, potentially granting a variance on a property that is currently underwater, but that's not the case. Um, overall, uh, staff recommends denial for the, both variances as they failed to meet two of the five criteria. Um, the trees on the property are not historic and can be removed and replaced on other areas of the property. And this is not the minimum variance to construct a home as trees can be removed and the home could be built outside of the setbacks. However, should the PLDRC find evidence to approve, staff recommends two conditions that the principal structure cannot exceed its current size or location as depicted on the variance site plan and the applicant shall meet all environmental requirements to mitigate wetland impacts. I'm available for comment. Thank you, Mr. Shan. Any questions for staff? Hearing none, is the applicant present? Good morning. Could Good I morning. get your name and address for the record? Daniel Fountain, uh, 2320 Lipizzan Trail, Ormond Beach. All right, sir, you've heard the staff report. Anything you'd like to add to it? Yes. Uh, this property is that we're placing this house strategically because of uh, the trees. They're like an oak hammock tree, so you really can't cut them down and replace them and make them look like it does now. So we're trying to get it a little bit closer, well, a lot closer than normal, to, but it's no man's land where it's going up to. Uh, it's the state of Florida, there's 75 feet, and then there's a canal. So it's not gonna approach anybody else's land. Uh, we have a septic, it has to be so far away from that canal, and then we're meeting that. We have a driveway that has to, you know, there's so many trees on this thing, we're trying to put this house where we only have to take down one tree, compared to if you're trying to meet the criteria you're supposed to, we're gonna be taking down like 30 trees. So we're just trying to make it fit in the hammock and make it look, I mean, that's why the house is so small, to fit in there. Anything, what else? Oh yeah, the driveway and the septic. I mean, it, it has to be strategically put in there in order to save these trees and not and get too close to the septic or have to make the septic uh, move. Okay. Mr. Feller? I do have something. Um, you, I don't know if you know this, but environmental permitting does not support this. They think it's too close to the back. And I am all for tree preservation, but I'm more for water preservation. Um, you can locate this further away from that back setback. I think going to uh, two feet is, especially into the EP area, that I feel like that's pretty Pretty strong back there. I mean, I have not been able to visit this site and I, I don't know, but one of the things that I take into heart is environmental permitting does not support this. And, and that area where it's uh, the state owned, that's actually higher than the area where I'm at. I mean, it's, it's just more up on a hill compared to where we're wanting to put the house. Yeah. We are, we're well over 75 feet from the canal. I understand that. Yeah, I'm, just, I, I, I'm saying that even with the, the setback is there for that to not build on. I know you're 75 feet because of their setback or, you know, from the canal, but yours is, so I'm just. And we do own the adjacent properties next to us that we're. So it's yeah. not going to harm any neighbors. <laughs> okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, let's see if we have anyone that wants to speak to this case. Um, we don't have any public participation forms. Anyone else would like to speak to this case? Hearing none, we're gonna close the floor for public participation and um, open it up for commission discussion or a motion. Uh, <clears throat> Before a motion is made. Before a motion is made, is it possible to maybe take the two separately? I'll just put it out there. On the variances? On the variances, just because I'll say I'm, I'm, I can support one, but I can't support the other one. I, the, I would say I could support it in, in theory, but I'm worried about the wetlands. So, I don't however know if you we guys can, want to do it. Uh, you, 
No. I don't think you can split the variance up, can you, Mr. Soy? You, you can. Um, there's two variances. So there are, we've done this before, where you, you, you have to take them up separately. You vote on variance one, and then you vote on variance two. Okay. So you can, it's, I think it's called uh, uh, dividing the question or splitting the question. Um, if there are two parts where, you know, if there's an indication that a board member uh, would like to vote on that part separately. But I'll make a motion if you like, whatever you like. Okay. What I was going to ask is this, um, is it state property that the two foot is against? And, and what, what is the actual designation of that state property? It's designated as um, vacant conservation, I believe. Vacant conservation. So it's not. Uh, okay. 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 If you'd like to do something, Mr. Costa, would you like this, any discussion on this variance? If there's no discussion, I'll make a motion. Okay, go ahead. All right, I'll make a motion, <clears throat> case V-22-158, uh, that we approve variance number one, which staff recommended conditions. And I would make a second motion if I can. Uh, also case V-22-158 on variance number two that we approve variance two with staff recommended conditions. So two separate votes. I'll second both of those um, motions. Okay. Okay, we'll take the first one first. Uh, variance V22158, variance one. I got a motion to approve from Mr. Costa and a second from Ms. Shelley with the staff recommended conditions. Any discussion on variance number one? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Variance two, V22158. I've got a motion from Mr. Costa to approve variance two with the staff recommended conditions for, and a second from Ms. Shelley. Any discussion on that motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes. Motion carries six to one with Mr. Feller in the set. Okay, Ms. Shelley, can I get the next case, please? Yes, sir. Case number CPA 22-012, small scale comprehensive plan amendment from the mm. urban medium intensity UMI future land use designation to the rural community RLC designation. Okay, Mr. Shams, this is yours also. All right, good mm -hmm. afternoon again. Um, this is a small scale amendment on a 4.41 acre site. The app, uh, it has a supplement um, companion rezoning, which will be heard after. Um, the applicant wants to keep farm animals on site with her single family home. Uh, the, the purpose of the land use change is UMI does not permit agricultural uses. Overall, um, the, the land use change will result in a decrease of allowable density. Uh, the current land use, UMI, um, permits uh, residential density of four to eight DUs per acre or d dwelling units. And the new land use will permit one dwelling unit per acre. And when you calculate the acreage out, it equates to a re reduction from up to 35 units per acre or units total to four units, which is consistent with a single family home owned by the applicant. Uh, s similar cases earlier this year, uh, CPA 22005 and Z 22071 in proximity to this site did the same exact thing. Um, if you look at this diagram, you can see just below the subject parcel, there is an RLC. That is the parcel that was changed earlier this year. Um, and it provides precedent for the request and it's consistent with properties east of the site. So you're not performing any type of spot change. Uh, overall staff recommends forwarding to the county council for approval as all criteria are satisfied. And I'm available for co uh, comment or question. Thank you, Mr. Chan. Any questions for the, uh, for the staff? Okay, is the applicant present? Can I get you to come forward, please?
I think would you state your name and address for the record? Hi, Marella Jones, um, 520 South Shadow Lane, DeBerry, Florida. Okay, and you've heard the staff report. Anything you'd like to add to it? No, no nothing. I just want to build a house, have some animals, and <laughs> have my forever home. And uh, no. I, uh, I, I didn't do my due diligence right before I bought this property. I thought everything around it was cows and you know horses and stuff, and I thought this property was also that. And um, I didn't realize it until about a week before I closed on the property, but it was not. So um, I'm just trying to get it changed to, to start building and uh, live there forever. That's, that's okay. all I have. <laughs> okay, any questions for, for the applicant? Okay, we don't have any public participation forms, so does anyone like to speak to this case? Hearing now, we're going to close the floor for public participation and open up for commission. Thank you, ma'am. Commission discussion. I kind of this, welcome this as usual. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good one. Mr. Chair, I'd like to. Uh, I'm, I'm very familiar with the area, and she's correct. There's a lot of uh, this type of development around there, and whenever we're lessening the density, uh -huh. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm a happy person. Yep. So I'd like to make a motion that um, we find this uh, future land use amendment consistent with the comprehensive plan and forward application of case number CPA 22012, the county uh, council with a recommendation of a second on that one. Okay, I got a motion from Mr. Bender to find a future land use amendment consistent with the comprehensive plan and forward the application case number CPA 22012 to county <coughs> council for a recommendation of approval and to the Volusia County Growth Management Commission for certification is second from Mr. Sixma. Yeah. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Shelly, can I get the next case, please? Yes, sir. That's uh, 160. 160, that's what I'm on. Okay. Case number Z-22-160, rezoning from urban single-family residential R4 zoning classification to transitional agricultural A3 zoning classification. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Shams. All right, so this is the companion rezoning to the previous case, which was the CPA change. Um, this rezoning is from R4 to A3. Uh, to allow farm animals on site with a single family home. Um, the property is conforming to the proposed zoning as uh, the A3 has a one acre minimum and this is a four, nearly four and a half acre site. It's consistent with the surrounding properties, especially properties of uh, as a rezoning heard early this year, Z-22071 which is just south. Again, it is that same parcel that is uh, on this image labeled green. Um, staff recommends forwarding to the county council for approval, but it is contingent on the previous case, which was approved. I'm available for, for comment or question. Thank you, Mr. James. Any question for staff? And would you like to come forward again? You don't have to. No. Okay. <laughs> okay, do we have any one in here would like to speak to this case. Hearing none, we'll close the floor for public participation and open up for Mr. Benner's motion. <laughs> I recommend uh, forward this rezoning application case number Z22160 to the County Council for final action with the recommendation of approval. Second. Okay, I've got a motion from Mr. Bender to forward the rezoning application case number Z22160. The County Council for final action with recommendation of approval and a second for Ms. Shelley. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposition? Motion carries unanimously. Yes, sir. All right. Ms. Shelley, could I get the next case, please? Case number V-23-001. Variance to minimum yard, maximum lot coverage, and to allow development on a substandard lot on urban single family residential R9W zoned property. Okay, thank you, Ms. Shelley. And this is Mr. Walter. There you are over there. 
Good afternoon, Ben Walter, Planning and Development Services. Uh, this variance uh, has four separate variance requests uh, for the development of a single family residence on an R9 zone property. The property is also within the Indian River Lagoon Surface Water Improvements and Management Overlay Zone. The first variance is to reduce the front yard from 25 feet to 21.7 feet. The second variance is to reduce the minimum rear yard from 20 feet to 7 feet. The third variance is to increase the maximum lot coverage from 35% to 35.8%. And the fourth variance is to allow development on a substandard lot. Uh, this parcel was a, consists of two platted lots that were originally platted in 1946. Um, each platted lot was 25 feet by 100 feet in area. Later, uh, right away was obtained for Turtle Mountain Road, which reduced the lot area to 2,815 square feet, therefore making it substandard. <clears throat> a, literal, a literal interpretation of the zoning ordinance would only allow an 11.2 by 30 foot buildable area. Um, and similar variances to the, those requests that have been previously approved on this block uh, um, <clears throat> directly to the south. The front and rear yards were reduced to 10 feet, and in two parcels to the north, the front yard was reduced to 19 feet and the rear to 12 feet. That lot was also substandard at 2,963 square feet, which is roughly 150 square feet uh, larger than the subject parcel. Uh, variances one through three fail to meet one of the five criteria, as they are not the minimum variances required to make reasonable use of the property. In the R9 zoning classification, the maximum building height is 35 feet, allowing for multiple floors. Um, the minimum floor area for a residence in the R9 is 1,000 square feet. The buildable area of 11.2 by 30 would not allow the 1,000 square foot floor area to be met, but the applicant's requesting a footprint of 1,008 square feet, which would allow a larger residence. Staff does recommend approval of variance four as it meets all five criteria. Um, we recommend the condition that the underlying lots be combined and that the property must meet the landscape and stormwater requirements of the Indian River Lagoon Surface Water and Improvements and Management Overlay Zone. If the PLDRC finds evidence to approve variances one, two, and three, staff adds the additional condition, recommends, excuse me, the additional condition that variances one and two are limited to those shown on the variance site plan. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Walter. Do we have any questions? Mr. Bender. I don't necessarily have a question for staff. Well, I guess I do. It's probably two or three part deal here. Being that this seems to be uh, the causation of this is because of uh, an imminent domain action. In in the in the cases of when eminent domain happens and the property is damaged to the point that it is no longer usable, most times the argument made by the legal people that's representing the property owner or the property owner is that this is a property that cannot be used and they get the full value for that piece of property as well as get to keep it. And then they turn around and they come back to the county and they say, well, we can't build on it because of eminent domain issue and we would like to be able to build on it. Can we have a variance? So going forward, what I would uh, ask the staff to do if we have any cases that's such as this, that they maybe go back and look at what the settlement document said when the parcel was settled and check with right away and see what uh, the, all of those write-ups are so that we don't get into a situation where the property owners are in a position where they're double dipping. And with that said, I won't be able to support this motion. I mean, this, this variant, variant, okay. All right, any other questions for staff? I think you made that comment before. I did. Um, is the applicant present? Can I get your name and address for the record? Yes, sir. My name is Jonathan Adams. I'm with CRA and Associates, Professional Engineers, and our address is 414 Canal Street, New Smyrna Beach, Florida, 32168. Okay, you've had the staff report. Was there anything you'd like to add to it? 
Um, it's, I think, compared to what I've seen today, this is a pretty straightforward one. As um, Mr. Bender has stated, this is pretty much an unusable lot unless these variances are approved. Um, we've asked for just the minimum uh, building area of 1,000 feet, and that's why we have to get the other three variances. So it technically really is the minimum uh, variance allowed or required. Um, and so we don't have to build the Dr. Seuss house. And I'm sure you guys can visualize what that would look like. Okay. And I think it also conforms to the neighborhood standard. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? Okay. And in relationship to Mr. Bender's question, do you know if any compensation was ever made to for the that I do not know, sir. Taking of the property for right away? Sir, I do not know. You do not. Okay. But on that same question, when was the property acquired by you? So the property is is in the process of being acquired by Mr. Robasco. Um, it's under contract with the current owner, which I believe is uh, Running Land LLC. Okay. All right. Any other questions for the applicant? Yeah, one quick one. You said it was a thousand square foot house total. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. We do have some public participation forms for this case, so I'll give you a chance to come back for any type of rebuttal. So if you can just have a seat up there and then we'll get these out of the way. Okay, um, <clears throat> Mr. Jay Lake or Jay Lake. Good afternoon, sir. Can I get your name and address for the record? Yes, Jay Lake, 726 Magnolia Street, Windermere, Florida. All right, sir. We own uh, two lots um, just south of this lot, and we also own a family beach house just right next to there, too. And uh, the, it's confusing on what they're trying to do, so uh, help me out here if you can. So it looks like, uh, you know, they've got a a lot that's too small and to, the, you know, to they're only trying to build a thousand foot square house. Is that what they're trying to do? Thousand foot footprint, correct? Foot, footprint. footprint. Yeah. Okay. Um, are they showing how they're going to set the house up? Because most of these houses, if you look along there, are set up, you know, they're, they're pretty standard. I was looking at that also. Did you take? A, did you get a chance to see the staff report on this? We did. We looked at it. And it's. It's. I'm still confused. So. Uh, okay. The, do you know how exactly that house is going to sit on that property? Because I was looking at that in the and how staff report too. Be, uh, okay. I need to get you to speak on the record if you're going to have a conversation. So. I'll I'm give just, you a chance for I'm just curious how many stories it's going to be because there's a couple of houses in the neighborhood that are on such a small footprint it looks like a trailer stuck on end they're skinny and they're four stories tall I mean they, okay. look, they look ridiculous so well, the maximum our... how the height the loud is 35 feet okay. correct mr. Sawyer in this in this zoning district yes okay. yeah. 35 feet is the maximum they can go okay as to the peak Three okay. three so that would be three stories. Right. Okay. So the variance, we we don't tie the height into the variance as much as the setbacks to the property line. Right. And um, one of the other problems, too, the sign was put on our property, which was five lots south. So the people that live next to this property were not even notified. Um, okay. So. I'm going to get the applicant an opportunity to respond to your questions. Okay. Okay. When he says the sign, you're talking about what? The announcement for yeah, this meeting? The, the orange sign that's stuck on the property. Oh, that's a county that's question. Yeah. That's that so that issue. was that was not anywhere near where the lot is. That's what was confusing. That was on my our lot, and that's the reason we're here today. And then we got here and we found out it's five lots up. Ms. Smith, do you want to comment on that? Um, the applicants are responsible for placing their signs on their property, and we do recommend they take photos when they are placed in case this issue does come up. 
So okay. we would defer to the applicant on where they place their sign. Wow. Okay. Mm. All righty. Can, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Bender. Ms. Smith. Ms. Smith. It, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm getting old, so it's very possible that I misunderstood, but I thought the county took over the responsibility of hanging those signs away from the property owner. Weren't we told that a meeting ago or two? We, we did that during the pandemic. Prior to that, the applicants were responsible for due public notice and placing the posters, and we've gone back to that practice since the pandemic. Okay, so that's changed back now. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hmm. Hopefully we can get some of your questions answered, sir. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Our next, uh, I got another participation form. I'll let you address all of them. Uh, the other next one is from Mr. Don Lake. Okay, all right then. Is there anyone else that'd like to speak to this case? Okay, we're, I'll get the applicant back up. Okay, you've heard the conversation before you, couple, few questions, number one is really we're looking at the footprint but how many story are you thinking about building here so it's it's not confirmed but as you stated the the allowable mean building height is 35 feet so okay. it wouldn't exceed that and it would be uh, much more attractive to have a thousand foot uh, footprint than have that 300 square foot footprint and build okay. the dr seuss tower like uh the, the gentleman spoke of and do you have a photo of the lot sign placement um, yes, there was actually a photo pre uh, presented to uh, either Miss Ray or her assistant. Okay. And then in addition to that, we also sent certified mail to all the Jason okay. properties. So basically, we're looking at a th three-story home with a thousand foot, foot footprint. Likely, yes, sir. And the dimensions are on that is depicted in your site plan as being perfectly square. Is that correct? That's correct. So we're looking at the um, 21 feet and then the uh, seven feet at the rear. That's correct. Okay. So it does affect the front setback, but just slightly right. and the rear setback the is equivalent is the to rear. A, the, right. the rear setback's equivalent to adjoining property to a uh, near property. I'm confused. I'm confused here. You're building a three-story house or you're building a single-story house? We, we haven't decided yet, but uh, I'm assuming it's probably going to be three stories. If you have, if you get the variances for the thousand square foot, we give you the variances here. It's a thousand square foot house. It's a thousand square foot footprint. Footprint. Right. Footprint. 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 Not square foot of the house. Footprint. Got it. That's what I wanted to get to. Okay. Thank you. Because there are no more thousand square foot houses in the Beach. It could be mm -hmm. three thousand square foot. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Does that answer your questions? Okay. Um, did you want to comment on anything that was said? I'm just here to answer questions. All right. Okay. So, all right. Then we're going to close the floor for public participation and open up for commission discussion. I don't know if we have any discussion, but I'll, I'll, I'd like to make a motion. I'll let you make your motion, then I'll discuss if you want. I, my motion would be to continue this item until our next meeting in order to give the staff an opportunity to go and check with right away and check with the legal staff that handle the eminent domain action to find out how this was compensated before any action was taken as far as allowing development of this site. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think that right of way was probably obtained in maybe the 40s or the 50s for Turtle Mound. Um, we, we can check on that, but um, I think the property has changed hands since then. I believe uh, you're correct, sir. If, if I can, um, I can add a little to that. I spoke with right away staff. Um, the road was actually managed by the state when the taking occurred and then was later, and that was in the 1950s. I did not contact FDOT to find out the exact date, but right away staff did explain that it was in the 1950s, platted in 46. The road, the taking happened in the 50s, and then it's been in that condition since. Are you satisfied with that, Mr. Bender? Because I don't <laughs> think that even if we were to get through. Yeah, I, I say eminent domain would be irrelevant here. Yeah. 
I don't know. Has, has the zoning changed since that occurred, since 46 and 50s when you were just mentioned? Well, it's been added, yeah. I mean, the zoning was added uh, when they did their administrative zoning. I mean, it wasn't R9. Um, I just checked the property appraiser's website for ownership. So the person that would have been compensated would have been compensated back in the 40s or 50s. This property has changed hands several times. So the existing owner would not be the one who got the compensation. Got it. And this isn't really even indicative of an R9. May I, Chair? Okay, with that motion or? Yeah, well. It would. Uh, what I want to make a statement, or can we, they, they, we don't have any conditions on this. There's three. Page five. On page five, there's three staff conditions. Now we, can we put a condition on height? Height restriction? Yes. Two stories or one story? Um, well, it's, it's hard to define what a story is. Yeah. I mean, that's, so you tell me, <laughs> especially, um, I don't know what the, I, I don't know if it's a, this isn't a flood zone or how, how high they have to build that first habitable structure up above the, the floodplain. Um, I suppose you can limit it to a maximum number of stories, um, but we pretty much provide a height and then fit it in as you can. And now it's 35, so... Right. If we were to reduce it to 25, they'd be two-story house. But we would be, re we'd be really, sorry. It would be two-story yeah. house. I feel like we would be removing the property owner of a right that every other property owner has. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I think this that, is just, yeah. I'm just throwing this no, no, out No, yeah, here, exactly. Right? And I, I, I tend to agree with Mr. Bender on this. I think that, you know, these are substandard lots for a reason. And I think what's happening is the same exact thing. We're overbuilding in an area. We were concerned about, you know, certain number of toilets here in the land and this house is going to easily have three bathrooms in an area that doesn't have the water capacity to handle that but that being said i don't think that this is egregious for the area but i, I am a little torn on continuing to build on these substandard lots i mean they're they're not buildable they sell for some ungodly rate to try and get variances on it and then everybody complains that they're packed in on top of each other and i'm sorry i'm the neighbor I just moved from there. So I totally understand. I know the neighbor to this house. Totally I understand. About it, but I, I know the neighbor to this house, and um, he sold for a number of same reasons. Yeah, um, I, I totally understand, and I don't know if it puts you at rest or at ease at all, um, but the, the potential purchaser is very tasteful, and our firm is also very tasteful, and so we care about the whole image of the area, and you know we're, we're sort of against uh, building distasteful homes. I totally get it. <laughs> Another builder said the same thing and then just tore down the trees that he that he was going to keep. Um, and, I, and that's not to you. That is definitely not to you. Um, I actually am not against these variances as far as the way it goes. This is an internal lot. It's not a beachfront lot. I think seven feet to the back is perfectly reasonable. It's, an, it's a, another lot that's not there. I'm a little bit against the 35.8%. I know that's a weird one to say, but yeah. once you start granting everybody 1%, then 300 houses come back and want 1%, and you got 300% over. So that's where I have a problem. Um, but it's it's really just these are substandard lots, and then they're being sold for a fortune, and then people are wondering why they can't build houses on them. So I'm with you, Mr. Bender. I, I do have a little bit of an issue on how it's, how it's done, but I don't think that this is egregious, but a lot of little non-egregiouses add up to a lot. So that's what I have to say. I would just like to make one comment as well. Um, I, I am concerned about, um, and I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. I mean, when you came up and spoke, but I have uh, a great deal of concern about the misplaced sign. Um, and I think we need to go back to that. Um, yeah, do we have a phone what you phone? said, uh, Trish, about um, you know, the signs, they had to send in pictures so that you were sure it was on the right location because as someone who looks for those signs for different projects going on in my area, it makes a huge difference and it can make a huge difference when it's on the wrong size, uh, wrong, excuse me, wrong lot, as opposed to who might show up and who might not. So every time we have a case, we require the applicant to submit um, a certification that they sent out their certified mail with a list of who they sent it to. 
Uh, in this case, they also submitted photographs, and we can confirm that it is in the correct place. We just okay. pulled it Okay, up. thank you. Well, if we're going to allow them to build on it, you got a 30 by 30 foot footprint. Pretty much. Mm. 30 by 30, maybe 32 by 32, something like that. Yeah, I believe we included yeah. a, uh, a site plan so that we can see yeah. the exact measurements. So I have a, if you're going to allow them to build, I don't know how they can go any smaller. <laughs> and we can't control the height. So, All right. yeah. so the question is, do you allow them to do it? I mean, you, you can put limitations on the height because you are allowing them to come in closer to the, um, closer to the setbacks. Right. So normally you have a 35 foot height, but it's presumed to be the structure to be a minimum distance from the property line, you know, preserve um, site distance, you know, uh, those site corridors and to prevent, you know, overshadowing and to kind of prevent that stacking effect of 35 foot buildings being too close to each other. So if you grant a, um, a variance to a side setback, um, you can make a reasonable condition to reduce the height. Um, normally it's kind of a one foot by one foot, but you know, really depending upon the property. Um, I've seen it done multiple ways. Uh, here we don't have a specific formula, so you'd have to look at it on a property by property basis, you know, to make sure you're not creating these canyons or caverns um, between these properties. I can support What that, about Jerry. the property rights? Well, yeah, they're, I, I they're asking for a waiver, um, and you take in that consideration the, the property rights and their right to build in, in conformity and consistent with the applicable regulations in place. So right now, um, they're asking for a waiver to four things, uh, which is they have a substandard lot, which requires a variance. They, um, they need a variance to um, construct closer to the eastern property line. Um, actually, it's three variances, and they need a variance because they're exceeding a lot coverage. So we could put a condition in there for a single family residence with a maximum 25 foot height. So long as it's adequately justified um, based on the, um, what you're granting them. Because this, this is kind of a, a balancing of, of what is protecting the neighborhood. So you're, you're allowing a person to build on their property. However, you are putting a, you're putting it at conditions to mitigate for that detrimental effect of constructing a house that's too close to the property line and that you know that condition could be okay but don't don't create a dr seuss house that is you know skinny but very tall right can i just add something um i believe that the variances that were issued in the past didn't have any height regulations and we were very conscious to not impede on the side setbacks and the one that's really being adjusted the most is the rear setback so that shouldn't have any line of sight issues. Is it, is it, is it developed behind the home? No. no, it is not. As much as I hate it, I absolutely agree with you. I, and I say I hate it because I do believe we're overdeveloping with UM Beach. I, I totally, I totally understand world. what you're saying. So with, with, that in, with that in mind, I, I, I have to say I am in agreement with you that this is within the proper bounds. I am, I am a little bit against the height regulation, but I also agree this is a give and take. So, um, I don't know, Chair. You're gonna make that, yeah, you can't I'm just make throwing, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm just throwing stuff out there, maybe something can, to stick. Well, can that, uh, can that, can that piece of property behind you be, be developed? Um, I'm, I'm probably. Almost Oops. certain it's a non-conforming lot as well. It's the same exact. It yeah, it's, it's probably gonna it's probably gonna have the yeah, same you know, same yeah. issue, just like many of the lots in the area. Okay, hold on a minute. Yeah. Just a minute. Hold on. I apologize for the interruption. Um, I did not include in my report, but I wanted as we were discussing um, height. This property is east of the coastal construction control line, and I believe that there are limitations on what can happen on the ground floor. Um, Correct. And uh, I just wanted to bring that into the conversation. Yes, Mr. Chair. So if you limit their height and they're up on still, and I'm saying if we limit their height and they're up and they're up, you know, only two stories and a lot behind them, which is also potentially a non-conforming and they come in and they get a 35 foot variance. Now, all of a sudden they're staring right. In other words, you're not giving parity here. I think that to keep everything consistent with how we've been dealing with these other non-conforming lots 
and I, this is actually of all the ones that have come forward. It, this is he's not asking for the moon and the stars. We've had some that are basically pushing the envelope to nothing. It's not a two water setback. Yeah. Right. So I mean, with that, I think Mr. Fellows ready to make a, a motion. I, I, you know what? I mean, I will make the motion even though I'm very well. Put. I told you how I am on it, but I would I'd be happy to make the motion. Toss that cookie. In V twenty three dash zero zero one, I make the motion that uh, we approve variances one, two, three, and four, with staff recommended conditions um, one, two, and three. Uh, and and I'll second that. <clears throat> Uh, do we, the only thing that I would like to add, and I hate to keep on bringing it, can we make that a single family dwelling? Doesn't Is there a condition in there for single family? Yeah, family? I believe it's zone single family. Zone single family. Okay, got it. You got it? Okay. Yep. Okay, I've got a, did I get a second? Mm -hmm. I did, yes. Okay. I got a motion from Mr. Feller to approve variances one, two, three, and four. V23001 with the staff recommended conditions and a second for Mr. Young. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Nope. Okay, motion Just carries. Don't Just don't paint rings. Six, Ring, red rings around. Six to one <laughs> with Mr. Bender in dissent. Thank you very much. I appreciate y'all's service. <laughs> Okay, Ms. Shelley, could I get the next case? Yes, sir. Case number V-23-002, a variance to separate non-conforming lots on a split-zoned urban single-family residential R3 and urban single-family residential R9 zoned property. Mr. Walter. Ben Walter, Planning and Development Services. Um, the applicant's requesting a variance to separate non-conforming lots. There was common ownership between the subject parcel and the parcel to the south and a portion of the parcel to the north. If you see on the site plan, uh, there's a little jog on the northern end. That property was obtained to legitimize a detached garage that was built in 1951. Um, and then there was common ownership uh, with the entire parcel to the south. All of these parcels are developed with single family residences. Uh, County Council on Tuesday uh, passed an ordinance change that would no longer make this variance necessary, um, but due to the application date, we're here before you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Walter. Any questions for staff? Okay, is the applicant present? Okay, I don't think they are. Any, do we have any public participation? No. We don't have any public participation forms for this case. Would anyone like to speak to this case? Close the forth for public participation and open up for commission. I'm ready to make a motion. motion. There you go, Mr. Okay, Sixth. case V23002. I see we go to staff recommendations for approval. Uh, second. Yeah, I got a motion from Mr. Sixman to approve variance V23002 with the staff recommended conditions and a second from Mr. Uh, Costa. Um, In, there's no staff recommendations. Okay, no staff recommended conditions. Um, any discussion on the motion? Nope. Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Ms. Shelley, could I get the next case, please? Yes, sir. Case number V-23-003, a variance to the maximum fence requirements on urban single-family residential R9 zoned property. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. And this is Mr. Hanson. Yes, sir. Michael Hanson, Planning Development Services, once again. This particular variance uh, case is for a fence on the property here at Cardinal Boulevard that's kind of unique in its circumstances is that the fence in question is on a retaining wall. Due to the natural grade of the particular property, it drops down lower than the grade of where the center line for Cardinal Boulevard is. By my, my original calculations were six feet. I spoke with the applicant briefly during our, our lunch break. He said that he had it surveyed at 8.2 feet as far as a, the, the, the drop. And because of the way our fence or our or, or, or section of the code that deals with fences, 72282 reads, 
it limits fences to a height, maximum height of six feet. So because of, and that's taking into consideration the grading on both sides of the fence. Because of the grading on this particular property, there's portions of the fence that exceed the six feet all the way up to a maximum of 10 feet, particularly <coughs> where the double gate is along Cardinal Avenue, or, or Cardinal Boulevard there. It says Cardinal Boulevard on this particular site plan, but uh, it will, the ground drops down so the grade changes so that way the applicant does have a portion of fence that is actually 10 feet high. Now, the fence in question here was also an effort to replace a previously permitted fence in the same configuration. The applicant built a fence in 2007 that was permitted after the fact, that was a wooden fence. It received storm damage due to Hurricane Matthew in 2016. The applicant tried to have permanent repairs done, but then during the process for that, Hurricane Irma came by, did further storm damage. Ultimately, in 2018, the fence was replaced with a white vinyl PVC fence in the same configuration that had been previously permitted in 2014 after the fact for that wooden fence. Uh, because the fence had been put up, the vi white vinyl fence had been put up without a permit, it all, uh, there was a attempt at a permit, but it ultimately expired. So the applicant was informed that they needed a permit. So they applied for a permit. This permit application was issued by the county. However, it felt its final inspection, resulting in the applicant applying for the variance. Since such time, that permit has expired. So there's currently no pending permit on the particular property dealing with the fence. The variance is still being heard to address the height of the fence so that the applicant after this can go to uh, permitting to have a fence permitted in its current configuration. Given the history of the fence and the fact that it's in the same configuration as what was previously permitted, staff made a recommendation for approval based on the five criteria of our variance criteria. I did receive an email from an adjacent property neighbor located at 4262 Cardinal Boulevard that has lived as the neighbor of the applicant for the last 14 years, stating that, and you can see them there, the ones right on the south of the property there, that they have no issue with the configuration of the applicant's fence. Uh, I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Any questions for staff? Mr. Feller. One quick question. Um, you said the fence was permitted before. Did they not have the height restriction at that time? Was it not required or was it just, or, or was it not that tall before? So the fence when it was permitted, well, originally built in 2007, permitted after the fact in 2014, still had the same requirements for the permitting as far as the grading. The, from my looking at the permits, I did not see any measurements as far as, you know, the, the heights as far as you know, grading or anything like that as far as elevation goes. But the fence that was permitted and past final inspection that they replaced, uh, the, the wooden fence for ease of understanding, uh, was on retaining walls, just like the current white vinyl PVC fence. So the current fence is in the same configuration as what ultimately was permitted. Interesting. Okay, any other questions for staff? Is the applicant present? Good afternoon, sir. Could I get Hi. your name and address for the record? I'm Tom Smith, 4256 Cardinal Boulevard in Wilbur by the Sea, Florida. All right, so you've heard the staff report. Anything you'd like to add to it? No, sir. I think it's it. Okay. Other than if they want to take my property for right away and eminent domain, they can have it. <laughs> <laughs> for the right price. And you won't come back for a variance? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we don't have any public participation forms for this case, so <laughs> we're going to uh, close the forum for public participation over a commission discussion or a motion. I'll, I'll make a motion. 
uh, to approve variance uh, V23003 as it successfully meets all five criteria. And the staff conditions? And uh, along with the two staff recommended conditions. Second. Okay, I got a, a motion from Mr. Bender on case V23003 to approve the variance with the um, staff recommended conditions and a second from Ms. Shelley. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. I get the next case, Ms. Shelley. Case V-23-005, variances to the assess to the accessory dwelling unit regulations and minimum side yard setbacks on a transitional agricultural A3 zoned property. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. And this is Mr. Shams. Hi, good afternoon. Steve Shams, Planning Development Services. Uh, this variance is on A3 zoned property um, and is developed with a 1999 square foot single family home built in 2003 and a permitted uh, 1,440 square foot barn built in 2007. The barn shares a concrete driveway with the home and contains a second story loft slash storage room that consists of 750 square feet of storage with a 74 foot uh, second story deck, 74 square foot second story deck. The barn was modified at living quarters on the existing second floor by the previous homeowner without obtaining the required permits. Uh, this resulted in an unpermitted ADU, accessory dwelling unit, and subsequent code enforcement violations in May of this year. The applicant purchased the property in January 2022 and was unaware it was unpermitted. Uh, the applicant is now trying to resolve the current code violations, which uh, were issued because the owner was using the space as a short-term rental through Airbnb. Uh, there's two variances total. The first variance is to allow um, an existing ADU facade to be located 13 feet in front of the home. And variance two is to reduce the north side yard from 25 feet to 21 feet for the existing unpermitted ADU. He has proposed the variances in order to obtain the required permits to bring the existing ADU into compliance. Um, the staff did receive a letter of support from a neighbor who um, didn't have any issues with what was being proposed. Overall, uh, staff recommends denial as the variances, both one and two, failed to meet one of the five criteria relating to a special condition, as there is none on this property because the structure was permitted as a barn and the ADU was never the intended use. However, should the PLDRC find evidence to uh, approve the variance, staff recommends two conditions. The first is that it cannot exceed its current size or location as depicted on the variant site plan. And the applicant shall obtain a building permit for the ADU upon approval of the variances. And I'm available for comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions? Hearing none, is the applicant present? Nope. Okay, we're, uh, we do not have any public participation forms for this case. Anyone in the audience like to speak to this case? Hearing none. What is the letter of support? Yeah. yeah. We got the letter there. Yeah, that was in the paperwork. Okay. Just, Just a clarification, Mr. Just Chair. The applicant's not present. He has, is on active military leave and was unable to attend. Okay. It's a crazy duty. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay, we're gonna close the floor for public participation, open up for commission discussion or a motion. I'm prepared to make motion. Go ahead. Case V twenty three dash zero zero five, uh that we approve variances one and two, uh with the staff recommended conditions two Second. one. Yep. Okay, I got a motion from Mr. Feller to approve variances one and two for V twenty three zero zero five with the staff recommended conditions and a second from Ms. Shelley. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Ms. Shelley, could I get the next case, please? Yes, sir.
Case number Z-23-001, rezoning from the urban single-family residential R2 zoning classification to the urban single-family residential R4 zoning classification. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. And this is Mr. Shan. All right, good afternoon. So this case is a rezoning of a uh, 0.64 acre, which is approximately uh, 27 1,878 square foot property to R4. Uh, because of the smaller lot size requirement, the R2 requires a lot size of 12,500 square feet and the R4 requires 7,500 square feet. The applicant is looking, um, is looking to uh, rezone the property to subdivide the parcel um, in order to, de to deed the new parcel created from the subdivision to his daughter to build her home. Uh, the rezoning is consistent with the urban low intensity future land use designation as it is conditionally compatible. Um, ULI allows density of three units on the current property and this request would only result in two, one existing and one proposed. Um, it's also consistent with surrounding properties and the change results in one more dwelling unit so impacts are minimal. Overall, staff recommends forwarding to the County Council for approval and I'm avail available for comment or questions. Thank you, Mr. Chan. Mr. Bender? The, 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 the creation of this second lot, will it meet all of the necessary setbacks? Yes, it will, sir. Thanks. Any other questions for staff? Hearing none, is the applicant present? You want to come forward, sir? My name is Randy Pearson. I live at uh, 963 Facio Road. And I'm trying to get it rezoned for my daughter for, you know, how property is right now. Right. And young kids getting started, they need all the help they can get. So, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, I know the feeling. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. Does anyone have any questions or for the applicant? All right, so let's see if we've got any public participation. Do we have, we do not have any public participation forms for this case. I'd like to make a motion. Speak to this case. Hearing none, I'll accept the motion. Go ahead. I recommend that we forward the rezoning application mm -hmm. case number Z-23001 to County Council for final action with a recommendation of approval. Second. <clears throat> okay, I got a motion from Ms. Shelley to forward the rezoning application case number Z-23001 to the County Council for final action the recommendation of approval and a second from Mr. Sixma. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, Ms. Shelley, can I get the next case, please? Yes, sir. Case number V-23-009, variance to separate non-conforming lots on prime agriculture A1 zoned property. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. And this is Mr. Hansen. Can I get a staff report on that? Yes, sir. Michael Hansen, Planning Development Services, once again. Now, this particular variance request is interesting where it is a A1 zone property. However, it's non-conforming. Uh, it was created in its current configuration in 1983 where it was deeded off from the, where if you look at the aerial there, you can see how the subject property from parcel A. So parcel A broke it off in 1983, where it's been in its current configuration since then. Further in 1992, parcel B broke off of parcel A, which now bifurcates the subject parcel from parcel A, making it a recombination impractical to recombine the subject property with parcel A. Additionally, parcel C broke off of parcel A in 1998 as well. So that's why the variance is requesting to separate from all three of the parcels, parcel A, B, and C. Uh, as it is currently configured, the parcel is approximately two acres in the A1 zoning classification with the AR future land use. The applicant or owner of the property uh, attempted to do a vested rights determination with our land development activity. Their 
application was denied. So since then, they've applied for an overall development plan with our land development activity to vest the right or vest the property so that it would be formally vested to be able to be built on. Uh, additionally, however, the DRC issued a notice of intent to approve that overall development plan contingent on the approval of a variance for the PLDRC to separate the non-conforming lots. I did get contacted yesterday by an adjacent property owner who's here to speak during public uh, participation as well. However, in the review of the criteria for granting the variance, staff found that this particular property met all five of the required criteria. I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Any questions for staff? Go ahead, Mr. Ben. Remember you were saying that the county council passed, would this not have, this would not be applicable to that? No, this one wouldn't have been applicable to the ordinance that just was approved on Tuesday. Thank you. All right, is the applicant prison? Good afternoon, good if I could get your name and address for the record. Jennifer Scott, 1245 Aradonda Grant Road, Gillian Springs, Florida. You've heard the staff report, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, no, we had just purchased that property back in 1983 um, with my parents planning on building with them and taking care of them, but it didn't work out. So we have the property now and uh, realized it wasn't vested. So I've been going through um, the motions to get that done. All right. We do have some public participation forms. I will give you an opportunity to come back and address the concerns that anyone may have okay. uh, after they've spoken. So if you just want to have a seat, we'll get that out of the way. Okay, we do have, so this is what everybody's here for. Okay. Uh, Mr. Roy Bloomquist. He's not here? He must have left. Okay, Miss Lynn Bradley. Good afternoon, ma'am. Would you like to speak to this case? Yeah, if I you would. get your name um, and address for the record. My name is Lynn Bradley. My maiden name is Blumquist. I live at 5815 West Street, Deleon Springs. Okay. What would you like to say to this case? <clears throat> Back in 1983, Mr. Briggs approached my father about buying, buying a couple of acres from him on our property. And he told him that he was not interested in selling. He bought it to be out in the country and to have that land. And so Mr. Briggs left and came back a little while later and asked him if he could um, just buy the land to use for farming. He didn't want to build a house on it. And my father told him that he was more than welcome to use a property farm on. He could use it for free. And um, he said he didn't do business that way and that he wanted to buy the property. So my dad sold him the three or two acres for a thousand dollars and told him this was in lieu of if he ever were to get rid of it that he would sell it back to the family for the same money we he paid for it and so that's where that stood um we all stand by why we moved to florida and bought that big a piece of land because we wanted to be out there in the country and i don't think it's fair that for somebody to build a house on two acres of land when you really have to have 10 acres of land to build. I don't want somebody else coming in and buying 10 acres and changing it into five houses. That's not what we're out there for. And we're just trying to preserve our area and keep it the way it is. That's it. Okay, any questions? And Mr. Feller. You said a few things here that I'm not sure. So you're the original landowner of all this land? My father, my parents, we moved down here from New Jersey. Okay. And actually the Briggs moved down the same time we did. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know names Briggs. I don't know who that is, but the, the person who bought the property. Was my father. Was your, bought the two acres that we're talking about? He bought 65 acres. And then your father sold this two acres to these people or to some, to these people? To, yes. And you were saying something about it being bought back and all that stuff, but you don't have Well, because my father really didn't want to sell the land. But he did sell. And Oliver talked, told him he wasn't going to build a house. All he wanted to do was farm. Obviously, all things can change, but he sold the land. 
Right. That's what I needed. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Thank you, ma'am. Okay, then we have a Keith Jekyll. Good afternoon, sir. Can I get uh, your name Keith and address? Keith Jekyll. I live at 1710 Arundano Grant Road. Okay. Elion Springs. And I uh, cross the street from the property in question here. Mm -hmm. I got a couple issues with changing the variance or zoning. One is I bought my home and property five and a half years ago looking for a place where I could raise a few animals. Agricultural area that I didn't, after checking the zoning, I decided it wasn't going to become residential. I'd be safe, you know, with what I wanted to do there. And uh, now I'm getting the impression they want to put a house on the prop on that small piece of property, and it has to be close to the road because of the wetlands and to the back end of it. And okay, that my other concern is that we have an abundance of wildlife in that area, everything from deer to bears and, and, and everything in between. And I noticed living there that all these animals migrate right along the edge of my property and right through that property that they want to build on. And if uh, they put a house there, those animals are going to have to find a different place to cross the road or change their habits. And this road is very narrow with blind curves in it, right where we're at. And we already have a fair share of animal car collisions on it. <coughs> so I don't think that's a real good idea to be putting a house there. Those are my concerns. Okay. Any questions for the speaker? You live at this house across the street? Yes, five and a half. So you have a residence? Five and a half years. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you coming. And then I have a Tammy DeGron. You got to give it to Miss Ray to my left. They would all have, have it. Yeah, anything you submit becomes public record and we have to keep. Okay. Right. Let me grab my other. It's already, <laughs> it's already started. <laughs> it started at nine o'clock. <laughs> uh, the opportunity. Um, my name is Tammy DeGrom. I live at fourteen eighty-five Arredondo Grant Road, Deleon Springs, Florida. Um, I, we've been there for forty-one years. I purchased the property uh, back in eighty-one. Um, actually, researched to make sure that it was what we wanted, which was ten acres, the A one. Um, and so um, I'm opposed to the variance based on the fact that uh, I don't want our lifestyle to change. She I'm sorry, I'm, I'm opposed, yeah, Thank based you. to that. And I've submitted, um, whoops, I've submitted 26 other signatures of adjoining property owners that are opposed to it. Um, first, um, if you look at, there's some, a couple of deeds there, the 1983 and the 2006 deed I included. Um, both of those uh, say subject to the same conditions, and at the bottom it says also subject to any existing zoning regulations. So the original deed stated that, and then also the deed um, where it was deeded from Mr. Briggs and, and additional family members to Jennifer and uh, David Scott. Uh, it also says subject to easement and restrictions of record. Um, I believe when we came and purchased the property, we looked into what the zoning was and what uh, was required based on the zoning, and it was 10 acres. We had to have 10 acres to build. There was no exception, and it's still that way. 
Um, and what I'd like to do is uh, move forward to the criteria. Um, well, two things that were left out of the packet. Um, I thought it was kind of odd that there was no environmental review or anything about land development, because it's my understanding that that's part of the process, that as you know, somebody asks for a variance, especially due to you know, really wanting to maintain the integrity and because of the gopher turtles and you know, the, the wetlands and all of those things. So um, I included those. I got a copy of those environmental review um, and also uh, the um, land uh, development review. We know that it was denied on May 2nd, otherwise we wouldn't be here you know, for a variance. So, um, but it does mention about the property contains gopher tortoise habitat. One thing that I found kind of interesting uh, as I reviewed some of the information, nothing was mentioned about wetlands. And there is a, probably almost an acre of wetlands, so it really reduces the property buildable portion probably to an acre. So it's kind of misleading when it says it's two acres to build on. There are wetlands, and the surveys do show that. Um, part of the last part, I know you all are familiar with the zoning classifications, A1 and what ag agricultural resources um, consist of, uh, maintaining cultivation of the ranching and all that stuff. Um, but what I'd like to really address is in reference to um, the, the uh, zoning uh, board, if you look on page three, uh, number one, it says special conditions and circumstances where the criteria was met. Well, the deed wasn't created, the legal lot wasn't created correctly from the get-go. It was, it was back then in 83, you had to have five acres, so there was only two. So it didn't meet the criteria then. It doesn't meet the criteria in, in 2006 when it was repurchased from the dad to the daughter. Um, so it doesn't meet the, you know, the criteria now. So I'm a little confused how the staff found that to be met under number one. Under number three, where it says little interpretation of the provisions, um, in 193, again, you needed the five acres. It didn't meet it. It never has been. It's never been a conforming lot. Um, and so ever since it was created, and also the land development validates that. Um, if you go to four, the variance granted is the minimum variance that will um, make possible. And you all can read that. Um, as uh, Lynn had mentioned, when Mr. Briggs, we lived out there, and Mr. Briggs frequented the property, and he did have a garden on the property. Um, he never attempted to do, do anything, to my knowledge, anything more than have a garden. And he did frequent it. He, they lived right down the street, and he came and he actually gardened on the property. But it was never, never mentioned that a home would ever be built on that property. Um, and then it goes on to say the Volusia County Comprehensive Plan Ordinance. If you look at page 13, the comprehensive ordinance um, is very clear to say this is agricultural resource. There's no exception there. It specifically says that, and it's my understanding that there's a map that goes over this in order to maintain this agricultural property and to keep the integrity um, of agriculture and to pre, you know help people and maintain um, agricultural property I and to cut preserve you short. it. Yeah. I okay. Cut you short. Okay. Well, anyway, that's okay. very important that that map that has not been adhered to in reference to uh, number five. Okay. So thank you for your time. Thank Any you questions? so much. So thank you for coming forward. Yeah. Any questions? For I just want to point something out. Uh, since she brought up the environmental review and was talking about the gopher turtles, you, you also noticed it on the last paragraph that uh, they had no objection to the variance request, EP. Right. I understand Okay. That. All right. I just yeah, want to make sure of that. On that also, Mr. Costa did mention that there would have to be some uh, modifications based on the fact that there are gopher turtles on there. I mean, it's just, you know, a, a, a part of the property, but the wetlands. Yeah, it is exactly anywhere in Volusia County. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, Kim Conaway. <laughs> I got a call from the other one. <laughs> uh, I know everybody's tired and we've all been here a long time, but appreciate you listening to me. Name and address for the record. Kim Conaway, 1515 Arredondo Grant Road to Leon Springs, Florida. Okay. Um, I'm here in, in opposite, I border, directly border this parcel to the west. My fence touches their proposed, well, the actual land that we're talking about here. Uh, came there early 80s, maybe 81 or two with very little money and I hope to raise my kids and stuff in the country, which we did. And uh, land was considerably cheaper than it is now and it's never became a, uh, become a money issue with me. I don't want to subdivide my land. My life's work has been to hopefully hand it off to my kids. Having said that, uh, we were there early on when Arredondo Grant was still a dirt road. And most of the parcels out there now are still fairly large. 
And uh, this piece in question, uh, like I said, it borders me. And one of the one of my main concerns is uh, water issue. Uh, the natural flow of water leaves my property through this parcel. Eventually, ends up in Lake Diaz. Okay, I walked over there with my daughter yesterday just to looking at this parcel in question, and they have trees with ribbons on it, tagged, and in my estimation, that either means they're gonna remove them or they're gonna keep them, assuming that this passes, of course. And uh, I'm afraid any disruption on a parcel this small would uh, actually lead to that water backing up on my place. I make my living one of the very few in in this county that makes 100% of their living in agriculture. It's a tough, tough deal. And if that water backs up on my grass, it's gonna be detrimental to my livestock. And um, I imagine that's about it. I'm sincere when I ask you to deny this. We did not move out there, nor have any of my neighbors sought to subdivide their places. Uh, we want to keep our lifestyle intact, and I appreciate your consideration on this matter. Yes, Mr. Filler, go ahead. So you just said something that you and none of your neighbors wanted to subdivide. Why? Yes. Did anybody talk to this when he was selling off his land? I mean, that's my, I, I keep hearing that. I'm just trying to understand it. I'm not trying to be argumentative or anything, but I've heard two people say that they've been there since the early 80s, and here this person has sold off his land, but I keep hearing that nobody wants to sell off their land. So... I, I, I'm just curious. I, I mean, can't speak for Mr. Bloomquist. I believe he's passed on the man that, that did offer this land to this man and eventually sold it. I can't speak for him or what his intent was, but I know the, the rest of the Bloomquist family have not sold anything off. Or, or to, my, to my knowledge, they haven't. And to my knowledge, they have not sought to seek anything off. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to figure, you know, yes, figure out. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mary Conway. Uh, we're we're going to, I'll give you a chance to, or is you're the, no, you're not the applicant. Okay. Mary Conway. Uh, Hello. Just speak to that, Mr. Feller. Um, Name. The, name and address. For oh, the my name is Mary Conaway, and I live at 1515 Arredondo Grant Road. Right. We live uh, adjacent to the property. Okay, you can. We have um, 40 acres. Okay. And to speak to that, sir, they, Mr. Bloomquist did, uh, I w we were there um, after the fact, but he did sell off two acres, but he expected to get it back. It was a friendship relationship. And since then, he sold none. The next generation, the third generation, is still on the property. So they, ex and they're expanding. So they, I believe he still has 63 cut up because his daughters have some, his son has some, now the grandson has some. So I don't think his intention was ever to get rid of his land. Uh, if, if so, we would have bought it. <laughs> so we, we're very interested. In it. But can I go on? Because my minutes. But that, I think the two acres is. It was not like because he wanted to get rid of his land. All right, so um, I want to um, please establish the timeline that in in '83 when uh, the Scotts did not they were not on the deed, or just her parents were, and it was just to pl to have the garden. So we went from there to '92. Um, they sold um, a piece to Lynn to the daughter that already talked. And then, um, so, so that's the timeline. And then she bought it in 2006, or he, her, she and her husband. And um, it said on their, her form, and I'm only reading what her form was submitted, that um, she wanted to build a home. Well, there's been a lot of years, and she's never, to, to my knowledge, approached any of the adjacent landowners to make it so that she could build a home. There's been no, no, nothing done, done in that direction. So, um, I conclude that Miss the Scotts bought a Kia, and now they'd like to turn it into a Ferrari, um, because 
Her property has not been altered in any way. Her submitted form um, states she wanted to build a home. She didn't build it. And so as far as I know, um, nothing's changed on her part. But her land has not been affected at all by the subsequent sales um, that when he split it up to, to his, his children. It was two acres of woods and wetlands when her dad bought it surrounded by 10 acres A1 properties, and it still remains that today. It's unchanged. Um, and, and I'd like to speak really quick about um, on her form. Also, she says it's, it's unusable. That's not accurate. Maybe in her world it's unusable, although I don't believe it is because I think she lives on an agricultural piece of property you know, down the road from us. And, you, and uses it in that way. So I don't, I, it is certainly not unusable. We're using the, every square inch of the land right beside it and, and prospering financially in that way. Um, not well, but we're doing it. And, and so, I mean, we're doing it fine. Don't, okay. So unfortunately, in, as I see it, Mr. Hansen has gotten creative trying to attempt to help Mrs. Scott. She placed the property for sale, and according to a real estate agent, sold it for $85,000, much higher than a typical A1 pr property would sell. He talks about, Mr. Hansen talks about A, circumventing C, versus D, all that stuff. I don't see what it has relevance. It absolutely has no, no bearing on it. She still has the original two acres. It's not changed. She could sell it. In fact, I've gone to her twice to try to buy it years through these years. Um, I've gotten not even a conversation past her, past her children. And that's fine. I have no, no, no qualms there. And I, don't, I see nothing wrong with someone making financial gain from a purchase. But in this, in this way, she's harming us, the, the, the area people around her, uh, around us. This is going to be a detriment to our way of life and, and us. So for her now to um, want to turn, she still owns her Kia, and it's a Kia. It's not up to our, our loss to turn it into something much more valuable and, and bring people in on, on living. In fact, if you look at your um, surveys, please, um, it shows that after you take off the wetlands and the buffer, it's reduced to uh, one point three acres, or 1.03, I'm not certain. So it's much smaller. And according to what I've, I've actually been to the county, I started right away. Um, the day I saw the sign go up, I've been to the county four times, spoken to four different people. And each time I was told, no worry, it's not, it's, there's not 10 acres, there's wetlands involved. Then they took out measurements. There's some really nifty little mm. things they have. Um, and said there's no way it can be built on by the time they uh, qualify for, you know, do the, set, the setbacks and stuff. So I walked away each time and I kept going back because I was real nervous about this. Okay. And, I've, um, I've so, let you go over two minutes. So, okay. Then that was answering Mr. Feller's question. So if I could get you just to wrap it up for me, please. Oh, certainly. So, so that's it. That, that I, I really don't think there's any, been any harm. I know the attitude of the county man, sir, over here, has been that she's, it's, it's, she's harm, been harmed in some way and kind of stuck, but she's certainly not. There are many people, I believe Lynn's, she, she could sell it and, and um, above the, the, even the real agriculture value of it. And um, she, she did get what she's, nothing's changed from what she originally bought. You know, it's nobody's harmed her in any way or changed something that limits her ability or access or use uh, of the property. Okay. So, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Okay, that pretty much covers uh, any questions for the speaker. All right. Thank you thank so you, much. Thank you, sir. Um, we don't have any other public participation forms for this case. Does anybody else would like to speak to this case? I'll give the applicant an opportunity to address any of the concerns the property owners may have or the speakers may have. So um, I'll address, I'll address Lynn, what, what Lynn, Miss Bradley, mm -hmm. she said. So I don't know exactly what my dad and, and Papa Roy, and, and we're, good, we're good friends and we'll always be good friends. Mm -hmm. um, but, <clears throat> I know she said that we paid that we paid it. I I helped my dad with the property. I gave him a thousand dollars towards it, and 
my understanding was we were to build a home on there. And that was back then. I don't know what Papa Roy said with my father. Um, I know my dad, I know we paid, that was $8,000 for the property, so. Well, no, that's okay. You don't have to show it to us. If you want to make it part of the, uh, uh, it, but if you give it to them, it's going to become public record and they will keep, they will keep it. Okay. okay. Well, anyways, so I wanted to make a correction on that. Okay. Um, and then, um, what, let me ask you this. Yes, when you sir. purchased the property, did you know what the zoning was on the property? I didn't. No, I didn't. You think I, your dad I can did. say I didn't, but, you know, that was something that my dad handled. Okay. And the reason I mentioned that is because if he knew the zoning on the property, he knew the zoning when you purchased it, and if he were to check the zoning at that time, it was an unbuildable piece of property. Mm -hmm. And if he wanted to buy it specifically for farming, obviously, it didn't make a difference. That's well, the reason I'm asking. Yeah, but I'll, you know, we went in on the property together. We were talking about building a home down there at that time, back in 1983. 1983 so, is when he purchased the property? Yes, that's when my dad purchased the property. And then he could, in 2006, because um, I took care of my parents, um, anyways, uh, my dad had quit claim the property into my husband in my name. Okay. And um, as far as Ms. Conaway says, she contacted me. I never received any contact from her. I'm sorry to say that, Ms. Conway, but I never received any. Well, I never, uh, we're not going to go back. And forth. We're I not going to go back and forth here, ma'am. This is the first day, ma'am. Okay, I'm sorry. We're not going to go back and forth. All right. Well, okay. Um, so, is, do we have any, other, Mr. Feller? You had a question? Not today. Not today. I'm going to go for staff. Okay. And and I did go get an EIA. I did everything that was requested to me by the county when I went in to have the property variance. I did not cohort or anything that was the way it was put with Mr. Hansen. I went in there and I asked about getting the property vested. At first, we wanted to um, sell the property. Okay. Because. Well, I think. Well, my brother, that's it was to help my brother out. My brother had died back in January. Okay. So, anyways, but we had we had plans, so we, we put the property up for sale, and I had no idea. Um, Roy Bunquist, um, I talked to his wife Cynthia, and because uh, Cynthia said, if you ever want to sell the property, come to me first. So I called Cynthia, and I said, Cynthia, we need to sell the property. You told me to call whenever you whenever we had planned that, and so she said, "Well, right now we're not we don't we're not interested in buying it." And so I contacted her. I probably should have contacted Lynn or 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 Ma Blumquist, but you know, from what I understood, it's what when Cindy said contact me, that's what I did. Okay. And so, you know. I'm here, I've got two acres of property, and they said, you know, with, you know, I can farm. I can't farm it. And so we put it up to be sold, and I have a buyer for it, and I've, from what's, you know, to get it vested has cost me quite a bit of money, and I've done everything according to what the county has requested me to do, and so that's where I'm at. Okay. Any questions or comments for the applicant? Okay, let's see where it goes. Okay, I'm going to close the floor for public participation and open up for commission discussion. A question if you'd like to ask. Can you bring up the um, stats 13 and 14 for me? Very quickly. Well, we've actually closed the floor, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Either the zoning classification sheet or the future land use paper, the green. I 
page 12 and page 13. 12 and 13. Mm -hmm. To the right and down is a parcel that's slightly bigger. It's between parcel, it's to the right of parcel 5033 and Route 50. I don't know if we have a pointer on it. Yeah, up from there uh, and then to the left. That little piece right there. Is that developed with a house? And is it a single family? Is it a lot? That's a big piece. Isn't it? It's a big piece. I mean, it's probably twice the size of the one we're talking about, but it's not, it's not 10 acres. I thought it was this whole piece here. I'm talking about, no, they've got it on the plan. Looking at the aerials, I, I don't see that it's necessarily developed with the house. It looks like there could possibly be some structures from the other parcel on it, though. about this side. Right, so is that, is that adjacent? Is that, a, is that part of another parcel, or is that its own parcel? So the one you're talking about to the east, uh, immediately to the east of the subject property is in the staff, referred in the staff report as parcel B. That was one that broke off in uh, 1992 from parcel A, the, the original parent property. It's on the wrong but it's on both sides. It's on the wrong, the he's pointing the wrong. No, 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 he's pointing to the wrong. He's pointing no, the wrong it's, it's on the north side of Arundano Grant. The one that your pointer is over right now. Is that part of any of the parcels we're talking oh, about? Oh, that, that particular property there that that's, doesn't have any common ownership with the subject property. It's it's not part of these. I don't want to, yeah, and I don't want to take But that, that property that you're looking at, I believe that is developed with the house. And that's what yes. I'm trying to get an understanding of is there's a, there's a less than 10 acre parcel that has a house developed on it that's not part of the property that we're talking about. That's correct. A little house, but it's there because it's got a part of these different parcel numbers. If someone goes in and starts starts selling off parts of their property, it doesn't make it a legal subdivision, correct? That is correct. So this property owner went through the um, the ODP process. So that's um, what does the O stand for? Overall development plan. So it's the it's the it's if you've been through the process. It is um, kind of site plan approval that says, usually it deals with subdivisions. I want to create a subdivision in this particular way. So it's, it's prior to filing your construction plans or something like that. So that's how you got um, a, a contingent ODP um, that is contingent upon the approval of separating these non-conforming lots. So they went through that process and got um, staff comments and um, a contingent approval by uh, the development review committee. So that's kind of the first step into creating a legal subdivision. Um, here it's kind of odd because the subdivision was already created back in the 80s um, and they're trying to, trying to fix it. Um, because whenever we bring forward a, a variance to separate lots, those lots pre-existed the, um, you know, the zoning requirements. Here, uh, it was just kind of created, and you know, someone owns it, and this is they they went through the steps to get a uh, an ODP so that they can know what they're dealing with prior to it coming before this board um, to basically formally separate the lots. I guess my question is: is Was this parcel? created before the zoning requirement came in with the 10 acres? Yes, at the time, the A1 had a five acre minimum. Okay. So it still wasn't, it didn't meet the requirement, right? It would have been under the five acre requirement at the time because the parcel is two acres. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Anybody want to make a discussion on we're going? Anybody else would like to speak to this case? Hmm. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's four. Something I'd like to say before you do this is. If there was, there was other two-acre parcels all through here, 
Oh, I'm sorry. I said there was another two acre parcels all through here. I don't think I'd have a problem with it, but I'm very familiar with this property out there. It's all ranches and large parcels. I, I'm not comfortable with this. No. And, uh, all right, where are we going with it, guys? Let's go back to staff. You're recommending approval. Tell us why. In 30 seconds or less. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, in 30 seconds or less, uh, uh, looking at number one, the criteria for the special circumstance condition is the unique shape of the property. The fact that land development's taking a look at it, they're willing to issue a notice of intent to approve and invest the property based on here. So and they're, they're ready to go on if they're just waiting on you. Otherwise, the, the remaining criteria were, were, were all met as well. So it meets all the criteria from a staff, county staff level? Yes, sir. I think that's my answer. Well, you got the future land use as agricultural resource. How small of acreage is in an agricultural resource? I'm on two in AR. The agricultural resource future land use has a minimum or maximum of one dwelling unit per 10 acres. But the AR designation doesn't, you don't have to have 10 acres. I have two acres and I'm AR and I'm, I'm legal. Yeah, so I, I, I'm just trying to get a clarification on that. The AR allows for two acre home sites. Yeah, there, there are A2 and A3 port, uh, zone properties that are compatible with the future land use compatibility matrix with the AR as well. There is. Conditionally. Okay. Yeah. Well. Okay. Don't, don't. Well, we're talking about future land I'm use. I'm talking about future land yeah. use. Future land use. We're, we're, okay. So. And it's two acres. So I don't know. I. Yeah. I mean. We. We sit here and listen to developers. <laughs> pitch hundreds of houses and we want to build one house on two acres and we're a little I, I get it I understand the area but yeah you got to consider where it's at I, I and I tried to get out there and I did not get out to this yeah. one and I will say I, I, I understand what you're saying as I look through there Stoney I do but I go back and I I, I feel like there's a proper I understand do we listen to the community the neighborhood yeah, well I mean I, I, I I'm with you yeah, but I'm it's you have you. a you have a valid you have a transfer property here yeah. cash was exchanged deeds were signed right back in the time, regardless of what, whatever, whatever chicken coop discussions was made about, I'll buy it back for you for a dollar, you know, 20, that, all that goes out the window. It, we come down to looking at black and white and black and white, they have a, a, a two acre piece of property to basically tell them you cannot do a darn thing with it is violating some property rights. And we just, so I, I go, that's why I asked staff, you're telling me to recommend it. Tell me why. And he gave me all five criteria met from the county standpoint. We just put a 3,000 square foot house on a, on a lot in Bethune Beach without any problems. And we're all, we're over here saying we're gonna have a problem with the house on two. And I understand EP, I mean, I, EP, this is a big thing for me. So, I mean, I, I, there's, there's room to build a house on there without affecting the wetlands, but. I, I, don't, I, don't, see a, I, I don't see a fear here of, you know, uh, all of a sudden this row becoming a D.R. Horton community. And I think that may be part of the, the rural, you know, problem. The 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 the, answer, the mindset is like, okay, the first one goes at two. Who else? What? Everybody else can start subdividing, and that's not the case. This just happened to be grandfathered in from way back. Not that you can now go and all the the joining parcels say, I'm going to start chopping my 40 acres up into two acre parcels and selling them off. That is not the case here whatsoever. But I think one thing we need to, and I'm just throwing this out there, but it's something that, um, and I've heard uh, probably not the same exact discussion with the same thing going on, but I've heard uh, a discussion on this board before, the concern about what is happening um, to our agricultural lands in this community as far as, and, and we've seen it with people inheriting property. I'm dealing with this in another state, inheriting a large farm and, and heirs uh, don't want to participate in farming. And of course you want to allow people to have access to, or you know, be able to use the property. So that gets subdivided into smaller parcels. 
and um, we are losing. And I'm just throwing, this is not, but it's, it's it, and again, you know, we heard the Conways, their, their goal is to have their children do it or whoever was up here. And I mean, that's well and good, but when you're dead and gone, it's hard to say what your children will do because of, of certain needs and certain, and then as it, in here it goes down, my point being, as I'm going on and on, I think it's something, um, and I'm not sure how to deal with it, but I think it's something as a very, um, very agricultural county, actually, as most of you know probably better than I do, um, that there has to be a way to somehow, and I, I wrestle with property rights as well, um, but some way to protect these larger farms. And um, I know where I'm dealing with it in another state, the big thing is now corporate farms where some big company comes in and buys the property. So, and I've, I've heard several people up here talking about that, um, wanting to be, be very careful about our rural lands. And yes, this is two acres. Um, you know, my brothers asked me how many acres I had. I live in Daytona Beach. I said, oh, they don't have acres here. Um, but um, anyway, that's just something to come out and maybe discuss as a staff or as we move forward, because these are sort of issues are going to come up more and more in these areas that are um, uh, zoned in this particular way. So I'm not saying up or down, but I'm just saying it's something that we, I think, as a board need to really look at. Um, and I don't want to, to treat them in a piecemeal fashion as they come one by one by one, but kind of look at that as, as perhaps a future policy or, or how we want to deal with that in this uh, county. Thank you. Thanks. Chair, one more quick, and this is not to open it up for public again, but wasn't this property for sale? Did any, I mean, I assume it was open for anybody to purchase. I believe she said it was under contract. At one point. Yeah. Pending, pending, that's what started the whole separation. The whole story. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I, I did receive phone call. Well, as I mentioned, I received a phone call on this issue, and it was about uh, people. If they had realized, they would have made offers on the property. So right, but I mean, any I'm, I'm just, anybody had an opportunity to buy this property, not just the not just the person who it's under contract with. I mean, values based on many different things, but yeah, okay. anybody had an opportunity to buy this piece of property. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, we've closed the floor. We we have to move on. I, 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 Mr. Chair, none of this is being recorded. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I can't, ma'am. It's not going on the record, so. It's not helping the you know. case. Unfortunately. Um, whatever decision decision is made today is always an appeal process, so um, just keep that in mind. So, but I'm not sure it's going to go to go anywhere. But I'm prepared to make a motion. Okay. In case V twenty three dash zero nine, I say we, I motion that we forward or approve. Variance case number V23009. I don't think there's any conditions attached to that. No. And that's my motion. I'll second. Okay, I got a motion to approve variance V23009 from Mr. Feller and a second from Mr. Costa. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposition? No. no. Let's get a roll call. Member Feller? Aye. Member Young? Aye. Member Shelley? No. Member uh, Bender? Member Bender? Aye. <laughs> Member Costa? Aye. Member Sixma? No. Chair Mills? No. Motion carries four to three with Mills, Bender, and Shelley in opposition. No, I was, I was in opposition. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Six my Mills and Shelley in opposition. Okay, let's move on to the next one.
Ms. Shelley, can I get the next case, please? Yes, sir. Number I'm looking 13. at 13. 13. 13. That's what I thought, and I'm not seeing yeah. 13. Can I have your 13? Thank you. Hmm? Give me your 13, please. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't know what you were asking, I'm sorry. Case number V-23-013, variance to separate non-conforming lots on rural residential RR zoned property. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. And this is Mr. Hansen. Yes, uh, Michael Hansen, Planning Development Services for the final time today. Uh, the particular variance that we're looking at is another variance to separate non-conforming lots the subject property is zoned RR. It measures approximately 0.44 acres. The RR zoning classification requires at least one acre. The adjoining property that you see on the map in front of you is the one that it has common ownership with. That is approximately 0.56 acres. This kind of an interesting situation is that the properties in the current configuration as they were platted in 1955. However, the uh, property that is here for a subject property is owned by Platinum Homes, who has an agent that is also the agent of the NVG properties, which is the property or the, the company that sold the subject property to Platinum Homes. NVG properties is the owner of the adjoining property. Now, those two properties were bought together uh, and there's a history of common ownership with them going back through multiple parcel cells through multiple owners going back to 1990. Otherwise, staff made a recommendation that this particular variance request failed one of the five criteria for granting said variance, noting that the special conditions were the result of the actions of the applicant. In this particular one, noting as the applicant sold the property to their, their other company and created that, that situation for the special circumstance. Otherwise, the particular lots, the develop, surrounding developmental pattern is, is most properties along Mitnick Lake are similarly developed. I did receive a, a phone call from an a neighboring property to the north that sent a letter of opposition that I believe everybody has uh, from 318, 326 Mitnit Drive. Otherwise, I think there are other people in, available here in the public for participation as well. I'll yield for any questions the board may have. So, go ahead, Mr. Yeah, Teller. Thank I'm you. Sitting. Mr. Hansen. Late in the day. Yeah. I know, I know, but I... <laughs> I'm sitting here going through the report, <laughs> not paying attention. Go ahead. I, I, I'm looking at it. So, Mr. Hansen, when you have a second, are, are these, these, if these were purchased by, if these weren't held in common ownership, are both lots just buildable as they are? So... If the lots weren't sold in common ownership, so if there's no history of common ownership, then they would still require, uh, if they, they were legally non-conforming non lots, they theoretically could be built on as long as they could meet the RR uh, zoning setbacks. As long as they can meet the RR, which is the two acres or, but I mean, these are- Yeah, setbacks. RR is one acre, uh, I believe 40 feet in the front and rear and 15 on the sides. Even together, these don't make. Together, these properties, I think, measure actually to one acre because the subject property is 0.44 acres and the adjoining property is 0.56. Oh, I see where we're going here. Okay. Mm -hmm. But all of these have been subdivided at some point. <laughs> Uh, actually, or they the, were just purchased individually, or how did how a did lot of them were all platted in this current, current configuration from how they were platted back in 1955. Uh, there's only a couple pro uh, properties on the, the lake that were actually combined with one of the, the individuals that gave public notice via an email. He, he combined a couple properties. So a few of these have been combined to, to make a little bit larger, but a majority of the lots around this lake are. Yes, the surrounding development pattern around the lake, uh, a number of the properties are under one acre. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I personally visited this and walked walk that street. I saw several properties and houses built that were not on acres, so. <laughs> okay. Is the applicant present? I don't think your arm was injured when we started this. <laughs> <laughs> Th those two <laughs> ladies got him on the way out. <laughs> I don't recall that. <laughs> If I can get your name and address for the record and any documents that you wanted to give us as supporting documents, if you could hand to Ms. Shea over to my, Ms. Ray over to my left, and um, she will get, make sure either we see them or okay. go through them. James Letary, 110 Ranyard Road, Seven, Florida, 32771. Okay, and you will not get those back. That's okay. Okay, just hand her up. All right, sir. You've heard the staff report. It okay, so I bought these properties eight to 10 years ago. They were separate lots. I bought them to build two houses on them. And then, so I own MVJ properties. I've owned it for eight to 10 years, separate parcels, bought them separately at the same time. And then I gave me and him own platinum homes. So we're gonna build two houses there. So one's gonna stay in one company's name, the other one's in another company's name. But either way, we were still gonna build two houses there. Mm -hmm. And I have, other houses that are equal to less than the same square footage of property that we have. So I didn't see a problem with it. Pretty much it. Okay. Anyone have any questions? Yes. No, no. I bought them as separate lots from the whoever, yeah, whoever owned them eight to 10 years ago. Do you know if that was the same owner or is that different? I don't remember. I never split them myself. I bought them as split lots with the intention to build two houses because the other houses in the area had the same square footage of property or less. Or less. So again, my question would come back to Mr. Hansen. Then we don't, this would not be one of those administrative ones that the county code just passed. This is different. no, this would not meet the call or the requirements of the new ordinance that passed. All right, let's see. Well, you got some letters of opposition here, or we do have some public participation. I'll give you a chance to address the concerns that they have when you. Thank you, sir. Okay, the first one is uh, Lori Treadway. Treadway? Hello. Hello. Lori Treadway, 290 Mitnick Drive, Deltona, Florida. K. Robert Hill, uh, 296 Mitnick Drive, Deltona. Okay, you've heard. Speaking together. Okay, well, that's fine. You've got three minutes. Mm -hmm. Shoot it. <laughs> Take it away. So I'm not an adjoining neighbor, but I'm down a couple of, uh, one house. And my biggest concern is we have flooding issues in our front yard. So when we get any heavy rains, we catch a whole lot of the flood that comes through and we don't have a problem. It goes off, goes in front of our house, goes down to the, to the uh, lake. My concern is, is this property has a lot of water on it. And I'm worried if they start building this up, then we're gonna start catching even more flood water. And with Irma, our lake has caused other properties out there to flood. And then there are other properties that are islands right now um, the neighboring property being one. And so I kind of don't understand if there's two lots and they're owned by the same people or in a, two companies that can be one identity, why they can't combine them and just put one house. Because when they start, if they put two houses, I believe then that middle property is going to get a need an insane amount of field dirt, which is then going to make that water go somewhere else when we have these big um, rains. Right. Well, actually, both. I'm the property that's to the south of the first lot, and that property is going to take a huge amount of fill, which is going to upset the wetlands and the lake flow. I guess, for lack of a better word. So I'm concerned as the direct neighbor that this is going to screw up all the properties out there, and we don't want that. And the other concern um, we have is if this sets a precedence, we were told that they were one acre lots. I think a lot of the homes are one acre lots. They're supposed to be one acre lots. 
Um, but there's still a lot of raw land, and if somebody comes in and starts building on a third of an acre or a quarter of an acre, then what's going to stop other people from coming in on the other land and then building it? It's a one-way street. Kids play up and down on it all the time, my son included. And so we already have a lot more traffic than we had five years ago. Yeah. So if that happens and a lot of homes get built in there using this ability to do a variance, what's going to happen to our community where everybody walks. We don't have sidewalks, so we have to walk in the street. So it's already poses a problem with that. So those are our are my concerns. Exactly. Mine too, mine as well. Can I ask yeah, yeah, we just, I don't think we need any more homes out there. It was rural. Now it's starting to feel like I'm living in Deltona, which was not my choice. That's why I live where I live. Aren't all the lots through there pretty consistently the same size though? Consistently one acres, there are some older lots where there are some older homes that are on smaller um, lots. Mm -hmm. I think 0. 0.7. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's nothing really super small that I can think of. 0. 0.69 no. I think is the smallest one that I know of that's out there. But the more, majority of them are an acre or more. Mm -hmm. um, then across the street are larger parcels. Yeah, those are acres. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Miller. Um, to the south of you, I mean, there's three lots here that I can tell you just from looking at, uh, you right. know, are not not an acre lot, I can tell you just from looking at them and seeing that. But you, you mentioned something like, you, you know, you, you're, it's becoming like Deltona. Did you ever consider buying these and preserving this land? Uh, to be honest, uh, really, I mean. I've actually written NDJ letters, three or four letters since they bought this property that I'm trying to buy the one directly next to me. I'm that little house that you see. So I've written them letters offering to buy that property. Um, I've never gotten a reply back, never an email, never a phone call, never a text, nothing. So ghosting, never heard. I was beginning to wonder if they were a real company. Right, but if I'm you were gonna you were gonna buy the one property because it, they're two separate properties. Just the only right. reason we're here is because it's one owner, one sent one person that owns it. Well, when and there are two separate properties, right? When they on. when NG, NDJ first purchased, I was only interested in lot 22. That's the one that's directly next to me. Um, I don't care about 23 and 24 at that time. Um, I would still like to buy lot 22 from them. Um, but if they're going to build, so they would have to combine lot 22 and lot 23. Lot 24 is a canal. That thing's, I think, underwater. What I'm right saying now. is they don't have to combine them. They can be built on individual individuals. They only so they're going to put two homes up there? Well, they can't because they own it in common ownership. But if they sold the two pieces of property separately, they could. Mm. If, Even if, though they if don't Bob bought the, one and yeah, Sally bought one, but they're, they're it would not be a, wouldn't the, it be illegal non-conforming, sir? So, so the... Um, no. The, these 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 lots were platted prior to the zoning regulation. So, but for the fact that they happen to have a common ownership, they would be legal non-conforming lots. Um, same with the um, the the house that is on the that is currently up there right now. I think that's on zero point six four acres. So it's on a legal non-conforming lot. And if it was just owned and not and at any point in time, it wasn't owned by an by the same owner uh, for an adjacent property. They they could just pull a permit. Here, um, the request, which you've seen before, is to separate non-conforming lots that are owned by the same entity or have been in the past. But the lots themselves have not changed from when they were originally platted. They're the same. Yeah. Right. So I mean, again, this is. A I know this is going to sound weird. This is a technicality issue because of an owner. It's not that they have to build on both lots, one house. These are two individual lots that are right. that are build that are both bi individual buildable lots. Well, now I thought the minimum lot requirement now well, is one acre. Well, that's been added on. These were platted before that, and like he was saying, it, 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 it would be grandfathered into to its to its zoning. So okay. So, <laughs> yeah. so the way the way it kind of works is is. Um, it's a request to separate the lots because if you have two legal non-conforming lots or even one legal non-conforming lot and um, you own an adjacent parcel, uh, you are required, it is presumed that you are going to combine them together. So for purposes of us issuing permits, they're treated as, you know, one combined lot. 
um, and we have this mechanism uh, that we've kind of amended for exist for those properties with permits that allows for the separation of those um, previously uh, legal non-conforming lots due to um, they're owned by separate persons, for example. So here, um, I think they're still owned by the same entity, and this entity is, is requesting to separate those lots so they can um, build on just one of them. Okay. All right. Each but one. Build, build on just one of them, but sell the additional lot as buildable? I think they're proposing to build one on each. Yes, yes. Uh, well, the, they're buildable lots if this board decides to separate the lots. Correct. Correct. That's exactly. Okay. okay, and then what about the wetlands? I mean, half, so I, and again, I'm speaking about the lot directly next to me because I don't walk down the road, but what about the wetlands? I mean, half of that backyard is wetlands, so if they're going to build a house there, what's it going to be, the size of a shoebox? I still have the permitting. It's That's up to everything else, yeah. it's not us. Yeah, they yeah. have to okay. deal with the wetlands. And yeah. They'll get notice about that. So. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we need to move on. I'm sorry. You, okay. Your time is overextended. Okay, Ms. K. Babesta? That was her. Oh, that was them. That was oh okay. All right. They're, they're okay. together. They're together. All right. Okay, if the applicant wants to come back and address any of the concerns you might do so or uh, you got to speak come up and speak here whenever i submitted it shows that the other lots have houses that are smaller lots than what we're building on okay that's mm -hmm. it Thank all, right. You. all right we don't have any other public participation forms Everybody's went home, so nobody else is here to talk. Well, anybody... so we're going to close the floor for public participation over for commission discussion or a motion. I'm ready to make a motion. Go ahead. We make a motion for approval in case V23013. Okay. With, with no conditions, right? There's no conditions. I there yeah. I'll second that. Okay, I got a motion from Mr. Sixma to approve V23013 and a second from Mr. Young. Any discussion on the motion? Um, Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, guys, we made it. <laughs> it's been a tough one. We made it before four. <laughs> all right. Uh, any other public items? No, sir. Any staff items? No, sir. Any staff comments? No, sir. Any commission comments? Yes. Sure. Go ahead, Mr. Crossing. <laughs> well, actually, two things. As an uh, item came up earlier, I guess we were a parking space short today. Yeah. So somebody parked where they shouldn't or there wasn't enough cones set up i'll just, probably have a ticket it on. wasn't enough cones i just, saw the person pull into the spot and i tried to kind of say hey PLDRC day but they still parked <laughs> okay all right so that was just one but the second one i've got uh, i'm getting a lot of uh, questions from uh, my people in, in the neighborhood in, in sam's Hill area uh, i think i mentioned to you before uh, there's something going on at the corner of kersey and 415 looks like borrow pit potentially looks like i don't know what it is but there's Nothing posted. There's, I think I've asked before if there was any kind of site plan or anything going on. It could be purely agricultural. I don't know. But there can, with everything going on in the area, they're getting kind of antsy about it. So we did look through the system. Um, we had an inquiry application for an 18 lot subdivision back in May of 2022. No action has been taken on that. Um, there was also a an overall development plan application for a 27 lot subdivision back in 2021 where that's in the resubmittal stage they have not resubmitted um, beyond that it is an a4 parcel that would, and it does have an ag class on it for grazing um, we do not regulate 
agricultural operations. Mm -hmm. You did mention that there may be some issues with the wetland. In this case, it would be the state of Florida that would regulate that. Yeah, there's a lot of, just a lot of trees being taken down and a lot of holes being dug. So what we can do is we can pass this information on to our environmental team. They can reach out to DEP, but we have no authority to regulate anything. That's fine. I mean, it could be a bona fide agriculture use. I just, I don't know. It's just, uh, I'm trying to get them answers that I don't have answers to. Um, we could uh, submit something. If you prefer for us to send something in your name to our code group, we could ask them to investigate what's going on out there. Curious. Yep. Yeah. Okay. We'd be happy to look into that. Okay, any other commission comments? Uh, I would like to say that, you know, normally, I believe in people personal property rights, but sometimes you, the, we get this assumption that if they come in front of us, they're going to get the, the green flag to move forward. And you got to take some consideration into just like that one on the... Uh, the guy purchased the property. Uh, it didn't even look, probably when he purchased it, it was an undesirable property, but he did purchase it. So I think as a, sometimes when I vote against something, it's just show that, you know, we, we do take our position seriously and, and we just don't rubber stamp everything. So I don't want to get in a confrontation with my fellow members, but. <laughs> But we have to sometimes, and, and that's where I was at on that. Any other commission comments? Isn't that my comment? Isn't that what we're here for? For our own fear thoughts? Yeah, well, that's true. But it may seem unreasonable sometimes. But it's. I would like to make one one other comment before we go here. Uh, we were saying before some like like the. Um, storage place did not go. We got, you know, support from the staff. Uh, and no matter what anybody's thoughts were, they said, well, the neighborhood, you know, this farmland was neighborhood. Nobody was, nobody was for it. That's one thing. But there was also the Lake Winnemucet gang here did not say anything about the most detrimental thing that's happening to Lake Winnemucet is those eight or 900 houses plus development that's on the east side all the way to I-4, that several of them here, at least one was a main one, I'm not mentioning names, but a main one, they profited big off of it. Yeah. They didn't say nothing about it, so, you know. Well, you know, that's just like the, uh, they come in heavy on the, the racetrack and then turn around and yeah. Right. And come in and put to all support those. the Circle K. It didn't make a lot of Yeah, it doesn't make sense. sense you know, right. so I mean, Bethune Beach speaks to that so much with the, their whole not yeah. in my backyard. Like, I, I don't yeah. want a big house there, but I want to live in my big house type yeah. of a thing. I think that we do a good job of taking every case at its face value. No, well, and and we respect your opinion because you live down there. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think That's there was, the one there were hard ones there. A lot of people to speak. But, but ultimately, you know, it's their neighborhood and, and I don't know. Yeah, that's I was on the fence about it, and that's why I made both sides mad. We earned our money today. That was <laughs> <laughs> I made both sides. Of it. Yeah, I can't wait to explain this one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just remember, Paolo. I just that. remember that I figured I'd just make them both mad. <laughs> anyway, uh, any press and citizen comments? This meeting is adjourned. <laughs> We made it hey, brother. before dark. Okay. Okay, thanks guys.